Preface and Prologue of Lord of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Therese. Lord of the World by Robert U. Benson. Preface and Prologue. Preface. Dedication. Clavi Domus David. I am perfectly aware that this is a terribly sensational book, and open to innumerable criticisms on that account as well as on many others. But I did not know how else to express the principles I desired, and which I passionately believed to be true, except by producing their lines to a sensational point. I have tried, however, not to scream unduly loud, and to retain, so far as possible, reverence and consideration for the opinions of other people. Whether I have succeeded in that attempt is quite another matter. Robert U. Benson, Cambridge, 1907 Prologue Persons who do not like tiresome prologues need not read this one. It is essentially only to the situation, not to the story. You must give me a moment, said the old man, leaning back. Percy resettled himself in his chair and waited, chin on hand. It was a very silent room in which the three men sat, furnished with the extreme common sense of the period. It had neither window nor door, for it was now sixty years since the world, recognizing that space is not confined to the surface of the globe, had begun to burrow in earnest. Old Mr. Templeton's house stood some forty feet below the level of the Thames embankment, in what was considered a somewhat commodious position, for he had only a hundred yards to walk before he reached the station of the second central motor circle and a quarter of a mile to the velour station at Blackfriars. He was over ninety years old, however, and seldom left his house now. The room itself was lined throughout with a delicate green jade enamel, prescribed by the Board of Health, and was suffused with the artificial sunlight discovered by the great Reuter forty years before. He had the color tone of a spring wood, and was warmed and ventilated through the classical frieze grating to the exact temperature of eighteen degrees centigrade. Mr. Templeton was a plain man, content to live as his father had lived before him. The furniture, too, was a little old-fashioned in make and design, constructed, however, according to the prevailing system of Sophobesto's enamel welded over iron, indestructible, pleasant to the touch, and resembling mahogany. A couple of bookcases, well filled, ran on either side of the bronze pedestal electric fire, before which sat the three men, and in the further corner sat the hydraulic lifts that gave entrance the one to the bedroom, the other to the corridor fifty feet up, which opened on to the embankment. Father Percy Franklin, the elder of the two priests, was rather a remarkable-looking man, not more than thirty-five years old, but with hair that was white throughout. His gray eyes, under black eyebrows, were peculiarly lighted and almost passionate. But his prominent nose and chin, and the extreme decisiveness of his mouth, reassured the observer as to his will. Strangers usually looked twice at him. Father Francis, however, sitting in his upright chair on the other side of the hearth, brought down the average, for, though his brown eyes were pleasant and pathetic, there was no strength in his face. There was even a tendency to feminine melancholy in the corners of his mouth and the marked droop of his eyelids. Mr. Templeton was just a very old man, with a strong face and folds, clean-shaven like the rest of the world, and was now lying back on his water pillows with a quilt over his feet. At last he spoke, glancing first at Percy on his left. Well, he said, it is a great business to remember exactly, but this is how I put it to myself. In England our party was first seriously alarmed at the Labour Parliament of 1917. That showed us how deeply Herveism had impregnated the whole social atmosphere. There had been socialists before, but none like Gerstav Herve in his old age, at least no one of the same power. He, perhaps you have read, taught absolute materialism and socialism developed to their logical issues. Patriotism, he said, was a relic of barbarism, and sensual enjoyment was the only certain good. Of course, everyone laughed at him. It was said that without religion there could be no adequate motive among the masses for even the simplest social order. But he was right, it seemed. After the fall of the French church at the beginning of the century, and the massacres of 1914, the bourgeoisie settled down to organize itself. And that extraordinary movement began in earnest, pushed through by the middle classes, with no patriotism, no class distinctions, practically no army. 
of course freemasonry directed it all this was spread to germany where the influence of karl marx had already yes sir put in percy smoothly but what of england if you don't mind ah yes england well, in 1917 the Labor Party gathered up the reins, and communism really began. That was long before I can remember. Of course, but my father used to date it from then. The only wonder was that things did not go forward more quickly. But I suppose there was a good deal of Tory leaven left. Besides, centuries generally run slower than it's expected, especially after beginning with an impulse. But the new order began then, and the communists have never suffered a serious reverse since except the little one in twenty-five. Lincoln founded the new people, then, and the times dropped out. But it was not, strangely enough, till thirty-five that the House of Lords fell for the last time. The established church had gone finally in twenty-nine. "'And the religious effect of that?' asked Percy swiftly, as the old man paused to cough slightly, lifting his inhaler. The priest was anxious to keep to the point. It was an effect itself, said the other, rather than a cause. You see, the ritualists, as they used to call them, after a desperate attempt to get into the labor swim, came into the church after the convocation of nineteen, when the Nicene Creed dropped out, and there was no real enthusiasm except among them. But so far as there was an effect from the final disestablishment, I think it was that what was left of the state church melted into the free church, and the free church was, after all, nothing more than a little sentiment. The Bible was completely given up as an authority after the renewed German attacks in the twenties, and the divinity of our Lord, some think, had gone all but in name by the beginning of the century. The Kenotic theory had provided for that. Then there was that strange little movement among the free churchmen even earlier, when ministers who did no more than follow the swim, who were sensitive to draughts, so to speak, broke off from their old positions. It is curious to read in the history of the time how they were hailed as independent thinkers. It was just exactly what they were not. Where was I? Oh, yes. Well, that cleared the ground for us, and the Church made extraordinary progress for a while. Extraordinary, that is, under the circumstances, because you must remember things were very different from twenty or even ten years before. I mean that, roughly speaking, the severing of the sheep and the goats had begun. The religious people were practically all Catholics and individualists. The irreligious people rejected the supernatural altogether, and were, to a man, materialists and communists. But we made progress because we had a few exceptional men, Delaney the philosopher, MacArthur and Largent, philanthropists, and so on. It really seemed as if Delaney and his disciples might carry everything before them. You remember his analogy? Oh, yes, it is all in the textbooks. Well, then, at the close of the Vatican Council, which had been called in the nineteenth century, and never dissolved, we lost a great number through the final definitions. The exodus of the intellectuals, the world called it. The biblical decisions, put in the younger priest. That partly, and the whole conflict that began with the rise of modernism at the beginning of the century, but much more the condemnation of Delaney, and of the new transcendentalism, generally, as it was then understood. He died outside the church, you know. Then there was a condemnation of Scuolti's book on comparative religion. After that the communists went on by strides, although by very slow ones. It seems extraordinary to you, I dare say, but you cannot imagine the excitement when the necessary trades bill became law in sixty. People thought that all enterprise would stop when so many professions were nationalized, but you know, it didn't. Certainly the nation was behind it. What year was the two-thirds majority bill passed? asked Percy. Oh, long before, within a year or two of the fall of the House of Lords. It was necessary, I think, or the individualists would have gone raving mad. Well, the necessary trades bill was inevitable. People had begun to see that even so far back as the time when the railways were municipalized. For a while there was a burst of art, because all the individualists who could went in for it. It was then that the Toller School was founded but they soon drifted back into government employment. After all, the six percent limit for all individual enterprise was not much of a temptation, and government paid well. Percy shook his head. But I cannot understand the present state of affairs. You said just now that things went slowly. Yes, said the old man, but you must remember the poor laws. That established the communists forever. 
certainly braithwaite knew his business the younger priest looked up inquiringly the abolition of the old workhouse system said mr templeton it is all ancient history to you of course but i remember it as if it was yesterday it was that which brought down what was still called the monarchy in the universities ah said percy i should like to hear you talk about that sir presently father well this is what braindwaite did by the old system all paupers were treated alike and resented it by the new system there were the three grades that we have now and the enfranchisement of the two higher grades only the absolutely worthless were assigned to the third grade and treated more or less as criminals of course after careful examination then there was the reorganization of the old age pensions well don't you see how strong that made the communists the individualists they were still called tories when i was a boy the individualists have had no chance since they are no more than a worn-out drag now the whole of the working class and that meant ninety-nine of a hundred were all against them percy looked up but the other went on then there was the prison reform bill under macpherson and the abolition of capital punishment there was the final education act of fifty nine whereby dogmatic secularism was established the practical abolition of inheritance under the reformation of the death duties i forget what the old system was said percy why it seems incredible but the old system was that all paid alike first came the heirloom act and then the change by which inherited wealth paid three times the duty of earned wealth leading up to the acceptance of karl marx's doctrines in eighty nine but the former came in seventy seven well all these things kept england up to the level of the continent she had only been just in time to join in with the final scheme of western free trade that was the first effect you remember of the socialist victory in germany and how did we keep out of the eastern war asked percy anxiously oh that's a long story but in a word america stopped us so we lost india and australia I think that was the nearest to the downfall of the communists since twenty-five but braithwaite got out of it very cleverly by getting us the protectorate of south africa once and for all he was an old man then too mr templeton stopped to cough again father francis sighed and shifted in his chair and america asked percy ah well that is very complicated but she knew her strength and annexed canada the same year that was when we were at our weakest Percy stood up. Have you a comparative atlas, sir? he asked. The old man pointed to a shelf. There, he said. Percy looked at the sheets a minute or two in silence, spreading them on his knees. It is all much simpler, certainly, he murmured, glancing first at the old complicated coloring of the beginning of the twentieth century, and then at the three great washes of the twenty-first. He moved his finger along Asia. The words Eastern Empire ran across the pale yellow from the Ural Mountains on the left to the Bering Straits on the right, curling round in giant letters through India, Australia, and New Zealand. He glanced at the red. It was considerably smaller, but still important enough, considering that it covered not only Europe proper, but all Russia up to the Ural Mountains, and Africa to the south. The blue-labeled American Republic swept over the whole of that continent and disappeared right round to the left of the western hemisphere in a shower of blue sparks on the white sea. Yes, it's simpler, said the old man dryly. Percy shut the book and set it by his chair. And what next, sir? What will happen? The old Tory statesman smiled. God knows, he said. If the Eastern Empire chooses to move, we can do nothing. I don't know why they have not moved. I suppose it is because of religious differences. Europe will not split? asked the priest. No, no, we know our danger now, and America would certainly help us. But all the same, God help us, or you, I should rather say, if the Empire does move. She knows her strength at last. There was a silence for a moment or two. A faint vibration trembled through the deep sunk room as some huge machine went past on the broad boulevard overhead. Prophecy, sir, said Percy suddenly, I mean about religion. Mr. Templeton inhaled another long breath from his instrument. Then again he took up his discourse. Briefly, he said, there were three forces, Catholicism, humanitarianism, and the Eastern religions. About the third I cannot prophesy, though I think the Sufis will be victorious. Anything may happen. 
esotericism is making enormous strides and that means pantheism and the blending of the chinese and japanese dynasties throws out all our calculations but in europe and america there is no doubt that the struggle lies between the other two we can neglect everything else and i think if you wish me to say what i think that humanly speaking catholicism will decrease rapidly now it is perfectly true that protestantism is dead men do recognize at last that a supernatural religion involves an absolute authority and that private judgment in matters of faith is nothing else than the beginning of disintegration and it is also true that since the catholic church is the only institution that even claims supernatural authority with all of its merciless logic she has again the allegiance of practically all christians who have any supernatural belief left there are few faddists left especially in america and here but they are negligible that is all very well but on the other hand you must remember that humanitarianism contrary to all persons expectations is becoming an actual religion itself though anti-supernatural it is pantheism it is developing a ritual under freemasonry it has a creed god is man and the rest it has therefore a real food of a sort to offer to religious cravings it idealizes and yet it makes no demand upon the spiritual faculties then they have the use of all the churches except ours and all the cathedrals and they are beginning at last to encourage sentiment then they may display their symbols and we may not i think that they will be established legally in another ten years at the latest now we catholics remember are losing we have lost steadily for more than fifty years i suppose that we have nominally about one fortieth of america now and that is the result of the catholic movement of the early twenties in france and spain we are nowhere in germany we are less we hold our position in the east certainly but even there we have not more than one in two hundred so the statistics say and we are scattered in italy well we have rome again to ourselves but nothing else here we have ireland altogether and perhaps one in sixty in england wales and scotland but we had one in forty seventy years ago then there is the enormous progress of psychology all clean against us for at least a century first you see there was materialism pure and simple that failed more or less it was too crude until psychology came to the rescue now psychology claims all the rest of the ground and the supernatural sense seems accounted for that's the claim no father we are losing and we shall go on losing and i think we must even be ready for a catastrophe at any moment but began percy you think that weak for an old man on the edge of the grave well it is what i think i see no hope in fact it seems to me that even now something may come on us quickly no i see no hope until percy looked up sharply until our lord comes back said the old statesman father francis sighed once more and there fell a silence and the fall of the universities said percy at last my dear father it was exactly like the fall of the monasteries under henry the eighth the same results the same arguments the same incidents they were the strongholds of individualism as the monasteries were the strongholds of papalism and they were regarded with the same kind of awe and envy then the usual sort of remarks began about the amount of port wine drunk and suddenly people said that they had done their work that the inmates were mistaking means for ends and there was a great deal more reason for saying it after all granted the supernatural religious houses are an obvious consequence but the object of secular education is presumably the production of something visible either character or competence and it became quite impossible to prove that the universities produced either which was worth having the distinction between greek ou, and greek me is not an end in itself and the kind of person produced by its study was not one which appealed to england in the twentieth century i am not sure that it appealed even to me much and i was always a strong individualist except by way of pathos yes said percy oh it was pathetic enough the science schools of cambridge and the colonial department of oxford were the last hope and then those went the old dons crept about with their books but nobody wanted them they were too purely theoretical some drifted into the poorhouse first or second grade some were taken care of by charitable clergymen there was that attempt to concentrate in dublin 
but it failed and people soon forgot them the buildings as you know were used for all kinds of things oxford became an engineering establishment for a while and cambridge a kind of government laboratory i was at king's college you know of course it was all as horrible as it could be though i am glad that i kept the chapel open even as a museum it was not nice to see the chantries filled with anatomical specimens however i don't think it was much worse than keeping stoves and surplices in them what happened to you oh i was in parliament very soon and i had a little money of my own too but it was very hard on some of them they had little pensions at least all who were past work and yet i don't know i suppose it had to come they were very little more than picturesque survivals you know and had not even the grace of a religious faith about them percy sighed again looking at the humorously reminiscent face of the old man then he suddenly changed the subject again what about this european parliament he said the old man started oh i think it will pass he said if a man can be found to push it all this last century has been leading up to it as you see patriotism has been dying fast but it ought to have died like slavery and so forth under the influence of the catholic church as it is the work has been done without the church and the result is that the world is beginning to range itself against us it is an organized antagonism a kind of catholic anti-church democracy has done what the divine monarchy should have done if the proposal passes i think we may expect something like persecution once again but again the eastern invasion may save us if it comes off i do not know percy sat still yet a moment then he stood up suddenly i must go father he said relapsing into esperanto it is past nineteen o'clock thank you so much are you coming father father francis stood up also in the dark gray suit permitted to priests and took up his hat well father said the old man again come again some day if i haven't been too discursive i suppose you have to write your letter yet percy nodded i did half of it this morning he said but i felt i wanted another bird's eye view before i could understand properly i am so grateful to you for giving it me it is really a great labor this daily letter to the cardinal protector i am thinking of resigning if i am allowed my dear father don't do that if i may say so to your face i think you have a very shrewd mind and unless rome has balanced information she can do nothing i don't suppose her colleagues are as careful as yourself percy smiled lifting his dark eyes deprecatingly come father he said the two priests parted at the steps of the corridor and percy stood for a minute or two staring out at the familiar autumn scene trying to understand what it all meant what he had heard downstairs seemed strangely to illuminate that vision of splendid prosperity that lay before him the air was as bright as day artificial sunlight had carried all before it and london now knew no difference between dark and light he stood in a kind of glazed cloister heavily floored with a preparation of rubber on which footsteps made no sound Beneath him, at the foot of the stairs, poured an endless double line of people, severed by a partition, going to right and left, noiselessly, except for the murmur of Esperanto talking that sounded ceaselessly as they went. Through the clear, hardened glass of a public passage showed a broad, sleek, black roadway, ribbed from side to side, and puckered in the center, significantly empty, but even as he stood there a note sounded far away from old Westminster, like the hum of a giant hive rising as it came and an instant later a transparent thing shot fast flashing from every angle and the note died to a hum again in a silence as the great government motor from the south whirled eastwards with the mails this was a privileged roadway nothing but state vehicles were allowed to use it and those at a speed not exceeding one hundred miles an hour other noises were subdued in this city of rubber the passenger circles were a hundred yards away and the subterranean traffic lay too deep for anything but a vibration to make itself felt it was to remove this vibration and silence the hum of the ordinary vehicles that the government experts had been working for the last twenty years once again before he moved there came a long cry from overhead startlingly beautiful and piercing and as he lifted his eyes from the glimpse of the steady river which alone had refused to be transformed 
he saw high above him against the heavy illuminated clouds a long slender object glowing with soft light slide northwards and vanish on outstretched wings that musical cry he told himself was the voice of one of the european line of volors announcing its arrival in the capital of great britain until our lord comes back he thought to himself and for an instant the old misery stabbed at his heart how difficult it was to hold the eyes focused on that far horizon when this world lay in the foreground so compelling in its splendor and its strength oh he had argued with father francis an hour ago that size was not the same as greatness and that an insistent external could not exclude a subtle internal and he had believed what he had then said but the doubt yet remained till he silenced it by a fierce effort crying in his heart to the poor man of nazareth to keep his heart as the heart of a little child then he set his lips wondering how long father francis would bear the pressure and went down the steps end of preface and prologue recording by maria therese book one chapter one part one of lord of the world this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john goffney lord of the world by robert hugh benson book one chapter one part one oliver brand the new member for croydon four sat in his study looking out of the window over the top of his typewriter his house stood facing northwards at the extreme end of a spur of the surrey hills now cut and tunneled out of all recognition only to a communist the view was an inspiring one immediately below the wide windows the embanked ground fell away rapidly for perhaps a hundred feet ending in a high wall and beyond that the world and works of men were triumphant as far as the eye could see two vast tracks like streaked race courses each not less than a quarter of a mile in width and sunk twenty feet below the surface of the ground swept up to a meeting a mile ahead at the huge junction of those that on his left was the first trunk road to brighton inscribed in capital letters in the railroad guide that to the right the second trunk to the tunbridge and hastings district each was divided lengthways by a cement wall on one side of which on steel rails ran the electric trams and on the other lay the motor track itself again divided into three on which ran first the government coaches at a speed of one hundred and fifty miles an hour second the private motors at not more than sixty third the cheap government line at thirty with stations every five miles this was further bordered by a road confined to pedestrians cyclists and ordinary cars on which no vehicle was allowed to move at more than twelve miles an hour beyond these great tracks lay an immense plain of house roofs with short towers here and there marking public buildings from the caterham district to the left to the croydon in front all clear and bright in smokeless air and far away to the west and north showed the low suburban hills against the april sky there was surprisingly little sound considering the pressure of the population and with the exception of the buzz of the steel rails as a train fled north or south and the occasional sweet chord of the great motors as they neared or left the junction there was little to be heard in this study except a smooth soothing murmur that filled the air like the murmur of bees in a garden oliver loved every hint of human life all busy sights and sounds and was listening now smiling faintly to himself as he stared out into the clear air then he set his lips laid his fingers on the keys once more and went on speech constructing he was very fortunate in the situation of his house it stood in an angle of one of those huge spider webs with which the country was covered and for his purposes was all that he could expect it was close enough to london to be extremely cheap for all wealthy persons had retired at least a hundred miles from the throbbing heart of england and yet it was as quiet as he could wish he was within ten minutes of westminster on the one side and twenty minutes of the sea on the other and his constituency lay before him like a raised map further since the great london termini were but ten minutes away there were at his disposal the first trunk lines to every big town in england 
for a politician of no great means, who was asked to speak at Edinburgh on one evening and in Marseilles on the next, he was as well placed as any man in Europe. He was a pleasant-looking man, not much over thirty years old, black wire-haired, clean-shaven, thin, virile, magnetic, blue-eyed and white-skinned, and he appeared this day extremely content with himself and the world. His lips moved slightly as he worked, his eyes enlarged and diminished with excitement, and more than once he paused and stared out again, smiling and flushed. Then a door opened. A middle-aged man came nervously in with a bundle of papers, laid them down on the table without a word, and turned to go out. Oliver lifted his hand for attention, snapped a lever, and spoke. "'Well, Mr. Phillips,' he said. "'There is news from the East, sir,' said the secretary. Oliver shot a glance sideways and laid his hand on the bundle. "'Any complete message?' he asked. "'No, sir. It's interrupted again. Mr. Felsenberg's name is mentioned.' Oliver did not seem to hear. He lifted the flimsy printed sheets with a sudden movement and began turning them. "'The fourth from the top, Mr. Brand,' said the secretary. Oliver jerked his head impatiently, and the other went out as if at a signal. The fourth sheet from the top, printed in red on green, seemed to absorb Oliver's attention altogether, for he read it through two or three times, leaning back motionless in his chair. Then he sighed and stared again through the window. Then once more the door opened, and a tall girl came in. "'Well, my dear,' she observed. Oliver shook his head with compressed lips. "'Nothing definite,' he said, "'even less than usual. Listen.' He took up the green sheet and began to read aloud as the girl sat down in a window seat on his left. She was a very charming-looking creature, tall and slender, with serious, ardent gray eyes, firm red lips, and a beautiful carriage of head and shoulders. She had walked slowly across the room as Oliver took up the paper, and now sat back in her brown dress in a very graceful and stately attitude. She seemed to listen with a deliberate kind of patience, but her eyes flickered with interest. Irkutsk, April 14, yesterday, as usual, but rumored defection from Sufi party. Troops continue gathering. Felsenberg addressed Buddhist crowd. Attempt on Lama last Friday. Work of anarchists. Felsenberg leaving for Moscow as arranged. He... There, that is absolutely all, ended Oliver dispiritedly. It's interrupted as usual. The girl began to swing a foot. I don't understand in the least, she said. Who is Felsenberg after all? "'My dear child, that is what all the world is asking. "'Nothing is known except that he was included in the American deputation at the last moment. "'The Herald published his life last week, but it has since been contradicted. "'It is certain that he is quite a young man, and that he has been quite obscure until now.' "'Well, he is not obscure now,' observed the girl. "'I know. It seems as if he were running the whole thing. "'One never hears a word of the others. It's lucky he's on the right side.' And what do you think? Oliver turned vacant eyes again out of the window. I think it's touch and go, he said. The only remarkable thing is that here hardly anybody seems to realize it. It's too big for the imagination, I suppose. There's no doubt that the East has been preparing for a descent on Europe for these last five years. They've only been checked by America, and this is one last attempt to stop them. But why Felsenberg should come to the front, he broke off. He must be a good linguist at any rate. This is at least the fifth crowd he has addressed. Perhaps he is just the American interpreter. Christ, I wonder who he is. Has he any other name? Julian, I believe. One message said so. How did this come through? Oliver shook his head. Private enterprise, he said. The European agencies have stopped work. Every telegraph station is guarded night and day. There are lines of volors strung out on every frontier. The Empire means to settle this business without us. And if it goes wrong? My dear Mabel, if hell breaks loose, he threw out his hands deprecatingly. And what is the government doing? Working night and day, so is the rest of Europe. It'll be Armageddon with a vengeance if it comes to war. What chance do you see? I see two chances, said Oliver slowly. One, that they may be afraid of America and may hold their hands from sheer fear. The other, that they may be induced to hold their hands from charity. If only they can be made to understand that cooperation is the one hope of the world. But those damned religions of theirs. 
The girl sighed and looked out again onto the wide plain of house roofs below the window. The situation was indeed as serious as it could be. That huge empire, consisting of a federalism of states under the sun of heaven, made possible by the merging of the Japanese and Chinese dynasties and the fall of Russia, had been consolidating its forces and learning its own power during the last thirty-five years, ever since, in fact, it had laid its lean yellow hands upon Australia and India. While the rest of the world had learned the folly of war, ever since the fall of the Russian Republic under the combined attack of the yellow races, the last had grasped its possibilities. It seemed now as if the civilization of the last century was to be swept back once more into chaos. It was not that the mob of the East cared very greatly. It was their rulers who had begun to stretch themselves after an almost eternal lethargy, and it was hard to imagine how they could be checked at this point. There was a touch of grimness, too, in the rumor that religious fanaticism was behind the movement, and that the patient East proposed at last to proselytize by the modern equivalents of fire and sword those who had laid aside, for the most part, all religious beliefs except that in humanity. To Oliver it was simply maddening. As he looked from his window and saw the vast limit of London laid peaceably before him, as his imagination ran out over Europe and saw everywhere that steady triumph of common sense and fact over the wild fairy stories of Christianity, it seemed intolerable that there should be even a possibility that all this should be swept back again into the barbarous turmoil of sects and dogmas, for no less than this would be the result if the East laid hands on Europe. Even Catholicism would revive, he told himself, that strange faith that had blazed so often as persecution had been dashed to quench it, and, of all forms of faith, to Oliver's mind, Catholicism was the most grotesque and enslaving. And the prospect of all this honestly troubled him, far more than the thought of the physical catastrophe and bloodshed that would fall on Europe with the advent of the East. There was but one hope on the religious side, as he had told Mabel a dozen times, and that was that the quietistic pantheism, which, for the last century, had made such giant strides in East and West alike, among Mohammedans, Buddhists, Hindus, Confucianists, and the rest, should avail to check the supernatural frenzy that inspired their exoteric brethren. Pantheism, he understood, was what he held himself. For him, God, was the developing sum of created life, and impersonal unity was the essence of his being. Competition, then, was the great heresy that set men one against another and delayed all progress. For, to his mind, progress lay in the merging of the individual and the family, of the family and the commonwealth, of the commonwealth and the continent, and of the continent in the world. Finally, the world itself at any moment was no more than the mood of impersonal life, it was, in fact, the Catholic idea, with the supernatural left out, a union of earthly fortunes, an abandonment of individualism on the one side, and of supernaturalism on the other. It was treason to appeal from God imminent to God transcendent. There was no God transcendent. God, so far as he could be known, was man. Yet these two, husband and wife after a fashion, for they had entered into that terminable contract now recognized explicitly by the state, these two were very far from sharing in the usual heavy dullness of mere materialists. The world for them beat with one ardent life blossoming in flower and beast and man, a torrent of beautiful vigor flowing from a deep source and irrigating all that moved or felt. Its romance was the more appreciable because it was comprehensible to the minds that sprang from it. There were mysteries in it, but mysteries that enticed rather than baffled for they unfolded new glories with every discovery that man could make, even inanimate objects, the fossil, the electric current, the far-off stars. These were dust thrown off by the spirit of the world, fragrant with his presence and eloquent of his nature. For example, the announcement made by Klein, the astronomer, twenty years before, that the inhabitation of certain planets had become a certified fact, how vastly this had altered men's view of themselves. But the one condition of progress and the building of Jerusalem on the planet that happened to be men's dwelling place was peace, not the sword which Christ brought or that which Mohammed wielded, but peace that arose from, not past, understanding. The peace that sprang from a knowledge that man was all and was able to develop himself only by sympathy with his fellows. 
to Oliver and his wife, then, the last century seemed like a revelation. Little by little the old superstitions had died, and the new light broadened. The spirit of the world had roused himself. The sun had dawned in the west, and now with horror and loathing they had seen the clouds gather once more in the quarter whence all superstition had had its birth. Mabel got up presently and came across to her husband. "'My dear,' she said, "'you must not be downhearted. It all may pass as it passed before. It is a great thing that they are listening to America at all, and this Mr. Felsenberg seems to be on the right side.' Oliver took her hand and kissed it. End of Book One, Chapter One, Part One. Recording by John Goffney of AudioVectors.com. Book One, Chapter One, Part Two of Lord of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Hogan Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson Book One, Chapter One, Part Two Oliver seemed altogether depressed at breakfast, half an hour later. His mother, an old lady of nearly eighty, who never appeared till noon, seemed to see it at once, for after a look or two at him and a word she subsided into silence behind her plate. It was a pleasant little room in which they sat, immediately behind Oliver's own, and was furnished, according to universal custom, in light green. Its windows looked out upon a strip of garden at the back, and the high, creeper-grown wall that separated that domain from the next. The furniture, too, was of the usual sort. A sensible round table stood in the middle, with three tall-armed chairs, with the proper angles and rests drawn up to it and the center of it, resting apparently on a broad round column, held the dishes. It was thirty years now since the practice of placing the dining-room above the kitchen, and of raising and lowering the courses by hydraulic power into the center of the dining-table, had become universal in the houses of the well-to-do. The floor consisted entirely of the asbestos cork preparation invented in America, noiseless, clean, and pleasant to both foot and eye. Mabel broke the silence. "'And your speech to-morrow?' she asked, taking up her fork. Oliver brightened a little, and began to discourse. It seemed that Birmingham was beginning to fret. They were crying out once more for free trade with America. European facilities were not enough, and it was Oliver's business to keep them quiet. It was useless, he proposed to tell them, to agitate until the Eastern business was settled. They must not bother the government with such details just now. He was to tell them, too, that the government was wholly on their side, and it was bound to come soon. "'They are pig-headed,' he added fiercely. "'Pig-headed and selfish. They are like children who cry for food ten minutes before dinner-time. It is bound to come if they will wait a little. And will you tell them so? That they are pig-headed? Certainly.' Mabel looked at her husband with a pleased twinkle in her eyes. She knew perfectly well that his popularity rested largely on his outspokenness. Folks liked to be scolded and abused by a genial, bold man who danced and gesticulated in a magnetic fury. She liked it herself. "'How shall you go?' she asked. "'Voller, I shall catch the eighteen o'clock at Blackfriars. The meeting is at nineteen, and I shall be back at twenty-one. He addressed himself vigorously to his entree, and his mother looked up with a patient old woman's smile. Mabel began to drum her fingers softly on the damask. "'Please make haste, my dear,' she said. "'I have to be at Brighton at three. Oliver gulped his last mouthful, pushed his plate over the line, glanced to see if all plates were there, and then put his hand beneath the table. Instantly, without a sound, the centerpiece vanished, and the three waited unconcernedly while the clink of dishes came from beneath. Old Mrs. Brand was a hale-looking old lady, rosy and wrinkled with the mantilla headdress of fifty years ago, but she too looked a little depressed this morning. The entree was not very successful, she thought. The new foodstuff was not up to the old. It was a trifle gritty. She would see about it afterwards. There was a clink, a soft sound, like a push, and the centerpiece snapped into its place, bearing an admirable imitation of a roasted fowl. 
Oliver and his wife were alone again for a minute or two after breakfast, before Mabel started down the path to catch the fourteen-and-a-half o'clock fourth-grade sub-trunk line to the junction. "'What's the matter with Mother?' he said. "'Oh, it's the food stuff again. She's never got accustomed to it. She says it doesn't suit her. Nothing else?' "'No, my dear, I am sure of it. She hasn't said a word lately.' Oliver watched his wife go down the path, reassured. He had been a little troubled once or twice lately, by an odd word or two that his mother had let fall. She had been brought up a Christian for a few years, and it seemed to him sometimes as if it had left a taint. There was an old garden of the soul that she liked to keep by her, though she always protested with an appearance of scorn that it was nothing but nonsense. Still, Oliver would have preferred that she had burned it. Superstition was a desperate thing for retaining life, and as the brain weakened, might conceivably reassert itself. Christianity was both wild and dull, he told himself, wild because of its obvious grotesqueness and impossibility, and dull because it was so utterly apart from the exhilarating stream of human life. It crept dustily about still, he knew, in the little dark churches here and there. It screamed with hysterical sentimentality in Westminster Cathedral, which he had once entered and looked upon, with a kind of disgusted fury. It gabbled strange, false words to the incompetent and the old and the half-witted, but it would be too dreadful if his own mother ever looked upon it again with favor. Oliver himself, ever since he could remember, had been violently opposed to the concessions of Rome and Ireland. It was intolerable that these two places should be definitely yielded up to this foolish, treacherous nonsense. They were hotbeds of sedition, plague-spots on the face of humanity. He had never agreed with those who said that it was better that all the poisons of the West should be gathered rather than dispersed. But at any rate, there it was. Rome had been given up wholly to that old man in white in exchange for all the parish churches and cathedrals of Italy, and it was understood that medieval darkness reigned there supreme and Ireland, after receiving home rule thirty years before, had declared for Catholicism, and opened her arms to individualism in its most virulent form. England had laughed and assented, for she was saved from a quantity of agitation by the immediate departure of half her Catholic population for that island, and had, consistently with her communist colonial policy, granted every facility for individualism to reduce itself there ad absurdum. All kinds of funny things were happening there. Oliver had read with a bitter amusement of new appearances there, of a woman in blue and shrines raised where her feet had rested. But he was scarcely amused at Rome, for the movement to Turin of the Italian government had deprived the Republic of quite a quantity of sentimental prestige, and had haloed the old religious nonsense with all the meretriciousness of historical association. However, it obviously could not last much longer. The world was beginning to understand at last. He stood a moment or two at the door after his wife had gone, drinking in reassurance from that glorious vision of solid sense that spread itself before his eyes. The endless house-roofs, the high glass vaults of the public baths and gymnasiums, the pinnacled schools where citizenship was taught each morning, the spider-like cranes and scaffoldings that rose here and there and even the few pricking spires did not disconcert him. There it stretched away into the gray haze of London, really beautiful, this vast hive of men and women who had learned at least the primary lesson of the gospel, that there was no God but man, no priest but the politician, no prophet but the schoolmaster. Then he went back once more to his speech-constructing. Mabel, too, was a little thoughtful, as she sat with her paper on her lap, spinning down the broad line to Brighton. This eastern news was more disconcerting to her than she allowed her husband to see, yet it seemed incredible that there could be any real danger of invasion. This western life was so sensible and peaceful. Folks had their feet at last upon the rock, and it was unthinkable that they could ever be forced back on to the mud-flats. It was contrary to the whole law of development. Yet she could not but recognize that catastrophe seemed one of nature's methods. She sat very quiet, glancing once or twice at the meager little scrap of news, and reading the leading article upon it that too seemed significant of dismay. A couple of men were talking in the half-compartment beyond on the same subject. One described the government engineering works that he had visited. 
the breathless haste that dominated them, the other put in interrogations and questions. There was not much comfort there. There were no windows through which she could look. On the main lines the speed was too great for the eyes. The long compartment, flooded with soft light, bounded her horizon. She stared at the molded white ceiling, the delicious oak-framed paintings, the deep spring seats, the mellow globes overhead that poured out radiance at a mother and child diagonally opposite her. Then the great chord sounded, the faint vibration increased ever so slightly, and an instant later the automatic doors ran back. She stepped out onto the platform of Brighton Station. As she went down the steps, leading to the station square, she noticed a priest going before her. He seemed a very upright and sturdy old man, for though his hair was white, he walked steadily and strongly. At the foot of the steps he stopped and half-turned and then, to her surprise, she saw that his face was that of a young man, fine-featured and strong, with black eyebrows and very bright gray eyes. Then she passed on and began to cross the square in the direction of her aunt's house. Then, without the slightest warning, except one shrill hoot from overhead, a number of things happened. A great shadow whirled across the sunlight at her feet, a sound of rending tore the air, and a noise like a giant sigh, and as she stopped, bewildered, with a noise like ten thousand smashed kettles, a huge thing crashed on the rubber pavement before her, where it lay, filling half the square, writhing long wings on its upper side that beat and whirled like the flappers of some ghastly extinct monster, pouring out human screams and beginning almost instantly to crawl with broken life. Mabel scarcely knew what happened next, but she found herself a moment later, forced forward by some violent pressure from behind, till she stood shaking from head to foot, with some kind of smashed body of a man moaning and stretching at her feet. There was a sort of articulate language coming from it. She caught distinctly the names of Jesus and Mary. Then a voice hissed suddenly in her ears, "'Let me through! I'm a priest!' She stood there a moment longer, dazed by the suddenness of the whole affair, and watched almost unintelligently the gray-haired young priest on his knees, with his coat torn open and a crucifix out. She saw him bend close, wave his hand in a swift sign, and heard a murmur of language she did not know. Then he was up again, holding the crucifix before him, and she saw him begin to move forward into the midst of the red-flooded pavement looking this way and that, as if for a signal. Down the steps of the great hospital on her right came figures running now, hatless, each carrying what looked like an old-fashioned camera. She knew what those men were, and her heart leaped in relief. They were the ministers of euthanasia. Then she felt herself taken by the shoulder and pulled back, and immediately found herself in the front rank of a crowd that was swaying and crying out and behind a line of police and civilians who had formed themselves into a cordon to keep the pressure back. End of Book One, Chapter One, Part Two Recording by Linda Hogan Book One, Chapter One, Part Three of Lord of the World This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine Eckert Boulet. Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson. Book One, Chapter One, Part Three. Oliver was in a panic of terror as his mother, half an hour later, ran in with the news that one of the government volors had fallen in the station square at Brighton just after the fourteen-and-a-half train had discharged its passengers. He knew quite well what that meant, for he remembered one such accident ten years before, just after the law forbidding private volors had been passed. It meant that every living creature in it was killed, and probably many more in the place where it fell. And what then? The message was clear enough. She would certainly be in the square at that time. He sent a desperate wire to her aunt, asking for news, and sat, shaken in his chair, awaiting the answer. His mother sat by him. "'Please, God!' she sobbed out once, and stopped confounded as he turned on her. But fate was merciful, 
and three minutes before Mr. Phillips toiled up the path with the answer, Mabel herself came into the room, rather pale and smiling. "'Christ!' cried Oliver, and gave one huge sob as he sprang up. She had not a great deal to tell him. There was no explanation of the disaster published as yet. It seemed that the wings on one side had simply ceased to work. She described the shadow, the hiss of sound, and the crash. Then she stopped. "'Well, my dear,' said her husband, still rather white beneath the eyes as he sat close to her, patting her hand. "'There was a priest there,' said Mabel. "'I saw him before, at the station.' Oliver gave a little hysterical snort of laughter. "'He was on his knees at once,' she said, "'with his crucifix, even before the doctors came. "'My dear, do people really believe all that?' "'Why, they think they do,' said her husband. "'It was all so, so sudden, and there he was, "'just as if he had been expecting it all. "'Oliver, how can they?' Why, people will believe anything if they begin early enough. And the man seemed to believe it, too. The dying man, I mean. I saw his eyes. She stopped. Well, my dear? Oliver, what do you say to people when they are dying? Say? Why, nothing. What can I say? But I don't think I've ever seen anyone die. Nor have I till today, said the girl, and shivered a little. The euthanasia people were soon at work. Oliver took her hand gently. "'My darling, it must have been frightful. Why, you're trembling still.' "'No, but listen. You know, if I had had anything to say, I could have said it too. They were all just in front of me. I wondered. Then I knew I hadn't. I couldn't possibly have talked about humanity.' "'My dear, it's all very sad. But you know it doesn't really matter. It's all over.' "'And—and and they've just stopped?' Why, yes. Mabel compressed her lips a little. Then she sighed. She had an agitated sort of meditation in the train. She knew perfectly that it was sheer nerves, but she could not just yet shake them off. As she had said, it was the first time she had seen death. And that priest, that priest doesn't think so? My dear, I'll tell you what he believes. He believes that that man whom he showed the crucifix to and said those words over, is alive somewhere, in spite of his brain being dead. He is not quite sure where, but he is either in a kind of smelting works being slowly burned, or, if he is very lucky, and that piece of wood took effect, he is somewhere beyond the clouds, before three persons who are only one, although they are three. That there are quantities of other people there, a woman in blue, a great many others in white with their heads under their arms, and still more with their heads on one side, and that they've all got harps and gone singing forever and ever, and walking about on the clouds, and liking it very much indeed. He thinks, too, that all these nice people are perpetually looking down upon the aforesaid smelting works, and praising the three great persons for making them. That's what the priest believes. Now you know it's not likely. That kind of thing may be very nice, but it isn't true. Mabel smiled pleasantly. She had never heard it put so well. No, my dear, you're quite right. That sort of thing isn't true. How can he believe it? He looked quite intelligent. My dear girl, if I had told you in your cradle that the moon was green cheese and had hammered at you ever since, every day and all day, that it was, you'd very nearly believe it by now. Why, you know in your heart that the euthanatizers are the real priests. Of course you do. Mabel sighed with satisfaction, and stood up. "'Oliver, you're a most comforting person. I do like you. There, I must go to my room. I'm all shaky still.' Half across the room she stopped and put out a shoe. "'Why?' she began faintly. There was a curious, rusty-looking splash upon it, and her husband saw her turn white. He rose abruptly. "'My dear,' he said, "'don't be foolish.' She looked at him, smiled bravely, and went out. When she was gone, he still sat on the moment where she had left him. Dear me, how pleased he was! He did not like to think of what life would have been without her. He had known her since she was twelve, that was seven years ago, and last year they had gone together to the district official 
to make their contract. She had really become very necessary to him. Of course, the world could get on without her, and he supposed that he could too, but he did not want to have to try. He knew perfectly well, for it was his creed of human love, that there was between them a double affection, of mind as well as body, and there was absolutely nothing else. But he loved her quick intuitions, and to hear his own thought echoed so perfectly. It was like two flames added together to make a third taller than either. Of course one flame could burn without the other. In fact, one would have to one day. But meantime, the warmth and light were exhilarating. Yes, he was delighted that she happened to be clear of the falling volor. He gave no more thought to his exposition of the Christian creed. It was a mere commonplace to him that Catholics believed that kind of thing. It was no more blasphemous to his mind so to describe it than it would be to laugh at a fitching idol with mother-of-pearl eyes and a horsehair wig. It was simply impossible to treat it seriously. He, too, had wondered once or twice in his life how human beings could believe such rubbish, but psychology had helped him, and he knew now well enough that suggestion will do almost anything. And it was this hateful thing that had so long restrained the euthanasia movement with all its splendid mercy. His brows wrinkled a little as he remembered his mother's exclamation, Please, God! Then he smiled at the poor old thing and her pathetic childishness, and turned once more to his table, thinking, in spite of himself, of his wife's hesitation as she had seen the splash of blood on her shoe. Blood! Yes, that was as much a fact as anything else. How was it to be dealt with? Why, by the glorious creed of humanity, that splendid God who died and rose again ten thousand times a day, who had died daily like the old cracked fanatic soul of Tarsus, ever since the world began, and who rose again, not once like the carpenter's son, but with every child that came into the world. That was the answer. And was it not overwhelmingly sufficient? Mr. Phillips came in an hour later with another bundle of papers. No more news from the East, sir, he said. End of Book One, Chapter One, Part Three Book One, Chapter Two, Part One of Lord of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Rees. Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson. Book One, Advent. Chapter Two, Part One. Percy Franklin's correspondence with the Cardinal Protector of England occupied him directly for at least two hours every day, and for nearly eight hours indirectly. For the past eight years the methods of the Holy See had once more been revised with a view to modern needs, and now every important province throughout the world possessed not only an administrative metropolitan, but a representative in Rome, whose business it was to be in touch with the Pope on the one side and the people he represented on the other. In other words, centralization had gone forward rapidly in accordance with the laws of life, and, with centralization, freedom of method and expansion of power. England's cardinal protector was one Abbot Martin, a Benedictine, and it was Percy's business, as of a dozen more bishops, priests, and laymen, with whom, by the way, he was forbidden to hold any formal consultation, to write a long daily letter to him on affairs that came under his notice. It was a curious life, therefore, that Percy led. He had a couple of rooms assigned to him in Archbishop's House at Westminster, and was attached loosely to the cathedral staff although with considerable liberty. He rose early and went to meditation for an hour, after which he said his mass. He took his coffee soon after, said a little office, and then settled down to map out his letter. At ten o'clock he was ready to receive callers, and till noon he was generally busy with both those who came to see him on their own responsibility, and his staff of half a dozen reporters, whose business it was to bring him marked paragraphs in the newspapers and their own comments. He then breakfasted with the other priests in the house, and set out soon after to call on people whose opinion was necessary, returning for a cup of tea soon after sixteen o'clock. 
then he settled down after the rest of his office and a visit to the blessed sacrament to compose his letter which though short needed a great deal of care and sifting after dinner he made a few notes for next day received visitors again and went to bed soon after twenty two o'clock twice a week it was his business to assist at vespers in the afternoon and he usually sang high mass on saturdays it was therefore a curiously distracting life with peculiar dangers it was one day a week or two after his visit to brighton that he was just finishing his letter when his servant looked in to tell him that father francis was below in ten minutes said percy without looking up he snapped off his last lines drew out the sheet and settled down to read it over translating it unconsciously from latin to english westminster may fourteenth eminence since yesterday i have a little more information it appears certain that the bill establishing esperanto for all state purposes will be brought in in june i have had this from johnson this as i have pointed out before is the very last stone in our consolidation with the continent which at present is to be regretted a great access of jews to freemasonry is to be expected hitherto they have held aloof to some extent but the abolition of the idea of god is tending to draw in those jews now greatly on the increase once more who repudiate all notion of a personal messiah it is humanity here too that is at work Today I heard the rabbi Simeon speak to this effect in the city, and was impressed by the applause he received. Yet, among others, an expectation is growing that a man will presently be found to lead the communist movement and unite their forces more closely. I enclose a verbose cutting from the new people to that effect, and it is echoed everywhere. They say that the cause must give birth to one such soon, that they have had prophets and precursors for a hundred years past and lately a cessation of them. It is strange how this coincides superficially with Christian ideas. Your eminence will observe that a simile of the ninth wave is used with some eloquence. I hear to-day of the secession of an old Catholic family, the Wargraves of Norfolk, with their chaplain Micklem, who it seems has been busy in this direction for some while. The epoch announces it with satisfaction, owing to the peculiar circumstances but unhappily such events are not uncommon now. There is much distrust among the laity. Seven priests in Westminster diocese have left us within the last three months. On the other hand, I have pleasure in telling your eminence that his grace received into Catholic communion this morning the ex-Anglican bishop of Carlisle, with half a dozen of his clergy. This has been expected for some weeks past. I append also cuttings from the Tribune, the London Trumpet, and the Observer, with my comments upon them. Your eminence will see how great the excitement is with regard to the last. Recommendation That formal excommunication of the Wargraves and these eight priests should be issued in Norfolk and Westminster respectively, and no further notice taken. Percy laid down the sheet, gathered up the half-dozen other papers that contained his extracts and running commentary, signed the last, and slipped the whole into the printed envelope that lay ready. Then he took up his beretta and went to the lift. The moment he came into the glass-doored parlor, he saw the crisis was come, if not past already. Father Francis looked miserably ill, but there was a curious hardness, too, about his eyes and mouth as he stood waiting. He shook his head abruptly. "'I have come to say good-bye, Father. I can bear it no more.' Percy was careful to show no emotion at all. He made a little sign to a chair, and himself sat down too. "'It is an end of everything,' said the other again, in a perfectly steady voice. "'I believe nothing. I have believed nothing for a year now.' "'You have felt nothing, you mean,' said Percy. "'That won't do, father,' went on the other. "'I tell you there is nothing left. I can't even argue now. It is just good-bye.' Percy had nothing to say. He had talked to this man during a period of over eight months, ever since Father Francis had first confided in him that his faith was going. He understood perfectly what a strain it had been. He felt bitterly compassionate towards this poor creature, who had become caught up somehow into the dizzy, triumphant whirl of the new humanity. External facts were horribly strong just now, and faith, 
except to one who had learned that will and grace were all, and emotion nothing, was as a child crawling about in the midst of some huge machinery. It might survive, or it might not, but it required nerves of steel to keep steady. It was hard to know where blame could be assigned, yet Percy's faith told him that there was blame due. In the ages of faith a very inadequate grasp of religion would pass muster. In these searching days none but the humble and the pure could stand the test for long, unless indeed they were protected by a miracle of ignorance. The alliance of psychology and materialism did indeed seem, looked at from one angle, to account for everything. It needed a robust supernatural perception to understand their practical inadequacy. And as regards Father Francis's personal responsibility, he could not help feeling that the other had allowed ceremonial to play too great a part in his religion, and prayer too little. In him the external had absorbed the internal. So he did not allow his sympathy to show itself in his bright eyes. "'You think it my fault, of course,' said the other sharply. "'My dear father,' said Percy, motionless in his chair, "'I know it is your fault. "'Listen to me.' You say Christianity is absurd and impossible. Now you know it cannot be that. It may be untrue. I am not speaking of that now, even though I am perfectly certain that it is absolutely true. But it cannot be absurd, so long as educated and virtuous people continue to hold it. To say that it is absurd is simple pride. It is to dismiss all who believe in it as not merely mistaken, but unintelligent as well. "'Very well, then,' interrupted the other. "'Then suppose I withdraw that, and simply say that I do not believe it to be true.' "'You do not withdraw it,' continued Percy serenely. "'You still really believe it to be absurd. "'You have told me so a dozen times. "'Well, I repeat, that is pride, and quite sufficient to account for it all. "'It is the moral attitude that matters. "'There may be other things, too.' "'Father Francis looked up sharply. "'Oh!' The old story, he said sneeringly. If you tell me on your word of honor that there is no woman in the case, or no particular program of sin you propose to work out, I shall believe you. But it is an old story, as you say. I swear to you there is not, cried the other. Thank God, then, said Percy. There are fewer obstacles to a return of faith. There was silence for a moment after that. Percy had really no more to say. He had talked to him of the inner life again and again, in which verities are seen to be true, and acts of faith are ratified. He had urged prayer and humility, till he was almost weary of the names, and had been met by the retort that this was to advise sheer self-hypnotism, and he had despaired of making clear to one who did not see it for himself, that while love and faith may be called self-hypnotism from one angle, yet from another they are as much realities as, for example, artistic faculties, and need similar cultivation, that they produce a conviction that they are convictions, that they handle and taste things, which, when handled and tasted, are overwhelmingly more real and objective than the things of sense. Evidences seemed to mean nothing to this man. So he was silent now, chilled himself by the presence of this crisis, looking unseeingly out upon the plain little old-world parlour, its tall window, its strip of matting, conscious chiefly of the dreary hopelessness of this human brother of his, who had eyes but did not see, ears, and was deaf. He wished he would say good-bye and go. There was no more to be done. Father Francis, who had been sitting in a lax kind of huddle, seemed to know his thoughts and sat up suddenly. "'You are tired of me,' he said. "'I will go.' "'I am not tired of you, my dear father,' said Percy simply. "'I am only terribly sorry. "'You see, I know that it is all true.' "'The other looked at him heavily. "'And I know that it is not,' he said. "'It is very beautiful. I wish I could believe it. "'I don't think I shall ever be happy again, but—but but there it is.' Percy sighed. He had told him so often that the heart is as divine a gift as the mind, and that to neglect it in the search for God is to seek ruin. But this priest had scarcely seen the application to himself. 
he had answered with the old psychological arguments that the suggestions of education accounted for everything. "'I suppose you will cast me off,' said the other. "'It is you who are leaving me,' said Percy. "'I cannot follow, if you mean that.' "'But cannot we be friends?' A sudden heat touched the elder priest's heart. "'Friends?' he said. "'Is sentimentality all you mean by friendship? What kind of friends can we be?' The other's face became suddenly heavy. "'I thought so.' "'John!' cried Percy. "'You see that, do you not? How can we pretend anything when you do not believe in God?' for I do you the honor of thinking that you do not. Francis sprang up. Well, he snapped, I could not have believed. I am going. He wheeled towards the door. John, said Percy again, are you going like this? Can you not shake hands? The other wheeled again, with heavy anger in his face. Why, you said you could not be friends with me. Percy's mouth opened. Then he understood, and smiled. Oh, that is all you mean by friendship, is it? I beg your pardon. Oh, we can be polite to one another, if you like. He still stood, holding out his hand. Father Francis looked at it a moment. His lips shook. Then once more he turned, and went out without a word. End of Book One Chapter 2, Part 1 Recording by Matthew Rees Book 1, Chapter 2, Part 2 of Lord of the World This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Matthew Rees Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson Book One, Advent Chapter Two, Part Two Percy stood motionless until he heard the automatic bell outside tell him that Father Francis was really gone. Then he went out himself, and turned towards the long passage leading to the cathedral. As he passed out through the sacristy, he heard far in front the murmur of an organ, and on coming through into the chapel used as a parish church, he perceived that vespers were not yet over in the great choir. He came straight down the aisle, turned to the right, crossed the center, and knelt down. It was drawing on toward sunset, and the huge dark place was lighted here and there by patches of ruddy London light that lay on the gorgeous marble and gildings finished at last by a wealthy convert. In front of him rose up the choir, with a line of white surpliced and furred cannons on either side, and the vast baldacchino in the midst, beneath which burned the six lights as they had burned day by day for more than a century. Behind that again lay the high line of the apse choir with the dim, window-pierced vault above where Christ reigned in majesty. He let his eyes wander round for a few moments before beginning his deliberate prayer, drinking in the glory of the place, listening to the thunderous chorus, the peal of the organ, and the thin, mellow voice of the priest. There on the left shone the refracted glow of the lamps that burned before the Lord in the sacrament. On the right a dozen candles winked here and there at the foot of the gaunt images. High overhead hung the gigantic cross with that lean, emaciated poor man who called all who looked on him to the embraces of a god. Then he hid his face in his hands, drew a couple of long breaths, and set to work. He began, as his custom was in mental prayer, by a deliberate act of self-exclusion from the world of sense. Under the image of sinking beneath a surface, he forced himself downwards and inwards, till the peal of the organ, the shuffle of footsteps, the rigidity of the chair-back beneath his wrists, all seemed apart and external, and he was left a single person with a beating heart, an intellect that suggested image after image, and emotions that were too languid to stir themselves. Then he made his second descent, renounced all that he possessed and was, and became conscious that even the body was left behind, and that his mind and heart, awed by the presence in which they found themselves, clung close and obedient to the will which was their lord and protector. He drew another long breath, or two, 
as he felt that presence surge about him. He repeated a few mechanical words, and sank to that peace which follows the relinquishment of thought. There he rested for a while. Far above him sounded the ecstatic music, the cry of trumpets and the shrilling of the flutes, but they were as insignificant street noises to one who was falling asleep. He was within the veil of things now, beyond the barriers of sense and reflection, in that secret place to which he had learned the road by endless effort, in that strange region where realities are evident, where perceptions go to and fro with the swiftness of light, where the swaying will catches now this, now that act, moulds it and speeds it, where all things meet, where truth is known and handled and tasted, where God imminent is one with God transcendent, where the meaning of the external world is evident through its inner side, and the church and its mysteries are seen from within a haze of glory. So he lay a few moments, absorbing and resting. Then he aroused himself to consciousness and began to speak. Lord, I am here, and thou art here. I know thee. There is nothing else but thou and I. I lay this all in thy hands, thy apostate priest, thy people, the world and myself. I spread it before thee. I spread it before thee. He paused, poised in the act, till all of which he thought lay like a plain before a peak. Myself, Lord, there but for thy grace should I be going in darkness and misery. It is thou who dost preserve me, maintain and finish thy work within my soul. Let me not falter for one instant, if thou withdraw thy hand, I fall into utter nothingness. So his soul stood a moment, with outstretched appealing hands helpless and confident. Then the will flickered in self-consciousness, and he repeated acts of faith, hope, and love to steady it. Then he drew another long breath, feeling the presence tingle and shake about him, and began again. Lord, look on thy people. Many are falling from thee. Ne in eternum irascaris nobis. Ne in eternum irascaris nobis. I unite myself with all saints and angels and Mary, Queen of Heaven. Look on them and me and hear us. Emite lucem, tuam et veritatem tuam. Thy light and thy truth lay not on us heavier burdens than we can bear. Lord, why dost thou not speak? He writhed himself forward in a passion of expectant desire, hearing his muscles crack in the effort. Once more he relaxed himself, and the swift play of wordless acts began which he knew to be the very heart of prayer. The eyes of his soul flew hither and thither, from Calvary to heaven and back again, to the tossing troubled earth. He saw Christ dying of desolation while the earth rocked and groaned, Christ reigning as a priest upon his throne in robes of light, Christ patient and inexorably silent within the sacramental species and to each in turn he directed the eyes of the Eternal Father. Then he waited for communications, and they came, so soft and delicate, passing like shadows, that his will sweated blood and tears in the effort to catch and fix them and correspond. He saw the body mystical in its agony, strained over the world as on a cross, silent with pain. He saw this and that nerve wrenched and twisted, till pain presented it to himself as under the guise of flashes of color. He saw the life-blood drop by drop run down from his head and hands and feet. The world was gathered, mocking and good-humored beneath. He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ come down from the cross, and we will believe. Far away behind bushes and in holes of the ground the friends of Jesus peeped and sobbed. Mary herself was silent pierced by seven swords, the disciple whom he had loved had no words of comfort. He saw, too, how no word would be spoken from heaven. The angels themselves were bidden to put sword into sheath, and wait on the eternal patience of God. For the agony was hardly yet begun. There were a thousand horrors yet, before the end could come, that final sum of crucifixion. He must wait and watch, content to stand there and do nothing and the resurrection must seem to him no more than a dreamed-of hope. There was the Sabbath yet to come, while the body mystical must lie in its sepulchre, cut off from light, 
and even the dignity of the cross must be withdrawn and the knowledge that Jesus lived. That inner world, to which by long effort he had learned the way, was all alight with agony. It was bitter as brine. It was of that pale luminosity that is the utmost product of pain. It hummed in his ears with a note that rose to a scream. It pressed upon him, penetrated him, stretched him as on a rack. And with that his will grew sick and nerveless. "'Lord, I cannot bear it,' he moaned. In an instant he was back again, drawing long breaths of misery. He passed his tongue over his lips, and opened his eyes on the darkening apse before him. The organ was silent now, and the choir was gone, and the lights out. The sunset color, too, had faded from the walls, and grim, cold faces looked down on him from wall and vault. He was back again on the surface of life. The vision had melted. He scarcely knew what it was that he had seen. But he must gather up the threads, and by sheer effort absorb them. He must pay his duty, too, to the Lord that gave himself to the senses as well as to the inner spirit. So he rose, stiff and constrained, and passed across to the chapel of the Holy Sacrament. As he came out from the block of chairs, very upright and tall, with his beretta once more on his white hair, he saw an old woman watching him very closely. He hesitated an instant, wondering whether she were a penitent, and, as he hesitated, she made a movement towards him. "'I beg your pardon, sir,' she began. She was not a Catholic, then. He lifted his beretta. "'Can I do anything for you?' he asked. "'I beg your pardon, sir, but were you at Brighton, at the accident two months ago?' "'I was.' "'Ah! I thought so. My daughter-in-law saw you then.' Percy had a spasm of impatience. He was a little tired of being identified by his white hair and young face. "'Were you there, madam?' She looked at him doubtfully and curiously, moving her old eyes up and down his figure. Then she recollected herself. "'No, sir, it was my daughter-in-law. I beg your pardon, sir, but—' "'Well?' asked Percy, trying to keep the impatience out of his voice. "'Are you—' "'The Archbishop, sir.' The priest smiled, showing his white teeth. "'No, madam, I am just a poor priest. Dr. Comondelet is Archbishop. I am Father Percy Franklin.' She said nothing, but still looking at him, made a little old-world movement of a bow, and Percy passed on to the dim, splendid chapel to pay his devotions. End of Book One Chapter 2, Part 2 Recording by Matthew Rees Book 1, Chapter 2, Part 3 of Lord of the World This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Rees Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson Book One, The Advent, Chapter Two, Part Three. There was great talk that night at dinner among the priests as to the extraordinary spread of Freemasonry. It had been going on for many years now, and Catholics perfectly recognized its dangers, for the profession of Masonry had been for some centuries rendered incompatible with religion through the Church's unswerving condemnation of it. A man must choose between that and his faith. Things had developed extraordinarily during the last century. First there had been the organized assault upon the church, in France. And what Catholics had always suspected then became a certainty in the revelations of 1918, when P. Jerome, the Dominican and ex-Mason, had made his disclosures with regard to the Mark Masons. It had become evident then that Catholics had been right and that Masonry, in its higher grades at least, had been responsible throughout the world for the strange movement against religion. But he had died in his bed, and the public had been impressed by that fact. Then came the splendid donations to France and Italy, to hospitals, orphanages, and the like, and once more suspicion began to disappear. After all, it seemed, and continued to seem, for seventy years and more, that masonry was nothing more than a vast philanthropical society. 
now once more men had their doubts. "'I hear that Felsenburg is a mason,' observed Monsignor Mackintosh, the cathedral administrator. "'A grand master or something.' "'But who is Felsenburg?' put in a young priest. Monsignor pursed his lips and shook his head. He was one of those humble persons as proud of ignorance as others of knowledge. He boasted that he had never read the papers, nor any book except those that had received the imprimatur. It was a priest's business, he often remarked, to preserve the faith, not to acquire worldly knowledge. Percy had occasionally rather envied his point of view. "'He's a mystery,' said another priest, Father Blackmore, "'but he seems to be causing great excitement. "'They were selling his life to-day on the embankment.' "'I met an American senator,' put in Percy, three days ago, "'who told me that even there they know nothing of him, "'except his extraordinary eloquence. "'He only appeared last year, "'and seems to have carried everything before him "'by quite unusual methods. "'He is a great linguist, too. "'That is why they took him to Irkutsk.' "'Well, the Masons,' went on Monsignor, "'it is very serious. "'In the last month four of my penitents "'have left me because of it.' "'Their inclusion of women was their master stroke,' growled Father Blackmore, helping himself to Claret. "'It is extraordinary that they hesitated so long about that,' observed Percy. A couple of the others added their evidence. It appeared that they, too, had lost penitence lately through the spread of masonry. It was rumoured that a pastoral was a preparing upstairs on the subject. Monsignor shook his head ominously. "'More is wanted than that,' he said. Percy pointed out that the church had said her last word several centuries ago. She had laid her excommunication on all members of secret societies, and there was really no more that she could do. "'Except bring it before her children again and again,' put in Monsignor. "'I shall preach on it next Sunday.' Percy dotted down a note when he reached his room, determined to say another word or two on the subject to the Cardinal Protector. He had mentioned Freemasonry often before, but it seemed time for another remark." Then he opened his letters, first turning to one which he recognized as from the cardinal. It seemed a curious coincidence, as he read a series of questions that Cardinal Martin's letter contained, that one of them should be on this very subject. It ran as follows. What of masonry? Felsenberg is said to be one. Gather all the gossip you can about him. Send any English or American biographies of him. Are you still losing Catholics through masonry? He ran his eyes down the rest of the questions. They chiefly referred to previous remarks of his own, but twice, even in them, Felsenberg's name appeared. He laid the paper down and considered a little. It was very curious, he thought, how this man's name was in everyone's mouth, in spite of the fact that so little was known about him. He had bought in the streets, out of curiosity, three photographs that professed to represent this strange person, and, though one of them might be genuine, they all three could not be. He drew them out of a pigeonhole, and spread them before him. One represented a fierce, bearded creature like a Cossack, with round, staring eyes. No, intrinsic evidence condemned this. It was exactly how a coarse imagination would have pictured a man who seemed to be having a great influence in the East. The second showed a fat face with little eyes and a chin-beard. That might conceivably be genuine. He turned it over and saw the name of a New York firm on the back. Then he turned to the third. This presented a long, clean-shaven face with pince-nez, undeniably clever, but scarcely strong, and Felsenberg was obviously a strong man. Percy inclined to think that the second was the most probable, but they were all unconvincing, and he shuffled them carelessly together and replaced them. Then he put his elbows on the table and began to think. He tried to remember what Mr. Varhaus, the American senator, had told him of Felsenberg yet it did not seem sufficient to account for the facts. Felsenberg, it seemed, had employed none of those methods common in modern politics. He controlled no newspapers, vituperated nobody, championed nobody, had no picked underlings, he used no bribes, there were no monstrous crimes alleged against him. It seemed, rather, as if his originality lay in his clean hands and his stainless past, that and his magnetic character. He was the kind of figure that belonged rather to the age of chivalry, a pure, clean, compelling personality, like a radiant child. He had taken people by surprise, then, 
rising out of the heaving, dun-colored waters of American socialism like a vision, from those waters so fiercely restrained from breaking into storm over since the extraordinary social revolution under Mr. Hearst's disciples a century ago. That had been the end of plutocracy. The famous old laws of 1914 had burst some of the stinking bubbles of the time, and the enactments of 1916 and 1917 had prevented their forming again in anything like their previous force. It had been the salvation of America, undoubtedly, even if that salvation were of a dreary and uninspiring description. And now, out of the flat socialistic level, had arisen this romantic figure, utterly unlike anything that had preceded it. So the senator had hinted. It was too complicated for Percy just now, and he gave it up. It was a weary world, he told himself, turning his eyes homewards. Everything seemed so hopeless and ineffective. He tried not to reflect on his fellow priests, but for the fiftieth time he could not help seeing that they were not the men for the present situation. It was not that he preferred himself. He knew perfectly well that he too was fully as incompetent. Had he not proved to be so with poor Father Francis and scores of others who had clutched at him in their agony during the last ten years? Even the archbishop, holy man as he was, with all his childlike faith, was that the man to lead English Catholics and confound their enemies? There seemed no giants on the earth in these days. What in the world was to be done? He buried his face in his hands. Yes. What was wanted was a new order in the church. The old ones were rule-bound through no fault of their own. An order was wanted without habit or tonsure, without traditions or customs. An order with nothing but entire and wholehearted devotion, without pride even in their most sacred privileges, without a past history in which they might take complacent refuge. They must be franc tireurs of Christ's army, like the Jesuits, but without their fatal reputation, which, again, was no fault of their own. But there must be a founder. Who, in God's name? A founder nudu sequens Christum nudum. Yes, franc tireurs, priests, bishops, laymen, and women, with the three vows, of course, and a special clause forbidding utterly and forever their ownership of corporate wealth. Every gift received must be handed to the bishop of the diocese in which it was given, who must provide them himself with necessaries of life and travel. Oh, what could they not do? He was off in a rhapsody. Presently he recovered and called himself a fool. Was not that scheme as old as the eternal hills and as useless for practical purposes? Why, it had been the dream of every zealous man since the first year of salvation that such an order should be founded. He was a fool. Then, once more, he began to think of it all over again. Surely it was this which was wanted against the Masons, and women, too. Had not scheme after scheme broken down because men had forgotten the power of women? It was that lack that had ruined Napoleon. He had trusted Josephine, and she had failed him. So he had trusted no other woman. In the Catholic Church, too, women had been given no active work, but either menial or connected with education. And was there not room for other activities than those? Well, it was useless to think of it. It was not his affair. If Papa Angelicus, who now reigned in Rome, had not thought of it, why should a foolish, conceited priest in Westminster set himself up to do so? So he beat himself on the breast once more, and took up his office book. He finished in half an hour, and again sat thinking, but this time it was of poor Father Francis. He wondered what he was doing now, whether he had taken off the Roman collar of Christ's familiar slaves, the poor devil, and how far was he, Percy Franklin, responsible? When a tap came at his door presently, and Father Blackmore looked in for a talk before going to bed, Percy told him what had happened. Father Blackmore removed his pipe and sighed deliberately. "'I knew it was coming,' he said. "'Well, well.' "'He has been honest enough,' explained Percy. "'He told me eight months ago he was in trouble.' Father Blackmore drew on his pipe thoughtfully. "'Father Franklin,' he said, "'things are really very serious. "'There is the same story everywhere. "'What in the world is happening?' Percy paused before answering. I think these things go in waves, he said. Waves, do you think? said the other. 
What else? Father Blackmore looked at him intently. It is more like a dead calm, it seems to me, he said. Have you ever been in a typhoon? Percy shook his head. Well, went on the other, the most ominous thing is the calm. The sea is like oil. You feel half dead. You can do nothing. Then comes the storm. Percy looked at him, interested. He had not seen this mood in the priest before. Before every great crash there comes this calm. It is always so in history. It was so before the Eastern War. It was so before the French Revolution. It was so before the Reformation. There is a kind of oily heaving, and everything is languid. So everything has been in America, too, for over eighty years. Father Franklin, I think something is going to happen. Tell me, said Percy, leaning forward. Well, I saw Templeton a week before he died, and he put the idea in my head. Look here, Father, it may be this Eastern affair that is coming on us, but somehow I don't think it is. It is in religion that something is going to happen. At least, so I think. Father, who in God's name is Felsenberg? Percy was so startled at the sudden introduction of this name again that he stared a moment without speaking. Outside, the summer night was very still. There was a faint vibration now and again from the underground track that ran twenty yards from the house where they sat. But the streets were quiet enough round the cathedral. Once a hoot rang far away, as if some ominous bird of passage were crossing between London and the stars, and once the cry of a woman sounded thin and shrill from the direction of the river. For the rest, there was no more than the solemn, subdued hum that never ceased now, night or day. "'Yes, Felsenberg,' said Father Blackmore once more. "'I cannot get that man out of my head. "'And yet, what do I know of him? "'What does anyone know of him?' Percy licked his lips to answer, and drew a breath to still the beating of his heart. He could not imagine why he felt excited. After all, who was old Blackmore to frighten him? But old Blackmore went on before he could speak. See how people are leaving the church, the Wargraves, the Hendersons, Sir James Bartlett, Lady Manier, and then all the priests. Now they're not all knaves. I wish they were. It would be so much easier to talk of it. But Sir James Bartlett, last month. Now there's a man who has spent half his fortune on the church, and he doesn't resent it even now. He says that any religion is better than none, but that, for himself, he just can't believe any longer. Now what does all that mean? I tell you, something is going to happen. God knows what. And I can't get Felsenberg out of my head. Father Franklin. Yes? Have you noticed how few great men we've got? It's not like fifty years ago, or even thirty. Then there were Mason, Selborne, Sherbrooke, and half a dozen others. There was Brightman, too, as Archbishop. And now! Then the Communists, too. Braithwaite is dead fifteen years. Certainly he was big enough, but he was always speaking of the future, not of the present. And tell me what big man they have had since then. And now there's this new man whom no one knows who came forward in America a few months ago, and whose name is in everyone's mouth. Very well, then. Percy knitted his forehead. I am not sure that I understand, he said. Father Blackmore knocked his pipe out before answering. Well, this, he said, standing up. I can't help thinking Felsenberg is going to do something. I don't know what. It may be for us or against us. But he is a mason, remember that. Well, well, I dare say I'm an old fool. Good night. One moment, father, said Percy slowly. Do you mean... Good Lord, what do you mean? He stopped, looking at the other. The old priest stared back under his bushy eyebrows. It seemed to Percy as if he, too, were afraid of something in spite of his easy talk. But he made no sign. Percy stood perfectly still a moment when the door was shut. 
Then he moved across to his pre dieu End of Book One, Chapter Two, Part Three. Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa. Book One, Chapter Three, Part One of Lord of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Goffney. Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson. Book One, Chapter Three, Part One. Old Mrs. Brand and Mabel were seated at a window of the new Admiralty offices in Trafalgar Square to see Oliver deliver his speech on the fiftieth anniversary of the passing of the Poor Laws Reform. It was an inspiriting sight, this bright June morning, to see the crowds gathering round Braithwaite's statue. That politician, dead fifteen years before, was represented in his famous attitude, with arms outstretched and down-dropped, his head up, and one foot slightly advanced, and to-day was decked, as was becoming more and more usual on such occasions, in his Masonic insignia. It was he who had given immense impetus to that secret movement by his declaration in the House that the key of future progress and brotherhood of nations was in the hands of the order. It was through this alone that the false unity of the Church with its fantastic spiritual fraternity could be counteracted. St. Paul had been right, he declared, in his desire to break down the partition walls between nations and wrong only in his exaltation of Jesus Christ. Thus he had preluded his speech on the poor law question, pointing to the true charity that existed among Masons apart from religious motive, and appealing to the famous benefactions on the continent, and in the enthusiasm of the bill's success the order had received a great accession of members. Old Mrs. Brand was in her best today, and looked out with considerable excitement at the huge throng gathered to hear her son speak. A platform was erected round the bronze statue at such a height that the statesman appeared to be one of the speakers, though at a slightly higher elevation, and this platform was hung with roses, surmounted by a sounding board, and set with a chair and table. The whole square roundabout was paved with heads and resonant with sound, the murmurs of thousands of voices, overpowered now and again by the crash of brass and thunder of drums as the benefit societies and democratic guilds, each headed by a banner, deployed from the north, south, east, and west, and converged toward the wide-railed space about the platform where room was reserved for them. The windows on every side were packed with faces, Tall stands were erected along the front of the National Gallery and St. Martin's Church, garden beds of color behind the mute white statues that faced outwards round the square. From Braithwaite in front, past the Victorians, John Davidson, John Burns, and the rest, round to Hampton and De Montfort toward the north. The old column was gone with its lions. Nelson had not been found advantageous to the Entente Cordiale, nor the lions to the new art, and in their place stretched a wide pavement broken by slopes of steps that led up to the National Gallery. Overhead, the roofs showed crowded friezes of heads against the blue summer sky. Not less than 100,000 persons, it was estimated in the evening papers, were collected within sight and sound of the platform by noon. As the clocks began to tell the hour, two figures appeared from behind the statue and came forward, and in an instant the murmurs of talk rose into cheering. Old Lord Pemberton came first, a gray-haired, upright man, whose father had been active in denouncing the house, of which he was a member on the occasion of its fall over seventy years ago, and his son had succeeded him worthily. This man was now a member of the government, and sat for Manchester, third, and it was he who was to be chairman on this auspicious occasion. Behind him came Oliver bareheaded and spruce, and even at that distance his mother and wife could see his brisk movement, his sudden smile and nod as his name emerged from the storm of sound that surged round the platform. Lord Pemberton came forward, lifted his hand, and made a signal, and in a moment the thin cheering died under the sudden roll of drums beneath that preluded the Masonic hymn. There was no doubt that these Londoners could sing. It was as if a giant voice hummed the sonorous melody, rising to enthusiasm till the music of massed bands followed it as a flag follows a flagstick. 
The hymn was one composed ten years before, and all England was familiar with it. Old Mrs. Brand lifted the printed paper mechanically to her eyes and saw the words that she knew so well. The Lord that dwells in earth and sea. She glanced down the verses that, from the humanitarian point of view, had been composed with both skill and ardor. They had a religious ring. The unintelligent Christian could sing them without a qualm, yet their sense was plain enough. The old human creed that man was all. Even Christ's words themselves were quoted. The kingdom of God, it was said, lay within the human heart, and the greatest of all graces was charity. She glanced at Mabel, and saw that the girl was singing with all her might, with her eyes fixed on her husband's dark figure a hundred yards away, and her soul pouring through them. So the mother, too, began to move her lips in chorus with that vast volume of sound. As the hymn died away, and before the cheering could begin again, old Lord Pemberton was standing forward on the edge of the platform, and his thin metallic voice piped a sentence or two across the tinkling splash of the fountains behind him. Then he stepped back, and Oliver came forward. It was too far for the two to hear what was said, but Mabel slipped a paper, smiling tremulously, into the old lady's hand, and herself bent forward to listen. Old Mrs. Brand looked at that, too, knowing that it was an analysis of her son's speech, and aware that she would not be able to hear his words. There was an exordium first, congratulating all who were present to do honor to that great man who presided from his pedestal on the occasion of this great anniversary. Then there came a retrospect, comparing the old state of England with the present. Fifty years ago, the speaker said, poverty was still a disgrace. Now it was so no longer. It was in the causes that led to poverty that the disgrace or the merit lay. Who would not honor a man worn out in the service of his country, or overcome at last by circumstances against which his efforts could not prevail? He enumerated the reforms passed fifty years before on this very day, by which the nation once and for all declared the glory of poverty and man's sympathy with the unfortunate. So he had told them he was to sing the praise of patient poverty and its reward, and that, he supposed, together with a few periods on the reform of the prison laws, would form the first half of his speech. The second part was to be a panegyric of Braithwaite, treating him as the precursor of a movement that even now had begun. Old Mrs. Brand leaned back in her seat and looked about her. The window where they sat had been reserved for them. Two armchairs filled the space, but immediately behind there were others, standing very silent now, craning forward, watching, two with parted lips, a couple of women with an old man directly behind, and other faces visible again behind them. Their obvious absorption made the old lady a little ashamed of her distraction, and she turned resolutely once more to the square. Ah, he was working up now to his panegyric. The tiny dark figure was back, a yard nearer the statue, and as she looked, his hand went up and he wheeled, pointing, as a murmur of applause drowned for an instant the minute, resonant voice. Then again he was forward, half crouching, for he was a born actor, and a storm of laughter rippled around the throng of heads. She heard an indrawn hiss behind her chair, and the next instant an exclamation from Mabel. What was that? There was a sharp crack, and the tiny gesticulating figure staggered back a step. The old man at the table was up in a moment, and simultaneously a violent commotion bubbled and heaved like water about a rock at a point in the crowd immediately outside the railed space where the bands were massed, and directly opposite the front of the platform. Mrs. Brand, bewildered and dazed, found herself standing up, clutching the window rail, while the girl gripped her, crying out something she could not understand. A great roaring filled the square, the heads tossed this way and that, like corn under a squall of wind. Then Oliver was forward again, pointing and crying out, for she could see his gestures. And she sank back quickly, the blood racing through her old veins, and her heart hammering at the base of her throat. "'My dear, my dear, what is it?' she sobbed. But Mabel was up, too, staring out at her husband, and a quick babble of talk and exclamations from behind made itself audible in spite of the roaring tumult of the square. End of Book One Chapter Three Part One of Lord of the World Recording by John Goffney of AudioVectors.com Book One, Chapter Three, Part Two of Lord of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Goffney. Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson. Book One, Chapter Three, Part Two. Oliver told them the explanation of the whole affair that evening at home, leaning back in his chair with one arm bandaged and in a sling. They had not been able to get near him at the time. The excitement in the square had been too fierce. But a messenger had come to his wife with the news that her husband was only slightly wounded and was in the hands of the doctors. He was a Catholic, explained the drawn-faced Oliver. He must have come ready, for his repeater was found loaded. Well, there was no chance for a priest this time. Mabel nodded slowly. She had read of the man's fate on the placards. He was killed, trampled and strangled instantly, said Oliver. I did what I could. You saw me. Well, I dare say it was more merciful. But you did what you could, my dear, said the old lady anxiously from the corner. I called out to them, mother, but they wouldn't hear me. Mabel leaned forward. Oliver, I know this sounds stupid of me, but, but I wish they had not killed him. Oliver smiled at her. He knew this tender trait in her. It would have been more perfect if they had not, she said. Then she broke off and sat back. "'Why did he shoot just then?' she asked. Oliver turned his eyes for an instant towards his mother, but she was knitting tranquilly. Then he answered with a curious deliberateness. "'I said that Braithwaite had done more for the world by one speech than Jesus and all his saints put together.' He was aware that the knitting needles stopped for a second. Then they went on again as before. "'But he must have meant to do it anyhow,' continued Oliver. "'How do they know he was a Catholic?' asked the girl again. "'There was a rosary on him, and then he just had time to call on his God.' "'And nothing more is known?' "'Nothing more. He was well dressed, though.' Oliver leaned back a little wearily and closed his eyes. His arms still throbbed intolerably. But he was very happy at heart. It was true that he had been wounded by a fanatic, but he was not sorry to bear pain in such a cause, and it was obvious that the sympathy of England was with him. Mr. Phillips even now was busy in the next room, answering the telegrams that poured in every moment. Caldecott, the Prime Minister, Maxwell, Snowford, and a dozen others had wired instantly their congratulations, and from every part of England streamed in message after message. It was an immense stroke for the Communists, that their spokesman had been assaulted during the discharge of his duty, speaking in defense of his principles. It was an incalculable gain for them, and loss for the individualists, that confessors were not all on one side after all. The huge electric placards over London had winked out the facts in Esperanto as Oliver stepped into the train at twilight. Oliver Brand wounded. Catholic assailant, indignation of the country, well-deserved fate of assassin. He was pleased, too, that he honestly had done his best to save the man. Even in that moment of sudden and acute pain he had cried out for a fair trial, but he had been too late. He had seen the starting eyes roll up in the crimson face, and the horrid grin come and go as the hands had clutched and torn at his throat. Then the face had vanished, and a heavy trampling began where it had disappeared. Oh, there was some passion and loyalty left in England. His mother got up presently and went out, still without a word, and Mabel turned to him, laying a hand on his knee. "'Are you too tired to talk, my dear?' He opened his eyes. "'Of course not, my darling. What is it?' "'What do you think will be the effect?' He raised himself a little, looking out as usual through the darkening windows on to that astonishing view. Everywhere now lights were glowing, a sea of mellow moons just above the houses, and above the mysterious heavy blue of a summer evening. The effect, he said, it can be nothing but good. It was time that something happened. My dear, I feel very downcast sometimes, as you know. Well, I do not think I shall be again. I have been afraid sometimes that we were losing all our spirit, and that the old Tories were partly right, when they prophesied what communism would do. But after this, well, well, we have shown that we can shed our blood too. It is in the nick of time too, just at the crisis. 
I don't want to exaggerate. It is only a scratch, but it was so deliberate and, and so dramatic. The poor devil could not have chosen a worse moment. People won't forget it. Mabel's eyes shone with pleasure. You poor dear, she said. Are you in pain? Not much. Besides, Christ, what do I care? If only this infernal eastern affair would end. He knew he was feverish and irritable, and made a great effort to drive it down. Oh, my dear, he went on, flushed a little. If they would not be such heavy fools, they don't understand, they don't understand. Yes, Oliver? They don't understand what a glorious thing it all is. Humanity, life, truth at last, and the death of folly. But haven't I told them a hundred times? She looked at him with kindling eyes. She loved to see him like this, his confident, flushed face, the enthusiasm in his blue eyes, and the knowledge of his pain pricked her feeling with passion. She bent forward and kissed him suddenly. My dear, I am so proud of you. Oh, Oliver. He said nothing. But she could see what she loved to see, that response to her own heart. And so they sat in silence while the sky darkened yet more, and the click of the rider in the next room told them that the world was alive and that they had a share in its affairs. Oliver stirred presently. Did you notice anything just now, sweetheart, when I said that about Jesus Christ? She stopped knitting for a moment, said the girl. He nodded. You saw that too, then. Mabel, do you think she is falling back? Oh, she is getting old said the girl lightly. Of course she looks back a little. But you don't think. It would be too awful. She shook her head. No, no, my dear. You're excited and tired. It's just a little sentiment. Oliver, I don't think I would say that kind of thing before her. But she hears it everywhere now. No, she doesn't. Remember, she hardly ever goes out. Besides, she hates it. After all, she was brought up a Catholic. Oliver nodded and lay back again, looking dreamily out. Isn't it astonished the way in which suggestion lasts? She can't get it out of her head, even after fifty years. Well, watch her, won't you? By the way. Yes? There's a little more news from the East. They say Felsenberg's running the whole thing now. The Empire is sending him everywhere. Tobolsk, Benares, Yakutsk, everywhere. And he's been to Australia. Mabel sat up briskly. Isn't that very hopeful? I suppose so. There's no doubt that the Sufis are winning, but for how long is another question. Besides, the troops don't disperse. And Europe? Europe is arming as fast as possible. I hear we are to meet the powers next week at Paris. I must go. Your arm, my dear. My arm must get well. It will have to go with me anyhow. Tell me some more. There is no more. But it is just as certain as it can be that this is the crisis. If the East can be persuaded to hold its hand now, it will never be likely to raise it again. It will mean free trade all over the world, I suppose, and all that kind of thing. But if not, well, if not, there will be a catastrophe such as never has been even imagined. The whole human race will be at war, and either East or West will simply be wiped out. These new Benenshine explosives will make certain of that. But is it absolutely certain that the East has got them? Absolutely. Ben and Shine sold them simultaneously to East and West, then he died, luckily for him. Mabel had heard this kind of talk before, but her imagination simply refused to grasp it. A duel of East and West under these new conditions was an unthinkable thing. There had been no European war within living memory, and the Eastern wars of the last century had been under the old conditions. Now, if tales were true, Entire towns would be destroyed with a single shell. The new conditions were unimaginable. Military experts prophesied extravagantly, contradicting one another on vital points. The whole procedure of war was a matter of theory. There were no precedents with which to compare it. It was as if archers disputed as to the results of cordite. Only one thing was certain, that the East had every modern engine, and, as regards male population, half as much again as the rest of the world put together, and the conclusion to be drawn from these premises was not reassuring to England. But imagination simply refused to speak. The daily papers had a short, careful, leading article every day, founded upon the scraps of news that stole out from the conferences on the other side of the world. Felsenberg's name appeared more frequently than ever. Otherwise, there seemed to be a kind of hush. Nothing suffered very much. Trade went on. 
European stocks were not appreciably lower than usual. Men still built houses, married wives, begat sons and daughters, did their business and went to the theater for the mere reason that there was no good in anything else. They could neither save nor precipitate the situation. It was on too large a scale. Occasionally, people went mad, people who had succeeded in goading their imagination to a height whence a glimpse of reality could be obtained, and there was a diffused atmosphere of tenseness, but that was all. Not many speeches were made on the subject. It had been found inadvisable. After all, there was nothing to do but wait. End of Book 1, Chapter 3, Part 2 of Lord of the World Recording by John Goffney of audiovectors.com Book 1 Chapter 3 Part 3 of Lord of the World This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by John Goffney Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson Book 1 Chapter 3 Part 3 Mabel remembered her husband's advice to watch, and for a few days did her best. But there was nothing that alarmed her. The old lady was a little quiet, perhaps, but went about her minute affairs as usual. She asked the girl to read to her sometimes, and listened unblenching to whatever was offered her. She attended in the kitchen daily, organized varieties of food, and appeared interested in all that concerned her son. She packed his bag with her own hands, set out his furs for the swift flight to Paris, and waved to him from the window as he went down the little path towards the junction. He would be gone three days, he said. It was on the evening of the second day that she fell ill, and Mabel, running upstairs in alarm at the message of the servant, found her rather flushed and agitated in her chair. "'It is nothing, my dear,' said the old lady tremulously, and she added the description of a symptom or two. Mabel got to her bed, sent for the doctor, and sat down to wait. She was sincerely fond of the old lady, and had always found her presence in the house a quiet sort of delight. The effect of her upon the mind was as that of an easy chair upon the body. The old lady was so tranquil and human, so absorbed in small external matters, so reminiscent now and then of the days of her youth, so utterly without resentment or peevishness. It seemed curiously pathetic to the girl to watch that quiet old spirit approach its extinction, or, rather, as Mabel believed, its loss of personality in the reabsorption into the spirit of life which informed the world. She found less difficulty in contemplating the end of a vigorous soul, for in that case she imagined a kind of energetic rush of force back into the origin of things. But in this peaceful old lady there was so little energy. Her whole point, so to speak, lay in the delicate little fabric of personality, built out of fragile things into an entity far more significant than the sum of its component parts. The death of a flower, reflected Mabel, is sadder than the death of a lion, the breaking of a piece of china more irreparable than the ruin of a palace. "'It is syncope,' said the doctor when he came in. "'She may die at any time. She may live ten years.' "'There is no need to telegraph for Mr. Brand?' He made a little deprecating movement with his hands. "'It is not certain that she will die. Is it, it is not imminent?' she asked. "'No, no, she may live ten years,' I said. He added a word or two of advice as to the use of the oxygen injector, and went away. The old lady was lying quietly in bed when the girl went up and put out a wrinkled hand. "'Well, my dear,' she asked. It is just a little weakness, mother. You must lie quiet and do nothing. Shall I read to you? No, my dear, I, I will think a little. It was no part of Mabel's idea to duty to tell her that she was in danger, for there was no past to set straight, no judge to be confronted. Death was an ending, not a beginning. It was a peaceful gospel. At least it became peaceful as soon as the end had come. So the girl went downstairs once more, with a quiet little ache at her heart that refused to be still. What a strange and beautiful thing death was, she told herself, this resolution of a cord that had hung suspended for thirty, fifty, or seventy years, back again into the stillness of the huge instrument that was all in all to itself. Those same notes would be struck again, were being struck again even now all over the world, though with an infinite delicacy of difference in the touch. But that particular emotion was gone. 
It was foolish to think that it was sounding eternally elsewhere, for there was no elsewhere. She, too, herself, would cease one day. Let her see to it that the tone was pure and lovely. Mr. Phillips arrived the next morning as usual, just as Mabel had left the old lady's room, and asked news of her. "'She is a little better, I think,' said Mabel. "'She must be very quiet all day.' The secretary bowed and turned aside into Oliver's room, where a heap of letters lay to be answered. A couple of hours later, as Mabel went upstairs once more, she met Mr. Phillips coming down. He looked a little flushed under his sallow skin. "'Mrs. Brand sent for me,' he said. "'She wished to know whether Mr. Oliver would be back tonight. He will, will he not? You have not heard?' "'Mr. Brand said he would be here for a late dinner. He will reach London at nineteen. "'And is there any other news?' he compressed his lips. "'There are rumors,' he said. "'Mr. Brand wired to me an hour ago.' He seemed moved at something, and Mabel looked at him in astonishment. "'It is not Eastern news?' she asked. His eyebrows wrinkled a little. "'You must forgive me, Mrs. Brand,' he said. "'I am not at liberty to say anything.' She was not offended, for she trusted her husband too well, but she went on into the sick-room with her heart beating. The old lady, too, seemed excited. She lay in bed with a clear flush in her white cheeks, and hardly smiled at all to the girl's greeting. "'Well, have you seen Mr. Phillips, then?' said Mabel. Old Mrs. Brand looked at her sharply an instant, but said nothing. "'Don't excite yourself, mother. Oliver will be back to-night.' The old lady drew a long breath. "'Don't trouble about me, my dear.' she said. I shall do very well now. He will be back to dinner, will he not? If the voller is not late. Now, mother, are you ready for breakfast? Mabel passed an afternoon of considerable agitation. It was certain that something had happened. The secretary, who breakfasted with her in the parlor looking on to the garden, had appeared strangely excited. He had told her that he would be away the rest of the day. Mr. Oliver had given him his instructions. He had refrained from all discussion of the Eastern question, and he had given her no news of the Paris Convention. He only repeated that Mr. Oliver would be back that night. Then he had gone off in a hurry half an hour later. The old lady seemed asleep when the girl went up afterwards, and Mabel did not like to disturb her. Neither did she like to leave the house, so she walked by herself in the garden, thinking and hoping and fearing, till the long shadow lay across the path, and the tumbled platform of roofs was bathed in a dusty green haze from the west. As she came in she took up the evening paper, but there was no news there except to the effect that the convention would close that afternoon. Twenty o'clock came, but there was no sign of Oliver. The Paris voller should have arrived an hour before, but Mabel, staring out into the darkening heavens, had seen the stars come out like jewels one by one, but no slender winged fish pass overhead. Of course, she might have missed it. There was no depending on its exact course, but she had seen it a hundred times before, and wondered unreasonably why she had not seen it now. But she would not sit down to dinner, and paced up and down in her white dress, turning again and again to the window, listening to the soft rush of the trains, the faint hoots from the track, and the musical chords from the junction a mile away. The lights were up by now, and the vast sweep of the towns looked like fairyland between the earthly light and the heavenly darkness. Why did not Oliver come, or at least let her know why he did not? Once she went upstairs, miserably anxious herself, to reassure the old lady, and found her again very drowsy. "'He has not come,' she said. "'I dare say he may be kept in Paris.' The old face on the pillow nodded and murmured, and Mabel went down again. It was now an hour after dinner-time. Oh, there were a hundred things that might have kept him. He had often been later than this. He might have missed the voller he meant to catch. The convention might have been prolonged. He might be exhausted and think it better to sleep in Paris after all, and have forgotten to wire. He might even have wired to Mr. Phillips, and the secretary have forgotten to pass on the message. She went at last hopelessly to the telephone and looked at it. There it was, that round silent month, that little row of labeled buttons. She half decided to touch them one by one, and inquire whether anything had been heard of her husband. There was his club, his office in Whitehall, Mr. Phillips' house, Parliament House, and the rest. But she hesitated, telling herself to be patient. Oliver hated interference, and he would surely soon remember and relieve her anxiety. Then, even as she turned away, the bell rang sharply, and a white label flashed into sight. Whitehall. She pressed the corresponding button, and, her hand shaking so much that she could scarcely hold the receiver to her ear, she listened. "'Who is there?' 
Her heart leaped at the sound of her husband's voice, tiny and minute across the miles of wire. I, uh, Mabel, she said, alone here. Oh, Mabel, very well. I am back. All is well. Now listen. Can you hear? Yes, yes. The best has happened. It is all over in the east. Felsenberg has done it. Now listen, I cannot come home tonight. It will be announced in Paul's house in two hours from now. We are communicating with the press. Come up here to meet me at once. You must be present. Can you hear? Oh, yes. Come then at once. It will be the greatest thing in history. Tell no one. Come before the rush begins. In half an hour the way will be stopped. Oliver. Yes, quick. Mother is ill. Shall I leave her? How ill? Oh, no immediate danger. The doctor has seen her. There was silence for a moment. Yes, come then. We will go back tonight anyhow, then. Tell her we shall be late. Very well. Yes, you must come. Felsenberg will be there. End of Book One, Chapter Three, Part Three. Recording by John Goffney of AudioVectors.com. Book One, Chapter Four, Part One of Lord of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Goffney. Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson. Book One, Chapter Four, Part One. On the same afternoon, Percy received a visitor. There was nothing exceptional about him, and Percy, as he came downstairs in his walking dress and looked at him in the light from the tall parlor window, came to no conclusion at all as to his business and person, except that he was not a Catholic. "'You wish to see me,' said the priest, indicating a chair. "'I fear I must not stop long.' "'I shall not keep you long,' said the stranger eagerly. "'My business is done in five minutes.' Percy waited with his eyes cast down. Hey. A certain person has sent me to you. She was a Catholic once. She wishes to return to the church. Percy made a little movement with his head. It was a message he did not very often receive in these days. You will come, sir, will you not? You will promise me? The man seemed greatly agitated. His sallow face showed a little shining with sweat, and his eyes were piteous. Of course I will come, said Percy, smiling. Yes, sir, but you do not know who she is. It it would make a great stir, sir, if it was known. It must not be known, sir. You will promise me that, too? I must not make any promises of that kind, said the priest gently. I do not know the circumstances yet. The stranger licked his lips nervously. Well, sir, he said hastily, you will say nothing till you have seen her. You can promise me that. Oh, certainly, said the priest. Well, sir, you had better not know my name. It may make it easier for you and me, and— and if you please, sir, the lady is ill. You must come to-day, if you please, but not until this evening. Will twenty-two o'clock be convenient, sir? Where is it? asked Percy abruptly. It, it is near Croydon Junction. I will write down the address presently, and you will not come until twenty-two o'clock, sir. Why not now? Because the, the others may be there. They, they will be away then. I know that. This was rather suspicious, Percy thought discreditable plots had been known before, but he could not refuse outright. "'Why does she not send for her parish priest?' he asked. "'She does not know who he is, sir. She saw you once in the cathedral, sir, and, and asked for your name. Do you remember, sir, an old lady?' Percy did dimly remember something of the kind a month or two before, but he could not be certain, and said so. "'Well, sir, you will come, will you not?' "'I must communicate with Father Dolan.' said the priest, if he gives me permission. If you please, sir, Father, Father Dolan must not know her name. You will not tell him. I do not know it myself yet, said the priest, smiling. The stranger sat back abruptly at that, and his face worked. Well, sir, let me tell you this first. The old lady's son is my employer, and is a very prominent communist. She lives with him and his wife. The other two will be away tonight. That is why I am asking you all this, and now you will come, sir. Percy looked at him steadily for a moment or two. Certainly, if this was a conspiracy, the conspirators were feeble folk. Then he answered, "'I will come, sir, I promise. Now the name?' The stranger again licked his lips nervously, and glanced timidly from side to side. Then he seemed to gather his resolution. He leaned forward and whispered sharply, 
The old lady's name is Brand, sir, the mother of Mr. Oliver Brand. For a moment Percy was bewildered. It was too extraordinary to be true. He knew Mr. Oliver's name only too well. It was he who, by God's permission, was doing more in England at this moment against the Catholic cause than any other man alive, and it was he whom the Trafalgar Square incident has raised into such eminent popularity. And now, here was his mother. He turned fiercely upon the man. I do not know who you are, sir, whether you believe in God or not, but will you swear to me on your religion and your honor that all this is true? The timid eyes met his and wavered, but it was the wavering of weakness, not of treachery. I, I swear it, sir, by God Almighty. Are you a Catholic? The man shook his head. But I believe in God, he said. At least I think so. Percy leaned back, trying to realize exactly what it all meant. There was no triumph in his mind. That kind of emotion was not his weakness. There was fear of a kind, excitement, bewilderment, and under all a satisfaction that God's grace was so sovereign. If it could reach this woman, who could be too far removed for it to take effect? Presently he noticed the other looking at him anxiously. "'You are afraid, sir. You, you are not going back from your promise?' That dispersed the cloud a little, and Percy smiled. "'Oh, no,' he said. "'I will be there at twenty-two o'clock. Is death imminent?' "'No, sir, it's syncope. She has recovered a little this morning.' The priest passed his hand over his eyes and stood up. "'Well, I will be there,' he said. "'Shall you be there, sir?' The other shook his head, standing up, too. "'I must be with Mr. Brand, sir. There is to be a meeting tonight, but I must not speak of that.' No, sir. Ask for Mrs. Brand, and say that she is expecting you. They will take you upstairs at once. I must not say I'm a priest, I suppose. No, sir, if you please. He drew out a pocket-book, scribbled in it a moment, tore out the sheet, and handed it to the priest. The address, sir. Will you kindly destroy that when you have copied it? I, I do not wish to lose my place, sir, if it can be helped. Percy stood, twisting the paper in his fingers a moment. Why are you not a Catholic yourself? he asked. The man shook his head mutely, then took up his hat and went towards the door. Percy passed a very emotional afternoon. For the last month or two little had happened to encourage him. He had been obliged to report half a dozen more significant secessions, and hardly a conversion of any kind. There was no doubt at all that the tide was setting steadily against the church. The mad act in Trafalgar Square, too, had done incalculable harm last week. Men were saying, more than ever, and the papers storming, that the church's reliance on the supernatural was belied by every one of her public acts. Scratch a Catholic and find an assassin, had been the text of a leading article in The New People, and Percy himself was dismayed at the folly of the attempt. It was true that the archbishop had formally repudiated both the act and the motive from the Catholic pulpit, but that too had only served as an opportunity hastily taken up by the principal papers to recall the continual policy of the church to avail herself of violence while she repudiated the violent. The horrible death of the man had in no way appeased popular indignation. They were not even wanting suggestions that the man had been seen coming out of Archbishop's house an hour before the attempt at assassination had taken place. And now here, with dramatic swiftness, had come a message that the hero's own mother desired reconciliation with the church that had attempted to murder her son. Again and again that afternoon, as Percy sped northwards on his visit to a priest in Worcester, and southwards once more as the lights began to shine towards evening, he wondered whether this were not a plot after all, some kind of retaliation, an attempt to trap him. Yet he had promised to say nothing and to go. He finished his daily letter after dinner as usual, with a curious sense of fatality, addressed and stamped it. Then he went downstairs, in his walking dress, to Father Blackmore's room. "'Will you hear my confession, Father?' he said abruptly. End of Book One, Chapter Four, Part One. Recording by John Goffney of AudioVectors.com. Book One, Chapter Four, Part Two of Lord of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Mike Ockenick. Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson. Book One, Chapter Four, Part Two. Victoria Station, still named after the great nineteenth century queen, was neither more nor less busy than usual as he came into it half an hour later. The vast platform, sunk now nearly two hundred feet below the ground level, showed the double crowd of passengers entering and leaving town. Those on the extreme left, toward whom Percy began to descend in the open glazed lift, were by far the most numerous, and the stream at the lift entrance made it necessary for him to move slowly. He arrived at last, walking in the soft light on the noiseless ribbed rubber, and stood by the door of the long car that ran straight through to the junction. It was the last of a series of a dozen or more, each of which slid off minute by minute. Then, watching the endless movement of the lifts ascending and descending between the entrances of the upper end of the station, he stepped in and sat down. He felt quiet now that he had actually started. He had made his confession, just in order to make certain of his own soul, though scarcely expecting any definite danger, and sat now, his gray suit and straw hat, in no way distinguishing him as a priest, for a general leave was given by the authorities to dress so for any adequate reason. Since the case was not imminent, he had not brought stocks or picks. Father Dolan had wired to him that he might fetch them, if he wished, from St. Joseph's, near the junction. He had only the violet thread in his pocket, such as was customary for sick calls. He was sliding along, peaceably enough, fixing his eyes on the empty seat opposite, and trying to preserve complete collectedness, when the car abruptly stopped. He looked out, astonished, and saw by the white enameled walks twenty feet from the window that they were already in the tunnel. The stoppage might arise from many causes, and he was not greatly excited, nor did it seem that others in the carriage took it very seriously. He could hear, after a moment's silence, the talking recommence beyond the partition. Then there came, echoed by the walls, the sound of shouting from far away, mingled with hoots and chords. It grew louder. The talking in the carriage stopped. He heard a window thrown up, and the next instant a car tore past, going back to the station, although on the down line. This must be looked into, thought Percy. Something certainly was happening. So he got up and went across the empty compartment to the further window. Again came the crying of voices, again the signals, and once more a car whirled past, followed almost immediately by another. There was a jerk, a smooth movement. Percy staggered and fell into a seat, as the carriage in which he was seated itself began to move backwards. There was a clamor now in the next compartment, and Percy made his way there through the door, only to find half a dozen men with their heads thrust from the windows, who paid absolutely no attention to his inquiries. So he stood there, aware that they knew no more than himself, waiting for an explanation from someone. It was disgraceful, he told himself, that any misadventure should so disorganize the line. Twice the car stopped. Each time it moved on again, after a hoot or two, and at last drew up at the platform whence it had started, although a hundred yards further out. Ah! there was no doubt that something had happened. The instant he opened the door a great roar met his ears, and as he sprang on to the platform and looked up at the end of the station, he began to understand. From right to left of the huge interior across the platforms, swelling every instant, surged an enormous, swaying, roaring crowd. The flight of steps, twenty yards broad, used only in cases of emergency, resembled a gigantic black cataract nearly two hundred feet in height. Each car as it drew up discharged more and more men and women who ran like ants toward the assembly of their fellows. The noise was indescribable, the shouting of men, the screaming of women, the clang and hoot of the huge machines, and three or four times the brazen cry of a trumpet as an emergency door was flung open overhead 
and a small swirl of crowd poured through it toward the streets beyond. But after one look Percy looked no more at the people, for there, high up beneath the clock, on the government signal board, flared out monstrous letters of fire, telling in Esperanto and English the message for which England had grown sick. He read it a dozen times before he moved, staring as at a supernatural sight which might denote the triumph of either heaven or hell. Eastern Convention Dispersed Peace, not war Universal Brotherhood Established Felsenberg in London tonight. End of Book One, Chapter Four, Part Two. Recording by Mike Ockenick. Chapter Four, Part Three of Lord of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Hogan. Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson. Chapter 4, Part 3. It was not until nearly two hours later that Percy was standing at the house beyond the junction. He had argued, expostulated, threatened, but the officials were like men possessed. Half of them had disappeared in the rush to the city for it had leaked out, in spite of the government's precautions, that Paul's house, known once as St. Paul's Cathedral, was to be the scene of Felsenberg's reception. The others seemed demented. One man on the platform had dropped dead from nervous exhaustion, but no one appeared to care, and the body lay huddled beneath the seat. Again and again Percy had been swept away by a rush, as he struggled from platform to platform, in his search for a car that would take him to Croydon. It seemed that there was none to be had and the useless carriages collected like driftwood between the platforms, as others whirled up from the country, bringing loads of frantic, delirious men, who vanished like smoke from the white rubber boards. The platforms were continually crowded, and as continually emptied, and it was not until half an hour before midnight that the block began to move outwards again. Well, he was here at last, disheveled, hatless, and exhausted, looking up at the dark windows. He scarcely knew what he thought of the whole matter. War, of course, was terrible, and such a war as this would have been too terrible for the imagination to visualize, but to the priest's mind there were other things, even worse. What of the universal peace, peace, that is to say, established by others than Christ's method? Or was God behind even this? The questions were hopeless. Felsenberg, it was he, then, who had done this thing this thing undoubtedly greater than any secular event hitherto known in civilization. What manner of man was he? What was his character, his motive, his method? How would he use his success? So the points flew before him, like a stream of sparks, each, it might be, harmless, each equally capable of setting a world on fire. Meanwhile, here was an old woman who desired to be reconciled with God before she died. He touched the button again three or four times and waited. Then a light sprang out overhead, and he knew that he was heard. "'I was sent for,' he exclaimed to the bewildered maid. "'I should have been here at twenty-two. I was prevented by the rush.' She babbled out a question at him. "'Yes, it is true, I believe,' he said. "'It is peace, not war. Kindly take me upstairs.' He went through the hall with a curious sense of guilt. But this was Brand's house, then." that vivid orator so bitterly eloquent against God, and here was he, a priest, slinking in under cover of night. Well, well, it was not of his appointment. At the door of an upstairs room the maid turned to him. A doctor, sir, she said. That is my affair, said Percy briefly, and opened the door. A little wailing cry broke from the corner, before he had time to close the door again. "'Oh, thank God! I thought he had forgotten me. You are a priest, father?' "'I am a priest. Do you not remember seeing me in the cathedral?' "'Yes, yes, sir. I saw you praying, father. Oh, thank God! Thank God!' Percy stood looking down at her a moment, seeing her flushed old face in the nightcap, her bright sunken eyes, and her tremulous hands. Yes, this was genuine enough. "'Now, my child,' he said, "'tell me.' 
My confession, father. Percy drew out the purple thread, slipped it over his shoulders, and sat down by the bed. But she would not let him go for a while after that. Tell me, father, when will you bring me Holy Communion? He hesitated. I understand that Mr. Brand and his wife know nothing of all this. No, father. Tell me, are you very ill? I don't know, father. They will not tell me. I thought I was gone last night. When would you wish me to bring you Holy Communion? I will do as you say. Shall I send to you in a day or two? Father, ought I to tell him? You are not obliged. I will if I ought. Well, think about it, and let me know. You have heard what has happened. She nodded, but almost uninterestedly, and Percy was conscious of a tiny prick of compunction at his own heart. After all, the reconciling of a soul to God was a greater thing than the reconciling of East to West. It may make a difference to Mr. Brand, he said. He will be a great man now, you know. She still looked at him in silence, smiling a little. Percy was astonished at the youthfulness on that old face. Then her face changed. Father, I must not keep you. But tell me this. Who is this man? Felsenberg? Yes. No one knows. We shall know more tomorrow. He is in town tonight. She looked so strange that Percy, for an instant, thought it was a seizure. Her face seemed to fall away in a kind of emotion, half cunning, half fear. Well, my child? Father, I am a little afraid when I think of that man. He cannot harm me, can he? I am safe now. I am a Catholic. My child, of course you are safe. What is the matter? How can this man injure you? But the look of terror was still there, and Percy came a step nearer. You must not give way to fancies, he said. Just commit yourself to our blessed Lord. This man can do you no harm. He was speaking now, as to a child, but it was of no use. Her old mouth was still sucked in, and her eyes wandered past him, into the gloom of the room behind. My child, tell me what is the matter. What do you know of Felsenberg? You have been dreaming. She nodded suddenly and energetically, and Percy, for the first time, felt his heart give a little leap of apprehension. Was this old woman out of her mind, then? Or why was it? That name seemed to him sinister. Then he remembered that Father Blackmore had once talked like this. He made an effort, and sat down once more. Now tell me plainly, he said. You have been dreaming. What have you dreamt? She raised herself a little in bed, again glancing around the room. Then she put out her old ringed hand for one of his, and he gave it, wondering. The door is shut, father. There's no one listening. No, no, my child. Why are you trembling? You must not be superstitious. Father, I will tell you. Dreams are nonsense, are they not? Well, at least, this is what I dreamt. I was somewhere in a great house. I do not know where it was. It was a house I have never seen. It was one of the old houses, and it was very dark. I was a child, I thought, and I was... I was afraid of something. The passages were all dark, and I went crying in the dark, looking for a light, and there was none. Then I heard a voice talking, a great way off. Father! Her hand gripped his more tightly, and again her eyes went round the room. With great difficulty, Percy repressed a sigh. Yet he dared not leave her just now. The house was very still. Only from outside now and again sounded the clang of the cars, as they sped countrywards again from the congested town, and once the sound of great shouting. He wondered what time it was. "'Had you better tell me now?' he asked, still talking with a patient simplicity. "'What time will they be back?' "'Not yet,' she whispered. "'Mabel said not till two o'clock. "'What time is it now, father?' He pulled out his watch with his disengaged hand. It is not yet one, he said. Very well. Listen, father. I was in this house, and I heard that talking, and I ran along the passages till I saw light below a door, and then I stopped. Nearer, father. Percy was a little awed in spite of himself. Her voice had suddenly dropped to a whisper, and her old eyes seemed to hold him strangely. I stopped, father. I dared not go in. I could hear the talking, and I could see the light, and I dared not go in. Father, it was Felsenberg in that room. From beneath came the sudden snap of a door, then the sound of footsteps. 
Percy turned his head abruptly, and at that same moment heard a swift indrawn breath from the old woman. "'Hush!' he said. "'Who is that?' Two voices were talking in the hall below now, and at the sound the old woman relaxed her hold. "'I—I I thought it to be him,' she murmured. Percy stood up. He could see that she did not understand the situation. "'Yes, my child,' he said quietly. "'But who is it?' "'My son and his wife,' she said. Then her face changed once more. "'Why, why, father!' Her voice died in her throat, as a step vibrated outside. For a moment there was complete silence. Then a whisper, plainly audible, in a girl's voice. "'Why, her light is burning. Come in, Oliver, but softly.' Then the handle turned. End of Quan Chapter 4, Part 3 Recording by Linda Hogan Book 1, Chapter 5, Part 1 Of Lord of the World This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson Book One, Chapter Five, Part One There was an exclamation, then silence, as a tall, beautiful girl with flushed face and shining green eyes came forward and stopped, followed by a man whom Percy knew at once from his pictures. A little whimpering sounded from the bed, and the priest lifted his hand instinctively to silence it. "'Why?' said Mabel, and then stared at the young man with the young face and the white hair. Oliver opened his lips and closed them again. He, too, had a strange excitement in his face. Then he spoke. "'Who is this?' he said deliberately. "'Oliver!' cried the girl, turning to him abruptly. "'This is the priest I saw.' "'A priest?' said the other, and came forward a step. "'Why, I thought—' Percy drew a breath to steady that maddening vibration in his throat. "'Yes, I am a priest,' he said. Again the whimpering broke out from the bed, and Percy, half turning again to silence it, saw the girl mechanically loosen the clasp of the thin dust-cloak over her white dress. "'You sent for him, mother?' snapped the man, with a tremble in his voice, and with a sudden jerk forward of his whole body. But the girl put out her hand. "'Quietly, my dear,' she said. "'Now, sir—' "'Yes, I am a priest,' said Percy again, strung up now to a desperate resistance of will, hardly knowing what he said. "'And you come to my house?' exclaimed the man. He came a step nearer and half recoiled. "'You swear you are a priest?' he said. "'You have been here all this evening?' "'Since midnight.' "'And you are not—' He stopped again. Mabel stepped straight between them. "'Oliver,' she said, still with that air of suppressed excitement, "'we must not have a scene here. The poor dear is too ill. Will you come downstairs, sir?' Percy took a step towards the door, and Oliver moved slightly aside. Then the priest stopped, turned, and lifted his hand. "'God bless you,' he said simply to the muttering figure in the bed. Then he went out and waited outside the door. He could hear a low talking within— then a compassionate murmur from the girl's voice. Then Oliver was beside him, trembling all over, as white as ashes, and made a silent gesture as he went past him down the stairs. The whole thing seemed to Percy like some incredible dream. It was all so unexpected, so untrue to life. He felt conscious of an enormous shame at the sordidness of the affair, and at the same time of a kind of hopeless recklessness. The worst had happened, and the best— that was his sole comfort. Oliver pushed a door open, touched a button, and went through into the suddenly lit room, followed by Percy. Still in silence he pointed to a chair. Percy sat down and Oliver stood before the fireplace, his hands deep in the pockets of his jacket, slightly turned away. Percy's concentrated senses became aware of every detail of the room, the deep springy green carpet smooth under his feet the straight-hanging thin silk curtains, the half-dozen low tables with a wealth of flowers upon them, and the books that lined the walls. 
The whole room was heavy with the scent of roses, although the windows were wide and the night breeze stirred the curtains continually. It was a woman's room, he told himself. Then he looked at the man's figure, lithe, tense, upright, the dark grey suit not unlike his own, the beautiful curve of the jaw, the clear pale complexion, the thin nose, the protruding curve of idealism over the eyes, and the dark hair. It was a poet's face, he told himself, and the whole personality was a living and vivid one. Then he turned a little and rose as the door opened and Mabel came in, closing it behind her. She came straight across to her husband and put a hand on his shoulder. "'Sit down, my dear,' she said. "'We must talk a little. Please sit down, sir.' The three sat down, Percy on one side and the husband and wife on a straight-backed settle opposite. The girl began. "'This must be arranged at once,' she said, "'but we must have no tragedy.' Oliver, do you understand? You must not make a scene. Leave this to me. She spoke with a curious gaiety, and Percy, to his astonishment, saw that she was quite sincere. There was not the hint of cynicism. Oliver, my dear, she said again, don't mouth like that. It is all perfectly all right. I am going to manage this. Percy saw a venomous look directed at him by the man. The girl saw it, too, moving her strong, humorous eyes from one to the other. She put her hand on his knee. Oliver, attend. Don't look at this gentleman so bitterly. He has done no harm. No harm, whispered the other. No, no harm in the world. What does it matter what that poor dear upstairs thinks? Now, sir, would you mind telling us why you came here? Percy drew another breath. He had not expected this line. I came here to receive Mrs. Brand back into the church, he said. And you have done so? I have done so. "'Would you mind telling us your name? It makes it so much more convenient.' Percy hesitated. Then he determined to meet her on her own ground. "'Certainly. My name is Franklin.' "'Father Franklin?' asked the girl, with just the faintest tinge of mocking emphasis on the first word. "'Yes. Father Percy Franklin, from Archbishop's House, Westminster,' said the priest steadily. "'Well, then, Father Percy Franklin.' Can you tell us why you came here? I mean, who sent for you? Mrs. Brand sent for me. Yes, but by what means? That I must not say. Oh, very good. May we know what good comes of being received into the church? By being received into the church, the soul is reconciled to God. Oh, Oliver, be quiet. And how do you do it, Father Franklin? Percy stood up abruptly. "'This is no good, madam,' he said. "'What is the use of these questions?' The girl looked at him in open-eyed astonishment, still with her hand on her husband's knee. "'The use, Father Franklin? Why, we want to know. There is no church law against your telling us, is there?' Percy hesitated again. He did not understand in the least what she was after. Then he saw that he would give them an advantage if he lost his head at all. So he sat down again. "'Certainly not. I will tell you if you wish to know. I heard Mrs. Brand's confession, and gave her absolution.' "'Oh, yes, and that does it, then. And what next?' "'She ought to receive Holy Communion, and anointing, if she is in danger of death.' Oliver twitched suddenly. "'Christ!' he said softly. "'Oliver,' cried the girl entreatingly, "'please leave this to me. It is much better so.' And then, I suppose, Father Franklin, you want to give those other things to my mother, too? They are not absolutely necessary, said the priest, feeling, he did not know why, that he was somehow playing a losing game. Oh, they're not necessary? But you would like to? I shall do so, if possible, but I have done what is necessary. It required all his will to keep quiet. He was as a man who had armed himself in steel, only to find that his enemy was in the form of a subtle vapour. He simply had not an idea what to do next. He would have given anything for the man to have risen and flown at his throat, for this girl was too much for them both. "'Yes,' she said softly. "'Well, it is hardly to be expected that my husband should give you leave to come here again, but I am very glad that you have done what you think necessary. No doubt it will be a satisfaction to you, Father Franklin.' and to the poor old thing upstairs. While we, we, she pressed her husband's knee, we do not mind at all. Oh, but there is one thing more. 
if you please, said Percy, wondering what on earth was coming. You Christians, forgive me if I say anything rude, but, you know, you Christians have a reputation for counting heads and making the most of converts. We shall be so much obliged, Father Franklin, if you will give us your word not to advertise this, uh, this incident. It would distress my husband and give him a great deal of trouble. Mrs. Brand, began the priest, one moment. You see, we have not treated you badly. There has been no violence. We will promise not to make scenes with my mother. Will you promise us that? Percy had had time to consider, and he answered instantly. Certainly, I will promise that. Mabel sighed contentedly. Well, that is all right. We are so much obliged, and I think we may say this, that perhaps after consideration my husband may see his way to letting you come here again to do communion and, and the other thing. Again that spasm shook the man beside her. Well, we will see about that. At any rate, we know your address and can let you know. By the way, Father Franklin, are you going back to Westminster to-night? He bowed. Ah, I hope you will get through. You will find London very much excited. Perhaps you heard— Felsenberg, said Percy. Yes, Julian Felsenberg, said the girl softly, again with that strange excitement suddenly alight in her eyes. Julian Felsenberg, she repeated. He is there, you know. He will stay in England for the present. Again Percy was conscious of that slight touch of fear at the mention of that name. I understand there is to be peace, he said. The girl rose, and her husband with her. Yes, she said, almost compassionately. There is to be peace. Peace at last. She moved half a step towards him, and her face glowed like a rose of fire. Her hand rose a little. Go back to London, Father Franklin, and use your eyes. You will see him, I dare say, and you will see more besides. Her voice began to vibrate. And you will understand, perhaps, why we have treated you like this. Why we are no longer afraid of you. Why we are willing that my mother should do as she pleases. Oh, you will understand, Father Franklin, if not to-night, to-morrow. Or if not to-morrow, at least in a very short time. Mabel! cried her husband. The girl wheeled and threw her arms around him and kissed him on the mouth. "'Oh, I am not ashamed, Oliver, my dear. Let him go and see for himself. Good night, Father Franklin.' As he went towards the door, hearing the ping of the bell that someone touched in the room behind him, he turned once more, dazed and bewildered, and there were the two, husband and wife, standing in the soft sunny light as if transfigured. The girl had her arm round the man's shoulder, and stood upright and radiant as a pillar of fire and even on the man's face there was no anger now, nothing but an almost supernatural pride and confidence. They were both smiling. Then Percy passed out into the soft summer night. End of Book One, Chapter Five, Part One Book One, Chapter Five, Part Two, of Lord of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson. Book One, Chapter Five, Part Two. Percy understood nothing except that he was afraid, as he sat in the crowded car that whirled him up to London. He scarcely even heard the talk round him, although it was loud and continuous, and what he heard meant little to him. He understood only that there had been strange scenes, that London was said to have gone suddenly mad, that Felsenberg had spoken that night in Paul's house. He was afraid at the way in which he had been treated, and he asked himself dully again and again, what it was that had inspired that treatment. It seemed that he had been in the presence of the supernatural. He was conscious of shivering a little, and of the symptoms of an intolerable sleepiness. It was scarcely strange to him that he should be sitting in a crowded car at two o'clock of a summer dawn. Thrice the car stopped, and he stared out at the signs of confusion that were everywhere, at the figures that ran in the twilight between the tracks, at a couple of wrecked carriages, a tumble of tarpaulins, he listened mechanically to the hoots and cries that sounded everywhere. 
As he stepped out at last onto the platform, he found it very much as he had left it two hours before. There was the same desperate rush as the car discharged its load, the same dead body beneath the seat, and above all, as he ran helplessly behind the crowd, scarcely knowing whither he ran or why, above him burned the same stupendous message beneath the clock. Then he found himself in the lift, and a minute later he was out on the steps behind the station. There, too, was an astonishing sight. The lamps still burned overhead, but beyond them lay the first pale streaks of the false dawn. The street that ran now straight to the old royal palace, uniting there, as at the centre of a web, with those that came from Westminster, the Mall and Hyde Park, was one solid pavement of heads. On this side and that rose up the hotels and houses of joy, the windows all ablaze with light, solemn and triumphant, as if to welcome a king while far ahead against the sky stood the monstrous palace outlined in fire, and a light from within like all other houses within view. The noise was bewildering. It was impossible to distinguish one sound from another. Voices, horns, drums, the tramp of a thousand footsteps on the rubber pavements, the sombre roll of wheels from the station behind, all united in one overwhelmingly solemn booming, overscored by shriller notes. It was impossible to move. He found himself standing in a position of extraordinary advantage, at the very top of the broad flight of steps that led down into the old station-yard, now a wide space that united on the left the broad road to the palace, and on the right Victoria Street, that showed, like all else, one vivid perspective of lights and heads. Against the sky on his right rose up the illuminated head of the cathedral campanile. It appeared to him as if he had known that in some previous existence. He edged himself mechanically a foot or two to his left, till he clasped a pillar. Then he waited, trying not to analyze his emotions, but to absorb them. Gradually he became aware that this crowd was as no other that he had ever seen. To his psychical sense it seemed to him that it possessed a unity unlike any other. There was magnetism in the air. There was a sensation as if a creative act were in process, whereby thousands of individual cells were being welded more and more perfectly every instant into one huge, sentient being with one will, one emotion, and one head. The crying of voices seemed significant only as the stirrings of this creative power which so expressed itself. Here rested this giant humanity, stretching to his sight in living limbs so far as he could see on every side, waiting waiting for some consummation, stretching, too, as his tired brain began to guess, down every thoroughfare of the vast city. He did not even ask himself for what they waited. He knew, yet he did not know. He knew it was for a revelation, for something that should crown their aspirations and fix them so for ever. He had a sense that he had seen all this before, and like a child he began to ask himself where it could have happened, until he remembered that it was so that he had once dreamt of the judgment day, of humanity gathered to meet Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ! Ah! Oh, how tiny that figure seemed to him now! How far away! Real, indeed, but insignificant to himself! How hopelessly apart from this tremendous life! He glanced up at the campanile. Yes, there was a piece of the true cross there, was there not? A little piece of the wood on which a poor man had died twenty centuries ago. Well, well! It was a long way off. He did not quite understand what was happening to him. "'Sweet Jesus, be to me not a judge but a saviour. he whispered beneath his breath, gripping the granite of the pillar, and a moment later knew how futile was that prayer. It was gone like a breath in this vast, vivid atmosphere of man. He had said mass, had he not, this morning, in white vestments. Yes, he had believed it all then, desperately, but truly. And now— to look into the future was as useless as to look into the past. There was no future, and no past. It was all one eternal instant, present and final. Then he let go of the effort, and again began to see with his bodily eyes. The dawn was coming up the sky now, a steady soft brightening that appeared in spite of its sovereignty to be as nothing compared with the brilliant light of the streets. We need no sun, he whispered, smiling piteously. No sun or light of a candle. We have our light on earth, 
the light that lighteneth every man. The campanile seemed further away than ever now, in that ghostly glimmer of dawn, more and more helpless every moment, compared with the beautiful vivid shining of the streets. Then he listened to the sounds, and it seemed to him as if somewhere, far down eastwards, there was a silence beginning. He jerked his head impatiently, as a man behind him began to talk rapidly and confusedly. Why would he not be silent, and let silence be heard? The man stopped presently, and out of the distance there swelled up a roar, as soft as the roll of a summer tide. It passed up towards him from the right. It was about him, dinning in his ears. There was no longer any individual voice. It was the breathing of the giant that had been born. He was crying out, too. He did not know what he said, but he could not be silent. His veins and nerves seemed alight with wine, and as he stared down the long street, hearing the huge cry ebb from him, and moved toward the palace, he knew why he had cried, and why he was now silent. A slender, fish-shaped thing as white as milk, as ghostly as a shadow, and as beautiful as the dawn, slid into sight half a mile away, turned and came towards him, floating, as it seemed, on the very wave of silence that it created, up, up the long curving street on outstretched wings, not twenty feet above the heads of the crowd. There was one great sigh, and then silence once more. When Percy could think consciously again, for his will was only capable of efforts as a clock of ticks, the strange white thing was nearer. He told himself that he had seen a hundred such before, and at the same instant that this was different from all the others. Then it was nearer still, floating slowly, slowly, like a gull over the sea. He could make out its smooth nose, its low parapet beyond, the steersman's head motionless. He could even hear now the soft winnowing of the screw. And then he saw that for which he had waited. High on the central deck there stood a chair, draped too in white, with some insignia visible above its back, and in the chair sat the figure of a man, motionless and lonely. He made no sign as he came. His dark dress showed vividly against the whiteness. His head was raised, and he turned it gently, now and again from side to side. It came nearer still in the profound stillness. The head turned, and for an instant the face was plainly visible in the soft, radiant light. It was a pale face, strongly marked, as of a young man, with arched black eyebrows, thin lips, and white hair. Then the face turned once more, the steersman shifted his head, and the beautiful shape, wheeling a little, passed the corner and moved up towards the palace. There was an hysterical yelp somewhere, a cry, and again the tempestuous groan broke out. End of Book One, Chapter Five, Part Two Book Two, Chapter One, Part One of Lord of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine Eckert Boulet, Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson. Book Two, Chapter One, Part One. Oliver Brand was seated at his desk on the evening of the next day reading the leading article of the new people evening edition we have had time he read to recover ourselves a little from the intoxication of last night before embarking on prophecy it will be as well to recall the facts up to yesterday evening our anxiety with regard to the eastern crisis continued and when twenty one o'clock struck there were not more than forty persons in london the English delegates, that is to say, who knew positively that the danger was over. Between that moment and half an hour later, the government took a few discreet steps. A select number of persons were informed. The police were called out, with half a dozen regiments, to preserve order. Paul's house was cleared. The railroad companies were warned. And at the half-hour precisely, the announcement was made by means of the electric placards in every quarter of London 
as well as in all large provincial towns. We have not space now to adequately describe the admirable manner in which the public authorities did their duty. It is enough to say that not more than seventy fatalities took place in the whole of London. Nor is it our business to criticize the action of the government in choosing this mode of making the announcement. By twenty-two o'clock, Paul's house was filled in every corner, the old choir was reserved for members of parliament and public officials, the quarter-dome galleries were filled with ladies, and to the rest of the floor the public was freely admitted. The Vola police also inform us now that for about the distance of one mile in every direction round this centre, every thoroughfare was blocked with pedestrians, and, two hours later, as we all know, practically all the main streets of the whole of London were in the same condition. It was an excellent choice by which Mr. Oliver Brand was selected as the first speaker. His arm was still in bandages, and the appeal of his figure, as well as his passionate words, struck the first explicit note of the evening. A report of his words will be found in another column. In their turns, the Prime Minister, Mr. Snowford, the First Minister of the Admiralty, the Secretary for Eastern Affairs, and Lord Pemberton, all spoke a few words, corroborating the extraordinary news. At a quarter before twenty-three, the noise of cheering outside announced the arrival of the American delegates from Paris, and one by one these ascended the platform by the south gates of the old choir. Each spoke in turn. It is impossible to appreciate words spoken at such a moment as this. But perhaps it is not invidious to name Mr. Markham as the orator who above all others appealed to those who were privileged to hear him. It was he, too, who told us explicitly what others had merely mentioned, to the effect that the success of the American efforts was entirely due to Mr. Julian Felsenberg. As yet Mr. Felsenberg has not arrived, but in answer to a roar of inquiry, Mr. Markham announced that this gentleman would be amongst them in a few minutes. He then proceeded to describe to us, so far as was possible in a few sentences, the methods by which Mr. Felsenberg had accomplished what is probably the most astonishing task known to history. It seems from his words that Mr. Felsenberg, whose biography, so far as it is known, we give in another column, is probably the greatest orator that the world has ever known. We use these words deliberately. All languages seem the same to him. He delivered speeches, during the eight months through which the Eastern Convention lasted, in no less than fifteen tongues. Of his manner in speaking, we shall have a few remarks to make presently. He showed also, Mr. Markham told us, the most astonishing knowledge, not only of human nature, but of every trait under which that divine thing manifests itself. He appeared acquainted with the history, the prejudices, the fears, the hopes, the expectations, of all the innumerable sects and castes of the East to whom it was his business to speak. In fact, as Mr. Markham said, he is probably the first perfect product of that new cosmopolitan creation to which the world has labored throughout its history. In no less than nine places, Damascus, Irkutsk, Constantinople, Calcutta, Benares, Nankin, among them, he was hailed as Messiah by a Mohammedan mob. Finally, in America, where this extraordinary figure has arisen, all speak well of him. He has been guilty of none of those crimes. There is not one that convicts him of sin. Those crimes of the yellow press, of corruption, of commercial or political bullying, which have so stained the past of all those old politicians who made the sister continent what she has become. Mr. Felsenberg has not even formed a party. He, and not his underlings, have conquered. Those who are present in Paul's house on this occasion will understand us when we say that the effect of those words was indescribable. When Mr. Markham sat down, there was a silence. Then, 
in order to quiet the rising excitement, the organist struck the first chords of the Masonic hymn. The words were taken up, and presently not only the whole interior of the building rang with it, but outside, too, the people responded, and the city of London for a few moments became indeed a temple of the Lord. Now indeed we come to the most difficult part of our task, and it is better to confess at once that anything resembling journalistic descriptiveness must be resolutely laid aside. The greatest things are best told in the simplest words. Towards the close of the fourth verse, a figure in a plain dark suit was observed ascending the steps of the platform. For a moment this attracted no attention, but when it was seen that a sudden movement had broken out among the delegates, the singing began to falter, and it ceased altogether as the figure, after a slight inclination to right and left, passed up the further steps that led to the rostrum. Then occurred a curious incident. The organist aloft at first did not seem to understand, and continued playing, but a sound broke out from the crowd, resembling a kind of groan, and instantly he ceased but no cheering followed. Instead, a profound silence dominated in an instant the huge throng. This, by some strange magnetism, communicated itself to those without the building, and when Mr. Felsenberg uttered his first words, it was in a stillness that was like a living thing. We leave the explanation of this phenomenon to the expert in psychology. Of his actual words we have nothing to say. So far as we are aware, no reporter made notes at the moment. But the speech, delivered in Esperanto, was a very simple one, and very short. It consisted of a brief announcement of the great fact of universal brotherhood, a congratulation to all who were yet alive to witness this consummation of history, and, at the end, an ascription of praise to that spirit of the world whose incarnation was now accomplished. So much we can say, but we can say nothing as to the impression of the personality who stood there. In appearance the man seemed to be about thirty-three years of age, clean-shaven, upright, with white hair and dark eyes and brows. He stood motionless, with his hands on the rail. He made but one gesture that drew a kind of sob from the crowd. He spoke these words slowly, distinctly, and in a clear voice. Then he stood waiting. There was no response but a sigh which sounded in the ears of at least one who heard it, as if the whole world drew breath for the first time. And then that strange heart-shaking silence fell again. Many were weeping silently, the lips of thousands moved without a sound, and all faces were turned to that simple figure, as if the hope of every soul were centered there. So, if we may believe it, the eyes of many centuries ago were turned on one known now to history as Jesus of Nazareth. Mr. Felsenberg stood so a moment longer, then he turned down the steps, passed across the platform, and disappeared. Of what took place outside, we have received the following account from an eyewitness. The white volor, so well known now to all who were in London that night, had remained stationary, outside the little south door of the old choir ale, poised about twenty feet above the ground. Gradually it became known to the crowd, in those few minutes, who it was who had arrived in it, and upon Mr. Felsenberg's reappearance that same strange groan sounded through the whole length of Paul's churchyard, followed by the same silence. The volor descended. The master stepped on board and once more the vessel rose to a height of twenty feet. It was thought at first that some speech would be made, but none was necessary, and after a moment's pause the volor began that wonderful parade which London will never forget. Four times during the night Mr. Felsenberg went round the enormous metropolis, speaking no word, and everywhere the groan preceded and followed him while silence accompanied his actual passage. Two hours after sunrise, the white ship rose over Hampstead, 
and disappeared towards the north. And since then he, whom we call, in truth, the saviour of the world, has not been seen. And now what remains to be said? Comment is useless. It is enough to say in one short sentence that the new era has begun, to which prophets and kings, and the suffering, the dying, all who labor and are heavy laden, have aspired in vain. Not only has intercontinental rivalry ceased to exist, but the strife of home dissensions has ceased also. Of him who has been the herald of its inauguration, we have nothing more to say. Time alone can show what is yet left for him to do. But what has been done is as follows. The eastern peril has been forever dissipated. It is understood now, by fanatic barbarians, as well as by civilized nations, that the reign of war is ended. Not peace but a sword, said Christ, and bitterly true have those words proved to be. Not a sword but peace, is the retort, articulate at last, from those who have renounced Christ's claim, or have never accepted them. The principle of love and union, learned however falteringly in the West during the last century, has been taken up in the East as well. There shall be no more an appeal to arms, but to justice, no longer a crying after a God who hides himself, but to man who has learned his own divinity. The supernatural is dead. Rather, we know now that it never yet has been alive. What remains is to work out this new lesson, to bring every action, word and thought, to the bar of love and justice. And this will be, no doubt, the task of years. Every code must be reversed, every barrier thrown down. Party must unite with party, country with country, and continent with continent. There is no longer the fear of fear, the dread of the hereafter, or the paralysis of strife. Man has groaned long enough in the travails of birth. His blood has been poured out like water through his own foolishness. But at length he understands himself, and is at peace. Let it be seen, at least, that England is not behind the nations in this work of reformation. Let no national isolation, pride of race, or drunkenness of wealth, hold her hands back from this enormous work. The responsibility is incalculable, but the victory is certain. Let us go softly, humbled by the knowledge of our crimes in the past, confident in the hope of our achievements in the future, towards that reward, which is in sight at last, the reward hidden so long by the selfishness of man, the darkness of religion, and the strife of tongues, the reward promised by one who knew not what he said, and denied what he asserted. Blessed are the meek, the peacemakers, the merciful, for they shall inherit the earth, be named the children of God, and find mercy." Oliver, white to the lips, with his wife kneeling now beside him, turned the page and read one more short paragraph, marked as being the latest news. It is understood that the government is in communication with Mr. Felsenberg. End of Book Two, Chapter One, Part One Book Two, Chapter One Part two of Lord of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine Cartboulet. Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson. Book two, chapter one, part two. Ah, it is journalese, said Oliver at last, leaning back. Tawdry stuff. But the thing! Mabel got up, passed across to the window seat, and sat down. Her lips opened once or twice, but she said nothing. My darling, cried the man, have you nothing to say? She looked at him tremulously a moment. Say, she said, as you said, what is the use of words? Tell me again, said Oliver, how do I know it is not a dream? A dream, she said. Was there ever a dream like this? Again she got up restlessly, 
came across the floor and knelt down by her husband once more, taking his hands in hers. "'My dear,' she said, "'I tell you, it is not a dream. It is reality at last. I was there, too, do you not remember? You waited for me when all was over, when he was gone out. We saw him together, you and I. We heard him, you on the platform, and I in the gallery. We saw him again pass up the embankment as we stood in the crowd. Then we came home, and we found the priest. Her face was transfigured as she spoke. It was as of one who saw a divine vision. She spoke very quietly, without excitement or hysteria. Oliver stared at her a moment. Then he bent forward and kissed her gently. "'Yes, my darling, it is true. But I want to hear it again and again. Tell me again what you saw.' "'I saw the Son of Man,' she said. "'Oh, there is no other phrase. The Saviour of the world, as that paper says. I knew him in my heart as soon as I saw him, as we all did, as soon as he stood there holding the rail. It was like a glory round his head. I understand it all now. It was he for whom we have waited so long, and he has come, bringing peace and good will in his hands. When he spoke, I knew it again. His voice was as, as the sound of the sea, as simple as that, as, as lamentable, as strong as that. Did you not hear it? Oliver bowed his head. I can trust him for all the rest, went on the girl softly. I do not know where he is, nor when he will come back, nor what he will do. I suppose there is a great deal for him to do, before he is fully known. Laws, reforms, that will be your business, my dear, and the rest of us must wait, and love, and be content. Oliver again lifted his face and looked at her. Mabel, my dear, Oh, I knew it even last night, she said, but I did not know that I knew it till I awoke today and remembered. I dreamed of him all night. Oliver, where is he? He shook his head. Yes, I know where he is, but I am under oath. She nodded quickly and stood up. Yes, I should not have asked that. Well, we are content to wait. There was silence for a moment or two. Oliver broke it. My dear, what do you mean when you say that he is not yet known? I mean just that, she said. The rest only know what he has done, not what he is. But that, too, will come in time. And meanwhile? Meanwhile, you must work. The rest will come by and by. Oh, Oliver, be strong and faithful. She kissed him quickly and went out. Oliver sat on without moving, staring, as his habit was, out at the wide view beyond his windows. This time yesterday he was leaving Paris, knowing the fact indeed, for the delegates had arrived an hour before, but ignorant of the man. Now he knew the man as well, at least he had seen him, heard him, and stood enchanted under the glow of his personality. He could explain it to himself no more than could any one else, unless, perhaps, it were Mabel. The others had been as he had been, owed and overcome, yet at the same time kindled in the very depth of their souls. They had come out, Snowford, Cartwright, Pemberton, and the rest, on to the steps of Paul's house, following that strange figure. They had intended to say something, but they were dumb as they saw the sea of white faces, heard the groan and the silence, and experienced that compelling wave of magnetism that surged up like something physical, as the volor rose and started on that indescribable progress. Once more he had seen him, as he and Mabel stood together on the deck of the electric boat that carried them south. The white ship had passed along overhead, smooth and steady, above the heads of that vast multitude, bearing him who, if any had the right to that title, was indeed the saviour of the world. Then they had come home and found the priest. That, too, had been a shock to him, for, at first sight, it seemed that this priest was the very man he had seen ascend the rostrum two hours before. It was an extraordinary likeness, the same young face and white hair. Mabel, of course, had not noticed it, for she had only seen Felsenburg at a great distance, 
and he himself had soon been reassured. And as for his mother, it was terrible enough. If it had not been for Mabel, there would have been violence done last night. How collected and reasonable she had been! And, as for his mother, he must leave her alone for the present. By and by, perhaps, something might be done. The future! It was that which engrossed him, the future and the absorbing power of the personality under whose dominion he had fallen last night. All else seemed insignificant now. Even his mother's defection, her illness, all paled before this new dawn of an unknown sun. And in an hour he would know more. He was summoned to Westminster, to a meeting of the whole house. Their proposals to Felsenburg were to be formulated. It was intended to offer him a great position. Yes, as Mabel had said, this was now their work, to carry into effect the new principle that had suddenly become incarnate in this grey-haired young American, the principle of universal brotherhood. It would mean enormous labour. All foreign relations would have to be readjusted. Trade, policy, methods of government, all demanded restatement. Europe was already organised internally on a basis of mutual protection. That basis was now gone. There was no more any protection, because there was no more any menace. Enormous labour, too, awaited the government in other directions. A blue book must be prepared, containing a complete report of the proceedings in the East, together with the text of the treaty which had been laid before them in Paris, signed by the Eastern Emperor, the feudal kings, the Turkish Republic, and countersigned by the American plenipotentiaries. Finally, even home politics required reform. The friction of all strife between centre and extremes must cease forthwith. There must be but one party now, and that at the Prophet's disposal. At the Prophet's disposal. He grew bewildered as he regarded the prospect, and saw how the whole plane of the world was shifted, how the entire foundation of Western life required readjustment. It was a revolution indeed, a cataclysm more stupendous than even invasion itself. But it was the conversion of darkness into light and chaos into order. He drew a deep breath and so sat pondering. Mabel came down to him half an hour later, as he dined early before starting for Whitehall. Mother is quieter, she said. We must be very patient, Oliver. Have you decided yet? as to whether the priest is to come again? He shook his head. I can think of nothing, he said, but of what I have to do. You decide, my dear. I leave it in your hands. She nodded. I will talk to her again presently. Just now she can understand very little of what has happened. What time shall you be home? Probably not to-night. We shall sit all night. Yes, dear. And what shall I tell Mr. Phillips? I will telephone in the morning. Mabel, do you remember what I told you about the priest? His likeness to the other? Yes. What do you make of that? She smiled. I make nothing at all of it. Why should they not be alike? He took a fig from the dish and swallowed it and stood up. It is only very curious, he said. Now, good night, my dear. End of Book Two, Chapter One, Part Two Book Two, Chapter One, Part Three of Lord of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine Kurtboulet. Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson. Book Two, Chapter One, Part Three. Oh, mother, said Mabel, kneeling by the bed, cannot you understand what has happened? She had tried desperately to tell the old lady of the extraordinary change that had taken place in the world, and without success. It seemed to her that some great issue depended on it, that it would be piteous if the old woman went out into the dark unconscious of what had come. It was as if a Christian knelt by the deathbed of a Jew on the first Easter Monday. 
but the old lady lay in her bed terrified but obdurate mother said the girl let me tell you again do you not understand that all which jesus christ promised has come true though in another way the reign of god has really begun but we know now who god is you said just now you wanted the forgiveness of sins well you have that we all have it because there is no such thing as sin there is only crime and then communion you used to believe that that made you a partaker of god well we are all partakers of god because we are human beings don't you see that christianity is only one way of saying all that i dare say it was the only way for a time but that is all over now oh and how much better this is it is true true you can see it to be true she paused a moment forcing herself to look at that piteous old face the flushed wrinkled cheeks the writhing knotted hands on the coverlet look how christianity has failed how it has divided people think of all the cruelties the inquisition the religious wars the separations between husband and wife and parents and children the disobedience to the state the treasons oh you cannot believe that these were right what kind of a god would that be and then hell how could you ever have believed in that oh mother don't believe anything so frightful don't you understand that that god has gone that he never existed at all that it was all a hideous nightmare and that now we all know at last what the truth is mother think of what happened last night how he came the man of whom you were so frightened i told you what he was like so quiet and strong how every one was silent of the the extraordinary atmosphere and how six millions of people saw him and think what he has done how he has healed all the old wounds how the whole world is at peace at last and of what is going to happen oh mother give up those horrible old lies give them up be brave the priest the priest moaned the old woman at last oh no 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 not the priest he can do nothing he knows it's all lies too the priest the priest moaned the other again he can tell you he knows the answer her face was convulsed with effort and her old fingers fumbled and twisted with the rosary mabel grew suddenly frightened and stood up oh mother she stooped and kissed her there i won't say any more now but just think about it quietly don't be in the least afraid it is all perfectly right she stood a moment still looking compassionately down torn by sympathy and desire no it was no use now she must wait till the next day i'll look in again presently she said when you have had dinner mother don't look like that kiss me it was astonishing she told herself that evening how any one could be so blind and what a confession of weakness too to call only for the priest it was ludicrous absurd she herself was filled with an extraordinary peace even death itself seemed now no longer terrible for was not death swallowed up in victory she contrasted the selfish individualism of the christian who sobbed and shrank from death or at the best thought of it only as the gate to his own eternal life with the free altruism of the new believer who asked no more than that man should live and grow that the spirit of the world should triumph and reveal himself while he the unit was content to sink back into that reservoir of energy from which he drew his life at this moment she would have suffered anything faced death cheerfully she contemplated even the old woman upstairs with pity for was it not piteous that death should not bring her to herself and reality she was in a quiet world of intoxication it was as if the heavy veil of sense had rolled back at last and shown a sweet eternal landscape behind a shadowless land of peace where the lion lay down with the lamb and the leopard with the kid there should be war no more that bloody spectre was dead and with him the brood of evil that lived in his shadow superstition conflict terror and unreality the idols were smashed and rats had run out 
Jehovah was fallen, the wild-eyed dreamer of Galilee was in his grave, the reign of priests was ended, and in their place stood a strange, quiet figure of indomitable power and unruffled tenderness, he whom she had seen, the Son of Man, the Saviour of the world, as she had called him just now. He who bore these titles was no longer a monstrous figure, half-god and half-man, claiming both natures and possessing neither, one who was tempted without temptation, and who conquered without merit, as his followers said. Here was one instead whom she could follow, a god indeed, and a man as well, a god because human, and a man because so divine. She said no more that night. She looked into the bedroom for a few minutes, and saw the old woman asleep. Her old hand lay out on the coverlet, and still between the fingers was twisted the silly string of beads. Mabel went softly across, in the shaded light, and tried to detach it. But the wrinkled fingers writhed and closed, and a murmur came from the half-open lips. Oh, how piteous it was, thought the girl, how hopeless that a soul should flow out into such darkness, unwilling to make the supreme generous surrender, and lay down its life, because life itself demanded it. Then she went to her own room. The clocks were chiming three, and the grey dawn lay on the walls, when she awoke to find by her bed the woman who had sat with the old lady. Come at once, madam. Mrs. Brand is dying. End of Book Two, Chapter One, Part Three. Book Two, Chapter One, Part Four of Lord of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine Kurt Boulet. Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson Book Two, Chapter One, Part Four Oliver was with them by six o'clock. He came straight up into his mother's room to find that all was over. The room was full of the morning light and the clean air, and a bubble of bird music poured in from the lawn. But his wife knelt by the bed, still holding the wrinkled hands of the old woman, her face buried in her arms. The face of his mother was quieter than he had ever seen it. The lines showed only like the faintest shadows on an alabaster mask. Her lips were set in a smile. He looked for a moment, waiting until the spasm that caught his throat had died again. Then he put his hand on his wife's shoulder. When, he said, Mabel lifted her face. Oh, Oliver, she murmured, it was an hour ago. Look at this. She released the dead hands and showed the rosary still twisted there. It had snapped in the last struggle, and a brown bead lay beneath the fingers. I did what I could, sobbed Mabel. I was not hard with her, but she would not listen. She kept on crying out for the priest as long as she could speak. My dear, began the man. Then he, too, went down on his knees by his wife, leaned forward and kissed the rosary, while tears blinded him. Yes, yes, he said. Leave her in peace. I would not move it for the world. It was her toy, was it not? The girl stared at him, astonished. We can be generous, too, he said. We have all the world at last. And she, she has lost nothing. It was too late. I did what I could. Yes, my darling, and you were right. But she was too old. She could not understand. He paused. Euthanasia, he whispered, with something very like tenderness. She nodded. Yes, she said, just as the last agony began. She resisted, but I knew you would wish it. They talked together for an hour in the garden before Oliver went to his room, and he began to tell her presently of all that had passed. He has refused, he said. We offered to create an office for him. He was to have been called consultor and he refused it two hours ago. But he has promised to be at our service. No, I must not tell you where he is. He will return to America soon, we think, but he will not leave us. We have drawn up a program, and it is to be sent to him presently. Yes, 
we were unanimous. And the program? It concerns the franchise, the poor laws, and trade. I can tell you no more than that. It was he who suggested the points. But we are not sure if we understand him yet. But, my dear, yes, it is quite extraordinary. I have never seen such things. There was practically no argument. Do the people understand? I think so. We shall have to guard against a reaction. They say that the Catholics will be in danger. There is an article this morning in the era. The proofs were sent to us for sanction. It suggests that means must be taken to protect the Catholics. Mabel smiled. It is a strange irony, he said, but they have a right to exist. How far they have a right to share in the government is another matter. That will come before us, I think, in a week or two. Tell me more about him. There is really nothing to tell. We know nothing, except that he is the supreme force in the world. France is in a ferment, and has offered him dictatorship. That, too, he has refused. Germany has made the same proposal as ourselves. Italy the same as France, with the title of perpetual tribune. America has done nothing yet, and Spain is divided. And the East? The Emperor thanked him, no more than that. Mabel drew a long breath, and stood looking out across the heat haze that was beginning to rise from the town beneath. These were matters so vast that she could not take them in. But to her imagination, Europe lay like a busy hive, moving to and fro in the sunshine. She saw the blue distance of France, the towns of Germany, the Alps, and beyond them the Pyrenees and sun-baked Spain, and all were intent on the same business, to capture, if they could, this astonishing figure that had risen over the world. Sober England, too, was alight with zeal. Each country desired nothing better than that this man should rule over them, and he had refused them all. "'He has refused them all?' she repeated breathlessly. "'Yes, all. We think he may be waiting to hear from America. He still holds office there, you know. How old is he?' "'Not more than thirty-two or three. He has only been in office a few months. Before that he lived alone in Vermont. Then he stood for the Senate. Then he made a speech or two. Then he was appointed delegate, though no one seems to have realized his power. And the rest we know.' Mabel shook her head meditatively. "'We know nothing,' she said. "'Nothing, nothing. Where did he learn his languages?' "'It is supposed that he travelled for many years.' But no one knows. He has said nothing. She turned swiftly to her husband. But what does it all mean? What is his power? Tell me, Oliver. He smiled back, shaking his head. Well, Markham said that it was his incorruption, that and his oratory. But that explains nothing. No, it explains nothing, said the girl. It is just personality, went on Oliver. At least that's the label to use. But that, too, is only a label. Yes, just a label. But it is that. They all felt it in Paul's house and in the streets afterwards. Did you not feel it? Feel it? cried the man, with shining eyes. Why, I would die for him! They went back to the house presently, and it was not till they reached the door that either said a word about the dead old woman who lay upstairs. They are with her now, said Mabel softly. I will communicate with the people. He nodded gravely. It had better be this afternoon, he said. I have a spare hour at fourteen o'clock. Oh, by the way, Mabel, do you know who took the message to the priest? I think so. Yes, it was Phillips. I saw him last night. He will not come here again. Did he confess it? He did. He was most offensive. But Oliver's face softened again as he nodded to his wife at the foot of the stairs, and turned to go up once more to his mother's room. End of Book Two, Chapter One, Part Four Book Two, Chapter Two, Part One of Lord of the World This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson. 
Book Two, Chapter Two, Part One. It seemed to Percy Franklin as he drew near Rome, sliding five hundred feet high through the summer dawn, that he was approaching the very gates of heaven, or, still better, he was as a child coming home. For what he had left behind him ten hours before in London was not a bad specimen, he thought, of the superior mansions of hell. It was a world whence God seemed to have withdrawn himself, leaving it indeed in a state of profound complacency, a state without hope or faith, but a condition in which, although life continued, there was absent the one essential to well-being. It was not that there was not expectation, for London was on tiptoe with excitement. There were rumors of all kinds. Felsenburg was coming back. He was back. He had never gone. He was to be president of the council, prime minister, tribune, with full capacities of democratic government and personal sacrosanctity, even king, if not emperor of the West. The entire constitution was to be remodeled. There was to be a complete rearrangement of the pieces. Crime was to be abolished by the mysterious power that had killed war. There was to be free food. The secret of life was discovered. There was to be no more death. So the rumors ran. Yet that was lacking to the priest's mind, which made life worth living. In Paris, while the volor waited at the great station at Montmartre, once known as the Church of the Sacred Heart, he had heard the roaring of the mob in love with life at last, and seen the banners go past. As it rose again over the suburbs, he had seen the long lines of trains streaming in, visible as bright serpents in the brilliant glory of the electric globes, bringing the country folk up to the Council of the Nation, which the legislators, mad with drama, had summoned to decide the great question. At Lyon it had been the same. The night was as clear as the day, and as full of sound. Mid-France was arriving to register its votes. He had fallen asleep as the cold air of the Alps began to envelop the car, and had caught but glimpses of the solemn moonlit peaks below him, the black profundities of the gulfs, the silver glint of the shield-like lakes, and the soft glow of Interlaken and the towns in the Rhone Valley. Once he had been moved in spite of himself, as one of the huge German volors had passed in the night, a blaze of ghostly lights and gilding, resembling a huge moth with antennae of electric light, and the two ships had saluted one another through half a league of silent air, with a pathetic cry as of two strange nightbirds who have no leisure to pause. Milan and Turin had been quiet, for Italy was organized on other principles than France, and Florence was not yet half awake. And now the Campania was slipping past like a grey-green rug, wrinkled and tumbled, five hundred feet beneath, and Rome was all but in sight. The indicator above his seat moved its finger from one hundred to ninety miles. He shook off the doze at last, and drew out his office book. But as he pronounced the words his attention was elsewhere, and when prime was said he closed the book once more, propped himself more comfortably, drawing the furs round him, and stretching his feet on the empty seat opposite. He was alone in his compartment. The three men who had come in at Paris had descended at Turin. He had been remarkably relieved when the message had come three days before from the Cardinal Protector, bidding him make arrangements for a long absence from England, and as soon as that was done, to come to Rome. He understood that the ecclesiastical authorities were really disturbed at last. He reviewed the last day or two, considering the report he would have to present. Since his last letter, three days before, seven notable apostasies had taken place in Westminster Diocese alone, two priests and five important laymen. There was talk of revolt on all sides. He had seen a threatening document, called a petition, demanding the right to dispense with all ecclesiastical vestments, signed by one hundred and twenty priests from England and Wales. The petitioners pointed out that persecution was coming swiftly at the hands of the mob, that the government was not sincere in the promises of protection. They hinted that religious loyalty was already strained to breaking point even in the case of the most faithful, and that with all but those it had already broken. And as to his comments, Percy was clear. He would tell the authorities, as he had already told them fifty times, that it was not persecution that mattered. It was this new outburst of enthusiasm for humanity, an enthusiasm which had waxed a hundredfold more hot since the coming of Felsenberg and the publication of the Eastern News, which was melting the hearts of all but the very few. Man had suddenly fallen in love with man. The conventional were rubbing their eyes and wondering why they had ever believed 
or even dreamed that there was a god to love, asking one another what was the secret of the spell that had held them so long. Christianity and theism were passing together from the world's mind as a morning mist passes when the sun comes up. His recommendations? Yes, he had those clear, and ran them over in his mind with a sense of despair. For himself, he scarcely knew if he believed what he professed. His emotions seemed to have been finally extinguished in the vision of the white car and the silence of the crowd that evening three weeks before. It had been so horribly real and positive. The delicate aspirations and hopes of the soul appeared so shadowy when compared with that burning, heart-shaking passion of the people. He had never seen anything like it. No congregation under the spell of the most kindling preacher alive had ever responded with one-tenth of the fervor with which that irreligious crowd, standing in the cold dawn of the London streets, had greeted the coming of their savior. And as for the man himself, Percy could not analyze what it was that possessed him as he had stared, muttering the name of Jesus, on that quiet figure in black with features and hair so like his own. He only knew that a hand had gripped his heart, a hand warm, not cold and had quenched, it seemed, all sense of religious conviction. It had only been with an effort that sickened him to remember, that he had refrained from that interior act of capitulation that is so familiar to all who have cultivated an inner life and understand what failure means. There had been one citadel that had not flung wide its gates. All else had yielded. His emotions had been stormed, his intellect silenced, his memory of grace obscured. A spiritual nausea had sickened his soul, yet the secret fortress of the will had, in an agony, held fast the doors and refused to cry out and call Felsenberg king. Ah, how he had prayed during those three weeks! It appeared to him that he had done little else. There had been no peace. Lances of doubt thrust again and again through door and window. Masses of argument had crashed from above. He had been on the alert day and night, repelling this blindly and denying that, endeavoring to keep his foothold on the slippery plane of the supernatural, sending up cry after cry to the Lord who hid himself. He had slept with his crucifix in his hand. He had awakened himself by kissing it. While he wrote, talked, ate, walked, and sat in cars, the inner life had been busy making frantic, speechless acts of faith in a religion which his intellect denied and from which his emotions shrank. There had been moments of ecstasy, now in a crowded street, when he recognized that God was all, that the Creator was the key to the creature's life, that a humble act of adoration was transcendently greater than the most noble natural act, that the supernatural was the origin and end of existence, there had come to him such moments in the night, in the silence of the cathedral, when the lamp flickered and a soundless air had breathed from the iron door of the tabernacle. Then again passion ebbed, and left him stranded on misery, but set with the determination which might equally be that of pride or faith, that no power in earth or hell should hinder him from professing Christianity even if he could not realize it. It was Christianity alone that made life tolerable. Percy drew a long, vibrating breath and changed his position. For far away his unseeing eyes had descried a dome, like a blue bubble set on a carpet of green, and his brain had interrupted itself to tell him that this was Rome. He got up presently, passed out of his compartment, and moved forward up the central gangway, seeing, as he went, through the glass doors to right and left, his fellow passengers, some still asleep, some staring out at the view, some reading. He put his eye to the glass square in the door, and for a minute or two watched, fascinated, the steady figure of the steerer at his post. There he stood motionless, his hands on the steel circle that directed the vast wings, his eyes on the wind gauge that revealed to him as on the face of a clock both the force and the direction of the high gusts. Now and again his hands moved slightly, and the huge fans responded, now lifting, now lowering. Beneath him and in front, fixed on a circular table, were the glass domes of various indicators. Percy did not know the meaning of half. One seemed a kind of barometer, intended, he guessed, to declare the height at which they were traveling. Another a compass. And beyond, through the curved windows lay the enormous sky. Well, it was all very wonderful, thought the priest, and it was with the force of which all this was but one symptom that the supernatural had to compete. He sighed, turned, and went back to his compartment. It was an astonishing vision that began presently to open before him, scarcely beautiful except for its strangeness, and as unreal as a raised map. Far to his right, as he could see through the glass doors, 
lay the grey line of the sea against the luminous sky, rising and falling ever so slightly as the car, apparently motionless, tilted imperceptibly against the western breeze. The only other movement was the faint pulsation of the huge throbbing screw in the rear. To the left stretched the limitless country, flitting beneath in glimpses seen between the motionless wings, with here and there the streak of a village, flattened out of recognition, or the flash of water, and bounded far away by the low masses of the Umbrian hills, while in front, seen and gone again as the car veered, lay the confused line of Rome and the huge new suburbs, all crowned by the great dome growing every instant. Around, above, and beneath, his eyes were conscious of wide air spaces, overhead deepening into lapis lazuli, down to horizons of pale turquoise. The only sound, of which he had long ceased to be directly conscious, was that of the steady rush of air, less shrill now as the speed began to drop down, down, to forty miles an hour. There was a clang of a bell, and immediately he was aware of a sense of faint sickness as the car dropped in a glorious swoop, and he staggered a little as he grasped his rugs together. When he looked again the motion seemed to have ceased. He could see towers ahead, a line of house roofs, and beneath he caught a glimpse of a road and more roofs with patches of green between. A bell clanged again, and a long sweet cry followed. On all sides he could hear the movement of feet. A guard in uniform passed swiftly along the glazed corridor. Again came the faint nausea. And as he looked up once more from his luggage, for an instant he saw the dome, grey now and lined, almost on a level with his own eyes, huge against the vivid sky. The world span round for a moment. He shut his eyes, and when he looked again, walls seemed to heave up past him and stop, swaying. There was the last bell, a faint vibration as the car grounded in the steel-netted dock. A line of faces rocked and grew still outside the windows, and Percy passed out towards the doors, carrying his bags. End of Book Two, Chapter Two, Part One Book Two, Chapter Two, Part Two of Lord of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson. Book Two, Chapter Two, Part Two. He still felt a sense of insecure motion as he sat alone over coffee an hour later in one of the remote rooms of the Vatican, but there was a sense of exhilaration as well, as his tired brain realized where he was. It had been strange to drive over the rattling stones in the weedy little cab, such as he remembered ten years ago when he had left Rome newly ordained. While the world had moved on, Rome had stood still. She had other affairs to think of than physical improvements now that the spiritual weight of the earth rested entirely upon her shoulders. All had seemed unchanged, or rather, it had reverted to the condition of nearly one hundred and fifty years ago. Histories related how the improvements of the Italian government had gradually dropped out of use as soon as the city, eighty years before, had been given her independence. The trains ceased to run, volors were not allowed to enter the walls, the new buildings, permitted to remain, had been converted to ecclesiastical use. The Quirinal became the offices of the Red Pope, the embassies huge seminaries. Even the Vatican itself, with the exception of the upper floor, had become the abode of the sacred college, who surrounded the supreme pontiff as stars their sun. It was an extraordinary city, said antiquarians, the one living example of the old days. Here were to be seen the ancient inconveniences, the insanitary horrors, the incarnation of a world given over to dreaming. The old church pomp was back, too. The cardinals drove again in gilt coaches. The pope rode on his white mule. The blessed sacrament went through the ill-smelling streets with the sound of bells and the light of lanterns. A brilliant description of it had interested the civilized world immensely for about forty-eight hours. The appalling retrogression was still used occasionally as the text for violent denunciations by the poorly educated. The well-educated had ceased to do anything but take for granted that superstition and progress were irreconcilable enemies. Yet Percy, even in the glimpses he had had in the streets, as he drove from the Volar station outside the People's Gate, of the old peasant dresses, the blue and red-fringed wine-carts, the cabbage-strewn gutters, the wet clothes flapping on strings, the mules and horses, strange though these were, he had found them a refreshment. 
it had seemed to remind him that man was human and not divine as the rest of the world proclaimed human and therefore careless and individualistic human and therefore occupied with interests other than those of speed cleanliness and precision the room in which he sat now by the window with shading blinds for the sun was already hot seemed to revert back even further than to a century and a half the old damask and gilding that he had expected was gone and its absence gave the impression of great severity there was a wide deal table running the length of the room with upright wooden armchairs set against it the floor was red tiled with strips of matting for the feet the white distempered walls had only a couple of old pictures hung upon them and a large crucifix flanked by candles stood on a little altar by the further door there was no more furniture than that with the exception of a writing desk between the windows on which stood a typewriter that jarred somehow on his sense of fitness and he wondered at it he finished the last drop of coffee in the thick-rimmed white cup and sat back in his chair already the burden was lighter and he was astonished at the swiftness with which it had become so life looked simpler here the interior world was taken more for granted it was not even a matter of debate there it was imperious and objective and through it glimmered to the eyes of the soul the old figures that had become shrouded behind the rush of worldly circumstance the very shadow of god appeared to rest here it was no longer impossible to realize that the saints watched and interceded that mary sat on her throne that the white disc on the altar was jesus christ percy was not yet at peace after all he had been but an hour in rome and air charged with never so much grace could scarcely do more than it had done but he felt more at ease less desperately anxious more childlike more content to rest on the authority that claimed without explanation and asserted that the world as a matter of fact proved by evidences without and within was made this way and not that for this purpose and not the other yet he had used the conveniences which he hated he had left london a bare twelve hours before and now here he sat in a place which is either a stagnant backwater of life or else the very mid-current of it he was not yet sure which there was a step outside a handle was turned and the cardinal protector came through percy had not seen him for four years and for a moment scarcely recognized him it was a very old man that he saw now bent and feeble his face covered with wrinkles crowned by very thin white hair and a little scarlet cap on top he was in his black benedictine habit with a plain abbatial cross on his breast and walked hesitatingly with a black stick the only sign of vigor was in the narrow bright slit of his eyes showing beneath drooping lids he held out his hand smiling and percy remembering in time that he was in the vatican bowed low only as he kissed the amethyst welcome to rome father said the old man speaking with an unexpected briskness they told me you were here half an hour ago i thought i would leave you to wash and have your coffee percy murmured something yes you are tired no doubt said the cardinal pulling out a chair indeed not your eminence i slept excellently the cardinal made a little gesture to a chair but i must have a word with you the holy father wishes to see you at eleven o'clock percy started a little we move quickly in these days father there is no time to dawdle you understand that you are to remain in rome for the present i have made all arrangements for that your eminence that is very well we are pleased with you here father franklin the holy father has been greatly impressed by your comments you have foreseen things in a very remarkable manner percy flushed with pleasure it was almost the first hint of encouragement he had had cardinal martin went on i may say that you are considered our most valuable correspondent certainly in england that is why you are summoned you are to help us here in future a kind of consulter anyone can relate facts not everyone can understand them you look very young father how old are you i am thirty-three your eminence ah your white hair helps you now father will you come with me into my room it is now eight o'clock i will keep you till nine no longer then you shall have some rest and at eleven i shall take you up to his holiness percy rose with a strange sense of elation and ran to open the door for the cardinal to go through end of book two chapter two part two Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson Book Two 
Chapter Two, Part Three. Recording by Jesse Coy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. At a few minutes before eleven, Percy came out of his little whitewashed room in his new fair Ayuola, soutane and buckle shoes, and tapped at the door of the cardinal's room. He felt a great deal more self-possessed now. He had talked to the cardinal freely and strongly, had described the effect that Falsenberg had had upon London, and even the paralysis that had seized upon him. He had stated his belief that they were on the edge of a movement unparalleled in history. He related little scenes that he had witnessed, a group kneeling before a picture of Falsenberg, a dying man calling upon him by name, the aspect of the crowd that had waited in Westminster to hear the result of the offer made to the stranger. He showed him a half-dozen cuttings from newspapers, pointing out their hysterical enthusiasm. He even went so far as to venture upon prophecy, and to declare his belief that persecution was within reasonable distance. The world seems very oddly alive, he said. It is as if the whole thing was flushed and nervous. The cardinal nodded. We, too, he said, even we feel it. For the rest, the cardinal had sat watching him out of his narrow eyes, nodding from time to time, putting an occasional question, but listening throughout with great attention. And your recommendations, father, he had said, and then interrupted himself. No, that is too much to ask. The Holy Father will speak of that. He had congratulated him upon his Latin then for they had spoken in that language throughout this second interview, and Percy had explained how loyal Catholic England had been in obeying the order, given ten years before, that Latin should become to the church what Esperanto was becoming to the world. That is very well, said the old man. His holiness will be pleased at that. At his second tap, the door opened and the cardinal came out, taking him by the arm without a word, and together they turned to the lift entrance. Percy ventured to remark as they slid noiselessly up towards the papal apartment, I am surprised at the lift, your eminence, and the typewriter in the audience room. Why, father? Why, all the rest of Rome is back in the old days. The cardinal looked at him, puzzled. Is it? I suppose it is. I never thought of that. A Swiss guard flung back the door of the lift, saluted, and then went before them along the plain flagged passage to where his comrade stood. Then he saluted again and went back. A pontifical chamber lane, in all the somber glory of purple black and a Spanish ruff, peeped from the door and made haste to open it. It really seemed almost incredible that such things still existed. In a moment, your eminence, he said in Latin, will your eminence wait here? It was a little square room with half a dozen doors plainly contrived out of one of the huge old halls, for it was immensely high, and the tarnished gilt cornice vanished directly in two places into the white walls. The partitions too seemed thin, for as the two men sat down there was a murmur of voices faintly audible, the shuffling of footsteps, and the old eternal click of the typewriter from which Percy hoped he had escaped. They were alone in the room, which was furnished with the same simplicity of the cardinals, giving the impression of a curious mingling of aesthetic poverty and dignity by its red-tiled floor, its white walls, its altars, and two vast bronze candlesticks of incalculable value that stood on the diocese. The shutters here, too, were drawn, and there was nothing to distract Percy from the excitement that surged up now tenfold in heart and brain. It was Papa Angelicus whom he was about to see, that amazing old man who had been appointed Secretary of State just fifty years ago at the age of thirty, and Pope nine years previously. It was he who had carried out the extraordinary policy of yielding the churches throughout the whole of Italy to the government in exchange for the temporal lordship of Rome, and who had since set himself to make it a city of saints. He had cared, it appeared, nothing whatever for the world's opinion. His policy, so far as it could be called one, consisted in a very simple thing, 
he had declared in epistle after epistle that the object of the church was to do glory to god by producing supernatural virtues in man and that nothing at all was of any significance or importance except so far as it affected this object he had further maintained that since peter was the rock the city of peter was the capital of the world and should set an example to its dependency this could not be done unless peter ruled his city and therefore he had sacrificed every church and ecclesiastical building in the country for that one end then he had set about ruling his city he had said that on the whole the latter-day discoveries of man tended to distract immortal souls from a contemplation of eternal verities not that these discoveries could be anything but good in themselves since after all they gave insight into the wonderful laws of god but that at present they were too exciting to the imagination so he had removed the trams the volors the laboratories the manufactories saying that there was plenty of room for them outside rome and had allowed them to be planted in the suburbs in their place he had raised shrines religious houses and calvaries then he had attended further to the souls of his subjects since rome was of limited area and still more because the world corrupted without its proper salt he allowed no man under the age of fifty to live within its walls for more than one month in each year except those who received his permit they might live of course immediately outside the city and they did by tens of thousands but they were to understand that by doing so they sinned against the spirit though not the letter of their father's wishes then he had divided the city into national quarters saying that as each nation had its peculiar virtues each was to let its light shine steadily in its proper place rents had instantly begun to rise so he had legislated against that by reserving in each quarter a number of streets at fixed prices and had issued an ipso facto excommunication against all who erred in this respect the rest were abandoned to the millionaires he had retained the leonine city entirely at his own disposal then he had restored capital punishment with as much serene gravity as that with which he had made himself the derision of the civilized world in other matters saying that though human life was holy human virtue was more holy still and he had added to the crime of murder the crimes of adultery idolatry and apostasy for which this punishment was theoretically sanctioned there had not been however more than two such executions in the eight years of his reign since criminals of course with the exception of devoted believers instantly made their way to the suburbs where they were no longer under his jurisdiction but he had not stayed here he had sent once more ambassadors to every country in the world informing the government of each of their arrival no attention was paid to this beyond that of laughter but he had continued undisturbed to claim his rights and meanwhile used his legates for the important work of disseminating his views epistles appeared from time to time in every town laying down the principles of the papal claims with as much tranquillity as if they were everywhere acknowledged freemasonry was steadily denounced as well as democratic ideas of every kind men were urged to remember their immortal souls and the majesty of god and to reflect upon the fact that in a few years all would be called to give their account to him who was creator and ruler of the world whose vicar was john the twenty fourth p p whose name and seal were appended that was a line of action that took the world completely by surprise people had expected hysteria argument and passionate exhortation, disguised emissaries plots and protests there were none of these it was as if progress had not yet begun and the volors were uninvented as if the entire universe had not come to disbelieve in god and to discover that itself was god here was this silly old man talking in his sleep babbling of the cross and the inner life and the forgiveness of sins exactly as his predecessors had talked two thousand years ago before well it was only one sign more that rome had lost not only its power but its common sense as well it was really time that something should be done and this was the man thought percy papa angelicus whom he was to see in a minute or two the cardinal put his hand on the priest's knee as the door opened and a purple prelate appeared bowing 
Only this, he said, be absolutely frank. Percy stood up trembling. Then he followed his patron towards the inner door. End of Book Two, Chapter Two, Part Three. Recording by Jesse Coy. Chungwon, South Korea. www.audiotavern.com. Book Two, Chapter Two, Part Four. Lord of, Lord of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jesse Coy, Lord of the World, by Robert Hugh Benson. Book Two, Chapter Two, Part Four. A white figure sat in the green gloom beside a great writing table, three or four yards away, but with the chair wheeled round to face the door by which the two entered. So much Percy saw as he performed the first genuflection. Then he dropped his eyes, advanced, genuflected again with the other, advanced once more, and for the third time genuflected, lifting the thin white hand stretched out to his lips. He heard the door close as he stood up. "'Father Franklin, Holiness,' said the cardinal's voice at his ear. A white-sleeved arm waved to a couple of chairs set a yard away, and the two sat down. While the cardinal, talking in slow Latin, said a few sentences, explaining that this was the English priest whose correspondence had been found so useful, Percy began to look with all his eyes. He knew the Pope's face well from a hundred photographs and moving pictures. Even his gestures were familiar to him, the slight bowing of the head in assent, the tiny eloquent movement of the hands, but Percy, with a sense of being platitudinal, told himself that the living presence was very different. It was a very upright old man that he saw in the chair before him, of medium height and girth, with hands clasping the bosses of his chair arms and an appearance of great and deliberate dignity. But it was at the face chiefly that he looked dropping his gaze three or four times as the Pope's blue eyes turned on him. They were extraordinary eyes, reminding him of what historians said of Pius X. The lids drew straight lines across them, giving him the look of a hawk, but the rest of the face contradicted them. There was no sharpness in that. It was neither thin nor fat, but beautifully modeled in an oval outline. The lips were clean-cut, with a look of passion in their curves. The nose came down in an aquiline sweep, ending in chiseled nostrils. The chin was firm and cloven, and the poise of the whole head was strangely youthful. It was a face of great generosity and sweetness, set at an angle between defiance and humility, but ecclesiastical from ear to ear and brow to chin. The forward was slightly compressed of the temples, and beneath the white cap lay white hair. It had been the subject of laughter at the music halls nine years before, when the composite face of well-known priests had been thrown on a screen side by side with the new popes, for the two were almost indistinguishable. Percy found himself trying to sum it up, but nothing came to him except the word priest. It was that, and that was all. Eke Sedars Magnus, he was astonished at the look of youth, for the pope was eighty-eight this year. Yet this figure was as upright as that of a man of fifty, his shoulders unbowed, his head set on them like an athlete's, and his wrinkles scarcely perceptible in the half-light. Papa Angelicus, reflected Percy. The cardinal ceased his explanations and made a little gesture. Percy drew up all his faculties, tense and tight, to answer the questions that he knew were coming. I welcome you, my son, said a very soft, resonant voice. Percy bowed desperately from the waist. The Pope dropped his eyes again, lifted a paper weight with his left hand, and began to play with it gently as he talked. Now, my son, deliver a little discourse. I suggest to you three heads. What has happened, what is happening, what will happen, with a peroration as to what should happen. Percy drew a long breath, settled himself back, clasped the fingers of his left hand and the fingers of his right, fixed his eyes firmly upon the cross-embroidered red shoe opposite, and began. Had he not rehearsed this a hundred times? 
he first stated his theme to the effect that all the forces of the civilized world were concentrating into two camps the world and god up to the present time the forces of the world had been incoherent and spasmodic breaking out in various ways revolutions and wars had been like the movements of a mob undisciplined unskilled and unrestrained to meet this the church too had acted through her catholicity dispersion rather than concentration frontiers had been opposed to frontiers but during the last hundred years there had been indications that the method of warfare was to change europe at any rate had grown weary of internal strife the unions first of labor then of capital then of labor and capital combined illustrated this in the economic sphere the peaceful partition of africa in the political sphere the spread of humanitarian religion in the spiritual sphere over against this must be placed the increased centralization of the church by the wisdom of her pontiffs overruled by god almighty the lines had been drawing tighter every year he instanced the abolition of all local usages including those so long cherished by the east the establishment of the cardinal protectorates in rome the enforced merging of all friars into one order though retaining their familiar names under the authority of the supreme general all the monks with the exception of the carthusians the carmelites and the trappists into another of the three accepted into a third and the classification of nuns after the same plan further he remarked on the more recent decrees establishing the sense of the vatican decision on infallibility the new version of canon law the immense simplification that had taken place in ecclesiastical government the hierarchy rubrics and the affairs of missionary countries with the new and extraordinary privileges granted to mission priests at this point he became aware that his self-consciousness had left him and he began even with little gestures and a slightly raised voice to enlarge on the significance of the last month's events all that had gone before he said pointed to what had now actually taken place namely the reconciliation of the world on a basis other than that of divine truth it was the intention of god and his vicars to reconcile all men in christ jesus but the cornerstone had once more been rejected and instead of the chaos that the pious had prophesied, there was coming into existence a unity unlike anything known in history. This was the more deadly from the fact that it contained so many elements of indubitable good. War, apparently, was now extinct, and it was not Christianity that had done it. Union was now seen to be better than disunion, and the lesson had been learned apart from the church. In fact, natural virtues had suddenly waxed luxuriant, and supernatural virtues were despised friendliness took the place of charity contentment the place of hope and knowledge the place of faith percy stopped he had become conscious that he was preaching kind of sermon yes my son said the kind voice what else what else very well continued percy movements such as these brought forth men and the man of this movement was julian falsenberg he had accomplished a work that apart from god seemed miraculous he had broken down the eternal division between east and west coming himself from the continent that alone could produce such powers he had prevailed by sheer force of personality over the two supreme tyrants of life religious fanaticism and party government his influence over the impassive english was another miracle yet he had also set on fire france germany and spain Percy here described one or two of his little scenes, saying that it was like the vision of a god, and he quoted freely some of the titles given to the man by sober, unhysterical newspapers. Falsenberg was called the Son of Man because he was so purebred a cosmopolitan, the Savior of the world because he had slain war and himself survived, even, even, here Percy's voice faltered, even incarnate God, because he was the perfect representative of divine man. The quiet priestly face watching opposite never winced or moved, and he went on. Persecution, he said, was coming. There had been a riot or two already, but persecution was not to be feared. It would no doubt cause apostasies, as it had always done, but these were deplorable only on account of the individual apostates. On the other hand, it would reassure the faithful and purge out the half-hearted. 
Once, in the early ages, Satan's attack had been made on the bodily side, with whips and fire and beasts. In the 16th century, it had been on the intellectual side. In the 20th century, on the springs of moral and spiritual life. Now it seemed as if the assault was on all three planes at once. But what was chiefly to be feared was the positive influence of humanitarianism. It was coming like the kingdom of God with power. It was crushing the imaginative and the romantic. It was assuming rather than asserting its own truth. It was smothering with bolsters instead of wounding and stimulating with steel and controversy. It seemed to be forcing its way almost objectively into the inner world. Persons who had scarcely heard its name were professing its tenets. Priests absorbed it as they absorbed God in communion. He mentioned the names of the recent apostates. Children drank it in like Christianity itself. The soul, naturally Christian, seemed to be becoming the soul, naturally infidel. Persecution, cried the priest, was to be welcomed like salvation, prayed for and grasped. But he feared that the authorities were too shrewd, and he knew the antidote and the poison apart. There might be individual martyrdoms, in fact there would be, and very many. But they would be in spite of secular government, not because of it. Finally, he expected, humanitarianism would presently put on the dress of liturgy and sacrifice, and when that was done, the church's cause, unless God intervened, would be over. Percy sat back, trembling. Yes, my son, and what do you think should be done? Percy flung his hands out. Holy Father, the Mass, prayer, the Rosary, these first and last, the world denies their power. It is on their power that Christians must throw all their weight, all things in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ first and last. Nothing else can avail. He must do all, for we can do nothing. The white head bowed, then it rose erect. Yes, my son, but so long as Jesus Christ deigns to use us, we must be used. He is prophet and king as well as priest. We then too must be prophet and king as well as priest. What of prophecy and royalty? The voice thrilled Percy like a trumpet. Yes, holiness, for prophecy, then, let us preach charity. For royalty, let us reign on crosses. We must love and suffer. He drew one sobbing breath. Your holiness has preached charity always. Let charity, then, issue in good deeds. Let us be foremost in them. Let us engage in trade honestly, in family life chastely, in government uprightly. And as for suffering, ah, holiness, his old scheme leaped back to his mind and stood poised there, convincing and imperious. Yes, my son, speak plainly. Your holiness, it is old, old as Rome. Every fool has desired a new order. Holiness, a new order, he stammered. The white hand dropped the paperweight. The pope leaned forward, looking intently at the priest. Yes, my son. Percy threw himself on his knees. A new order, holiness, no habit or badge, subject to your holiness only, freer than Jesuits, poorer than Francescans, more mortified than Carthusians, men and women alike, the three vows with the intention of martyrdom, the Pantheon for the church, each bishop responsible for their sustenance, a lieutenant in each country, holiness, it is the thought of a fool, and Christ crucified for their patron. The Pope stood up abruptly, so abruptly that Cardinal Martin sprang up too, apprehensive and terrified. It seemed that this young man had gone too far. Then the Pope sat down again, extending his hand. God bless you, my son. You have leave to go. Will your eminence stay for a few minutes? End of Book Two, Chapter Two, Part Four. Recording by Jesse Coy, Chungwon, South Korea www.audiotavern.com Book 2, Chapter 3, Part 1 of Lord of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nikhail. Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson. Book 2, Chapter 3, Part 1. The Cardinal said very little to Percy when they met again that evening. Beyond congratulating him on the way he had borne himself with the Pope, it seemed that the priest had done right by his extreme frankness. Then he told him of his duties. Percy was to retain the couple of rooms that had been put at his disposal. He was to say Mass, 
as a rule, in the Cardinal's oratory, and after that, at nine, he was to present himself for instructions. He was to dine at noon with the Cardinal, after which he was to consider himself at liberty till Ave Maria. Then, once more, he was to be at his master's disposal until supper. The work he would principally have to do would be the reading of all English correspondence, and the drawing up of a report upon it. Percy found it a very pleasant and serene life, and the sense of home deepened every day. He had an abundance of time to himself, which he occupied resolutely in relaxation. From eight to nine, he usually walked abroad, going sedately through the streets with his senses passive, looking into churches, watching the people, and gradually absorbing the strange naturalness of life under ancient conditions. At times it appeared to him like an historical dream. At times it seemed that there was no other reality, that the silent, tense world of modern civilization was itself a phantom, and that here was the simple naturalness of the soul's childhood back again. Even the reading of the English correspondence did not greatly affect him, for the stream of his mind was beginning to run clear again in this sweet old channel, and he read, dissected, analysed, and diagnosed with a deepening tranquillity. There was not, after all, a great deal of news. It was a kind of lull after storm. Felsenberg was still in retirement. He had refused the offers made to him by France and Italy, as that of England, and although nothing definite was announced, it seemed that he was confining himself at present to an unofficial attitude. Meanwhile, the parliaments of Europe were busy in the preliminary stages of code revision. Nothing would be done, it was understood, until the autumn sessions. Life in Rome was very strange. The city had now become not only the centre of faith, but in a sense a microcosm of it. It was divided into four huge quarters, Anglo-Saxon, Latin, Teutonic, and Eastern, besides Trastevere, which was occupied almost entirely by papal offices, seminaries, and schools. Anglo-Saxondom occupied the southwestern quarter, now entirely covered with houses, including the Aventine, the Cilian, and Testacasio. The Latins inhabited Old Rome, between the course and the river. The Teutons, the northeastern quarter, bounded on the south by St. Lawrence's Street, and the Easterns the remaining quarter, of which the centre was the Lateran. In this manner, the true Romans were scarcely conscious of intrusion. They possessed a multitude of their own churches. They were allowed to revel in narrow, dark streets and hold their markets, and it was here that Percy usually walked, in a passion of historical retrospect. But the other quarters were strange enough, too, it was curious to see how a progeny of Gothic churches served by northern priests had grown up naturally in the Anglo-Saxon and Teutonic districts, and how the wide, grey streets, the neat pavements, the severe houses, showed how the northerns had not yet realised the requirements of southern life. The easterns, on the other hand, resembled the Latins. Their streets were as narrow and dark, their smells as overwhelming, their churches as dirty and as homely, and their colours even more brilliant. Outside the walls, the confusion was indescribable. If the city represented a carved miniature of the world, the suburbs represented the same model broken into a thousand pieces, tumbled in a bag, and shot out at random. So far as the eye could see, on all sides of the roof of the Vatican, there stretched an endless plain of house roofs, broken by spires, towers, domes, and chimneys, under which lived human beings of every race beneath the sun. Here were the great manufactories, the monster buildings of the new world, the stations, the schools, the offices, all under secular dominion, yet surrounded by six millions of souls who lived here for love of religion. It was these who had despaired of modern life, tried out with charge and effort, who had fled from the new system for refuge to the church, but who could not obtain leave to live in the city itself. New houses were continually springing up in all directions. A gigantic compass, filled by one leg in Rome, and with a span of five miles, would, if twirled, revolve through packed streets through its entire circle. Beyond that, too, houses stretched into the infinite distance. But Percy did not realise the significance of all that he saw, until the occasion of the Pope's name day towards the end of August. It was yet cool and early when he followed his patron, 
whom he was to serve as chaplain along the broad passages of the Vatican towards the room where the Pope and Cardinals were to assemble. Through a window, as he looked out into the piazza, the crowd was yet more dense, if that were possible, than it had been for an hour before. The huge oval square was cobbled with heads, through which ran a broad road, kept by papal troops for the passage of the carriages, and up the broad ribbon, white in the eastern light, came monstrous vehicles, a blaze of gilding and colour and cream tint. Slow cheers swelled up and died, and through all came the rush and patter of wheels over the stones, like the sound of a tide-swept pebbly beach. As they waited in an antechamber, halted by the pressure in front and behind, a pack of scarlet and white and purple, he looked out again and realised what he had known only intellectually before, that here before his eyes was the royalty of the old world assembled, and he began to perceive its significance. Round the steps of the basilica spread a great fan of coaches, each yoked to eight horses, the white of France and Spain, black of Germany, Italy and Russia, and the cream-coloured of England. Those stood out in the near half-circle, and beyond was the sweep of the lesser powers, Greece, Norway, Sweden, Romania, and the Balkan states. One, the Turk, was alone, wanting. He reminded himself. The emblems of some were visible, eagles, lions, leopards, guarding the royal crown over the roof of each. From the foot of the steps to the head ran a broad scarlet carpet, lined with soldiers. Percy leaned against the shutter and began to meditate. Here was all that was left of royalty. He had seen their palaces before, here and there in various quarters, with standards flying, and scarlet livid men lounging on the steps. He had raised his hat a dozen times, as a landau thundered past him up the course. He had even seen the lilies of France and the leopards of England pass together in the solemn parade of the Princian Hill. He had read in the papers every now and again during the last five years that family after family had made its way to Rome. After papal recognition had been granted, he had been told by the cardinal on the previous evening that William of England, with his consort, had landed at Ostia in the morning, and that the tale of the powers was complete. But he had never before realised the stupendous, overwhelming fact of the assembly of the world's royalty under the shadow of Peter's throne nor the appalling danger that its presence constituted in the midst of a democratic world. That world, he knew, affected to laugh at the folly and the childishness of it all, at the desperate play-acting of divine right on the part of fallen and despised families. But the same world, he knew very well, had not yet lost quite all its sentiment, and if that sentiment should happen to become resentful, the pressure relaxed. Percy slipped out of the recess and followed in the slow-moving stream. Half an hour later, he was in his place among the ecclesiastics, as the papal procession came out through the glimmering dusk of the chapel of the Blessed Sacrament into the nave of the enormous church. But even before he had entered the chapel, he heard the quiet roar of recognition and the cry of the trumpets that greeted the Supreme Pontiff. As he came out a hundred yards ahead, Born on the Sedilla Gestatorial, with the fans going behind him, when Percy himself came out five minutes later, walking in his Cordonillon, and saw the sight that was waiting. He remembered with a sudden throb at his heart that other sight he had seen in London in a summer dawn three months before. Far ahead, seeming to cleave its way through the surging heads, like the poop of an ancient ship, moved the canopy beneath which sat the lord of the world, and beneath him and the priest, as if it were the wake of that same ship, swayed the gorgeous procession, protonotaries, apostolate, generals of religious orders, and the rest, making its way along with white, gold, scarlet, and silver foam between the living banks on either side. Overhead hung the splendid barrel of the roof, and far in front the haven of God's altar, reared its monstrous pillars, beneath which burned the seven yellow stars that were the harbour lights of sanctity. It was an astonishing sight, but too vast and bewildered to do anything but oppress the observers with the consciousness of their own futility. The enormous enclosed air, the giant statues, the dim and distant roofs, 
the indescribable concert of sound of the movement of feet the murmur of ten thousand voices the pearl of organs like the crying of gnats the thin celestial music the faint suggestive smell of incense and men and bruised bay and myrtle and supreme above all the vibrant atmosphere of human emotion shot with supernatural aspiration as the hope of the world the holder of divine viceroyalty passed on his way to stand between god and man this affected the priest as the action of a drug that once lulls and stimulates blinds while it gives new vision deafens while it opens stopped ears that exults while it plunges into new gulfs of consciousness here then was the other formulated answer to the problem of life two cities of augustine lay for him to choose the one that of a world self-originated self-organized and self-sufficient interpreted by such men as marx and herve socialists materialists and in the end hedonists summed up at last in felsenberg the other lay displayed in the sight he saw before him telling of a creator and of a creation of a divine purpose a redemption and a world transcendent and eternal from which all sprang and to which all moved one of the two john and julian was the vicar and the other the ape of god and percy's heart in one more spasm of conviction made its choice but the summit was not yet reached as percy came at last out from the nave beneath the dome on his way to the tribune before the papal throne he became aware of a new element a great space was cleared about the altar and confession extending as he could see at least on his side to the point that marked the entrance to the transepts at this point ran rails straight across from side to side continuing the lines of the nave beyond this red hung barriers lay gradual slope of faces white and motionless a glimmer of steel bounded it and above a third of the distance down the transept rose in solemn serried array a line of canopies these were of scarlet like cardinalitial baldacchini but upon the upright surface of each burned gigantic coats supported by beasts and topped by crowns under each was a figure of two no more in splendid isolation and through the interspaces between the thrones showed again a misty slope of faces his heart quickened as he saw it as he swept his eyes round and across to the right and saw as in a mirror the replica of the left in the right transept it was there then that they sat those lonely survivors of that strange company of persons who till half a century ago had reigned as god's temporal vicegerents with the consent of their subjects they were unrecognized now save by him from whom they drew their sovereignty pinnacles clustering and hanging from a dome from which the walls had been withdrawn these were men and women who had learned at last the power comes from above and their title to rule came not from their subjects but the supreme ruler of all shepherds without sheep captains without soldiers to command it was piteous horrible piteous yet inspiring the act of faith was so sublime and percy's heart quickened as he understood it these then men and women like himself were not ashamed to appeal from man to god to assume insignia which the world regarded as playthings but which to them were emblems of supernatural commission was there not mirrored here he asked himself some far-off shadow of one who rode on the colt of an ass amid the sneers of the great and the enthusiasm of children it was yet more kindling as the mass went on and he saw the male sovereigns come down to do their services at the altar and to go to and fro between it and the throne there they went bareheaded the stately silent figures the english king once again fide defensor bore the train in place of the old king of spain who with his austrian emperor alone of all european sovereigns preserved the unbroken continuity of faith the old man leaned over his fold stool mumbling and weeping even crying out now and again in love and devotion as like simeon he saw his salvation the austrian emperor twice administered the lavabo the german sovereign 
who had lost his throne and all but his life upon his conversation four years before. By a new privilege placed and withdrawn, the cushion, as his lord kneeled before the lord of them both. So movement by movement the gorgeous drama was enacted, the murmuring of the crowds died to a stillness that was but one wordless prayer, as the tiny white disc rose between their white hands, and the thin angelic music pealed in the dome. For here was the one hope of these thousands, as mighty and as little as once within the manger. There was none other that fought for them but only God. Surely then, if the blood of men and the tears of women could not avail to move the judge and observer of all from his silence, surely at least here the bloodless death of his only son, that once on cavalry had darkened heaven and rent the earth, pleaded now with such sorrowful splendour upon this island of faith amid a sea of laughter and hatred. This at least must avail. How could it not? Percy had just sat down, tired out with the long ceremonies, when the door opened abruptly, and the cardinal, still in his robes, came in swiftly, shutting the door behind him. Father Franklin, he said in a strange, breathless voice, there is the worst of news. Felsenberg is appointed President of Europe. End of Book 2, Chapter 3, Part 1 Recording by Nikhail Book Two, Chapter Three, Part Two of Lord of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Therese. Lord of the World by Robert U. Benson. Book Two, Chapter Three, Part Two. It was late that night before Percy returned, completely exhausted by his labors. For hour after hour he had sat with the cardinal, opening dispatches that poured into the electric receivers from all over Europe, and were brought in one by one into the quiet sitting-room. Three times in the afternoon the cardinal had been sent for, once by the Pope and twice to the coronal. There was no doubt at all that the news was true, and it seemed that Felsenberg must have waited deliberately for the offer. All others he had refused. There had been a convention of the powers each of whom had been anxious to secure him, and each of whom had severely failed. These private claims had been withdrawn, and any united message sent. The new proposal was to effect that Felsenberg should assume a position hitherto undreamed of in democracy, that he should receive a house of government in every capital of Europe, that his veto of any measure should be final for three years, that any measure he chose to introduce three times in three consecutive years should become law, that his title should be that of President of Europe. From his side practically nothing was asked, except that he should refuse any other official position offered him that did not receive the sanction of all the powers. And all this, Percy saw very well, involved the danger of an united Europe increased tenfold. It involved all the stupendous force of socialism directed by a brilliant individual. It was the combination of the strongest characteristics of the two methods of government, the offer had been accepted by Felsenberg after eight hours' silence. It was remarkable, too, to observe how the news had been accepted by the two other divisions of the world. The East was enthusiastic, America was divided. But in any case, America was powerless. The balance of the world was overwhelmingly against her. Percy threw himself, as he was, onto his bed, and lay there with drumming pulses, closed eyes, and a huge despair at his heart. The world indeed had risen like a giant over the horizons of Rome, and the holy city was no better now than a sandcastle before a tide. So much he grasped. As to how ruin would come, in what form and from what direction, he neither knew nor cared. Only he knew now that it would come. He had learned by now something of his own temperament, and he turned his eyes inwards to observe himself bitterly, as a doctor in mortal disease might, with a dreadful complacency, diagnose his own symptoms. It was even a relief to turn from the monstrous mechanism of the world to see in miniature one hopeless human heart. For his own religion he no longer feared. He knew, as absolutely as a man may know the color of his eyes, that it was secure again and beyond shaking. During those weeks in Rome, the cloudy deposit had run clear, and the channel was once more visible. Or, better still, that vast direction of dogma, ceremony, custom, and morals, in which he had been educated, and on which he had looked all his life, 
as a man may stare upon some great set-piece that bewilders him seeing now one spark of light flare and wane in the darkness had little by little kindled and revealed itself in one stupendous blaze of divine fire that explains itself huge principles once bewildering and even repellent were again luminously self-evident he saw for example that while humanity religion endeavoured to abolish suffering the divine religion embraced it so that the blind pangs even of beasts were within the father's will and scheme or that while from one angle one colour only of the web of life was visible material or intellectual or artistic from another the supernatural was as eminently obvious humanity religion could only be true if at least half of man's nature aspirations and sorrows were ignored christianity on the other hand at least included and accounted for these even if it did not explain them this and this and this all made the one and perfect whole there was the catholic faith more certain to him than the existence of himself it was true and alive he might be damned but god reigned he might go mad but jesus christ was incarnate deity proving himself so by death and resurrection and john his vicar these things were as the bones of the universe facts beyond doubting if they were not true nothing anywhere was anything but a dream difficulties why there were ten thousand he did not in the least understand why god had made the world as it was nor how hell could be the creation of love nor how bread was transubstantiated into the body of god but well these things were so he had travelled far he began to see from his old status of faith when he had believed that divine truth could be demonstrated on intellectual grounds he had learned now he knew not how that the supernatural cried to the supernatural the christ without to the christ within that pure human reason indeed could not contradict yet neither could it adequately prove the mysteries of faith except on premises visible only to him who received revelation as a fact that it is the moral state rather than the intellectual to which the spirit of god speaks with a greater certitude that which he had both learned and taught he now knew that faith having like man himself a body and a spirit an historical expression and an inner verity speaks now by one now by another this man believes because he sees accepts the incarnation or the church from its credentials that man perceiving that these things are spiritual facts yields himself wholly to the message and authority of her who alone professes them as well as to the manifestation of them upon the historical plane and in the darkness leans upon her arm or best of all because he has believed now he sees so he looked with a kind of interested indolence at other tracks of his nature first there was his intellect puzzled beyond description demanding why 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 was it allowed how was it conceivable that god did not intervene and that the father of men could permit his dear world to be so ranged against him what did he mean to do was this eternal silence never to be broken it was very well for those that had the faith but what of the countless millions who were settling down in contented blasphemy were these not too his children and the sheep of his pasture what was the catholic church made for if not to convert the world and why then had almighty god allowed it on the one side to dwindle to a handful and on the other the world to find its peace apart from him he considered his emotions but there was no comfort there no stimulus oh yes he could pray still by mere cold acts of the will and his theology told him that god accepted such he could say adveniat regnum tuum fiat voluntas tua five thousand times a day if god wanted that but there was no sting or touch no sense of vibration through the cords that his will threw up to the heavenly throne what in the world then did god want him to do was it just then to repeat formulas to lie still to open dispatches to listen to the telephone and to suffer and then the rest of the world the madness that had seized upon the nations the amazing stories that had poured in that day of the men in paris who raving like picantas had stripped themselves naked in the place to concord and stabbed themselves to the heart crying out to thunders of applause that life was too enthralling to be endured of the woman who sang herself mad last night in spain and fell laughing and foaming in the concert hall of seville of the crucifixion of the catholics that morning in the pyrenees and the apostasy of three bishops in germany and this and this 
and a thousand more horrors were permitted, and God made no sign and spoke no word. There was a tap, and Percy sprang up as the cardinal came in. He looked horribly worn, and his eyes had a kind of sunken brilliance that revealed fever. He made a little motion to Percy to sit down, and himself sat in the deep chair, trembling a little, and gathering his buckled feet beneath his red-buttoned cassock. "'You must forgive me, Father,' he said. "'I am anxious for the bishop's safety. He should be here by now.' This was the Bishop of Southwark, Percy remembered, who had left England early that morning. "'He is coming straight through, Your Eminence.' "'Yes, he should have been here by twenty-three. It is after midnight, is it not?' As he spoke, the bells chimed out the half-hour. It was nearly quiet now. All day the air had been full of sound. Mobs had paraded the suburbs. The gates of the city had been barred. Yet that was only an earnest of what was to be expected, when the world understood itself. The cardinal seemed to recover himself after a few minutes' silence. "'You look tired out, father,' he said kindly. Percy smiled. "'And your eminence?' he said. The old man smiled, too. "'Why, yes,' he said. "'I shall not last much longer, father, and then it will be you to suffer.' Percy sat up, suddenly sick at heart. "'Why, yes,' said the cardinal. "'The Holy Father has arranged it. You are to succeed me, you know. It need be no secret.' Percy drew a long, trembling breath. "'Eminence,' he began piteously. The other lifted a thin old hand. I understand all that, he said softly. You wish to die, is it not so? And be at peace. There are many who wish that, but we must suffer first. At pati et mori, Father Franklin, there must be no faltering. There was a long silence. The news was too stunning to convey anything to the priest but a sense of horrible shock. The thought had simply never entered his mind that he, a man under forty, should be considered eligible to succeed this wise, patient old prelate. As for the honor, Percy was past that now, even had he thought of it. There was but one view before him, of a long and intolerable journey, on a road that went uphill, to be traversed with a burden on his shoulders that he could not support. Yet he recognized its inevitability. The fact was announced to him as indisputable. It was to be. There was nothing to be said. But it was as if one more gulf had opened, and he stared into it with a dull, sick horror, incapable expression. The cardinal first broke the silence. "'Father Franklin,' he said, "'I have seen today a picture of Felsenberg. Do you know who I at first took it for?' Percy smiled listlessly. "'Yes, Father, I took it for you. Now, what do you make of that?' "'I don't understand, Eminence. Why?' He broke off, suddenly changing the subject. "'There was a murder in the city today,' he said. A Catholic stabbed the blasphemer. Percy glanced at him again. Oh, yes, he has not attempted to escape, went on the old man. He is in Gaul. And? He will be executed. The trial will begin tomorrow. It is sad enough. It is the first murder for eight months. The irony of the position was evident enough to Percy as he sat listening to the deepening silence outside in the starlit night. Here was this poor city pretending that nothing was the matter, quietly administering its derided justice, and there, outside, were the forces gathering that would put an end to all. His enthusiasm seemed dead. There was no thrill from the thought of the splendid disregard of material facts, of which this was one tiny instance, none of despairing courage or drunken recklessness. He felt like one who watches a fly washing his face on the cylinder of an engine, the huge steel slides along, bearing the tiny life towards enormous death. Another moment and it will be over, and yet the watcher cannot interfere. The supernatural thus lay, perfect and alive, but immeasurably tiny. The huge forces were in motion, the world was heaving up, and Percy could do nothing but stare and frown. Yet, as had been said, there was no shadow on his faith. The fly, he knew, was greater than the engine from the superiority of its order of life. If it were crushed, life would not be the final sufferer. So much he knew. But how it was so, he did not know. As the two sat there, again came a step and a tap, and a servant's face looked in. His lordship is come, eminence, he said. The cardinal rose painfully, supporting himself at the table. Then he paused, seeming to remember something, and fumbled in his pocket. See that, father, he said, and pushed a small silver disc toward the priest. 
No, when I am gone. Percy closed the door and came back, taking up the little round object. It was a coin fresh from the mint. On one side was the familiar wreath with the word five pence in the midst, with its Esperanto equivalent beneath, and on the other the profile of a man with an inscription. Percy turned it to read. Julian Felsenberg, La Presidente de Europa. End of Book 2, Chapter 3, Part 2《Book Two, Chapter Three, Part Three of Lord of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson. Book Two, Chapter Three, Part Three. It was at ten o'clock on the following morning that the cardinals were summoned to the Pope's presence to hear the allocution. Percy, from his seat among the consulters, watched them come in, men of every nation and temperament and age, the Italians altogether gesticulating and flashing teeth, the Anglo-Saxons steady-faced and serious, an old French cardinal leaning on his stick, walking with the English Benedictine. It was one of the great plain stately rooms of which the Vatican now chiefly consisted, seated lengthwise like a chapel. At the lower end, traversed by the gangway, were the seats of the consulters. At the upper end, the dais with the papal throne. Three or four benches with desks before them, standing out beyond the consulters' seats, were reserved for the arrivals of the day before, prelates and priests who had poured into Rome from every European country on the announcement of the amazing news. Percy had not an idea as to what would be said. It was scarcely possible that nothing but platitudes would be uttered, Yet what else could be said in view of the complete doubtfulness of the situation? All that was known, even this morning, was that the presidentship of Europe was a fact. The little silver coin he had seen witnessed to that. That there had been an outburst of persecution, repressed sternly by local authorities, and that Felsenberg was today to begin his tour from capital to capital. He was expected in Turin by the end of the week. From every Catholic center throughout the world had come in messages imploring guidance, it was said that apostasy was rising like a tidal wave, that persecution threatened everywhere, and that even bishops were beginning to yield. As for the Holy Father, all was doubtful. Those who knew said nothing, and the only rumor that escaped was to the effect that he had spent all night in prayer at the tomb of the Apostle. The murmur died suddenly to a rustle and a silence. There was a ripple of sinking hands along the seats as the door beside the canopy opened, and a moment later John, Pater Patrum, was on his throne. At first, Percy understood nothing. He stared only, as at a picture, through the dusty sunlight that poured in through the shrouded windows, at the scarlet lines to right and left, up to the huge scarlet canopy and the white figure that sat there. Certainly these southerners understood the power of effect. It was as vivid and impressive as a vision of the host in a jeweled monstrance. Every accessory was gorgeous, the high room, the color of the robes, the chains and crosses, and as the eye moved along to its climax it was met by a piece of dead white, as if glory was exhausted and declared itself impotent to tell the supreme secret. Scarlet and purple and gold were well enough for those who stood on the steps of the throne. They needed it. But for him who sat there, nothing was needed. Let colors die and sounds faint in the presence of God's viceroy. Yet what expression was required found itself adequately provided in that beautiful oval face, the poised imperious head, the sweet brilliant eyes, and the clean curved lips that spoke so strongly. There was not a sound in the room, not a rustle, nor a breathing. Even without it seemed as if the world were allowing the supernatural to state its defense uninterruptedly before summing up and clamoring condemnation. Percy made a violent effort at self-repression, clenched his hands, and listened. Since this then is so, sons in Jesus Christ, it is for us to answer. We wrestle not, as the doctor of the Gentiles teaches us, against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the world of this darkness, against the spirits of wickedness in the high places. Wherefore, he continues, take unto you the armor of God. And he further declares to us its nature, 
the girdle of truth the breastplate of justice the shoes of peace the shield of faith the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit by this therefore the word of god bids us to war but not with the weapons of this world for neither is his kingdom of this world and it is to remind you of the principles of this warfare that we have summoned you to our presence the voice paused and there was a rustling sigh along the seats then the voice continued on a slightly higher note it has ever been the wisdom of our predecessors as is also their duty while keeping silence at certain seasons at others to speak freely the whole counsel of god from this duty we ourselves must not be deterred by the knowledge of our own weakness and ignorance but to trust rather that he who has placed us on this throne will deign to speak through our mouth and use our words to his glory first then it is necessary to utter our sentence as to the new movement as men call it which has latterly been inaugurated by the rulers of this world we are not unmindful of the blessings we are not unmindful of the blessings of peace and unity nor do we forget that the appearance of these things has been the fruit of much that we have condemned it is this appearance of peace that has deceived many causing them to doubt the promise of the prince of peace that it is through him alone that we have access to the father that true peace passing understanding concerns not only the relations of men between themselves but supremely the relations of men with their maker and it is in this necessary point that the efforts of the world are found wanting it is not indeed to be wondered at that in a world which has rejected god this necessary matter should be forgotten men have thought led astray by seducers that the unity of nations was the greatest prize of this life forgetting the words of our saviour who said that he came to bring not peace but a sword and that it is through many tribulations that we enter god's kingdom first then there should be established the peace of man with god and after that the unity of man with man will follow seek ye first said jesus christ the kingdom of god and then all these things shall be added unto you first then we once more condemn and anathematize the opinions of those who teach and believe the contrary of this and we renew once more all the condemnations uttered by ourselves or our predecessors against all those societies organizations and communities that have been formed for the furtherance of a unity on another than a divine foundation and we remind our children throughout the world that it is forbidden to them to enter or to aid or to approve in any manner whatsoever any of those bodies named in such condemnations percy moved in his seat conscious of a touch of impatience the manner was superb tranquil and stately as a river but the matter a trifle banal here was this old reprobation of freemasonry repeated in unoriginal language secondly went on the steady voice we wish to make known to you our desires for the future and here we tread on what many have considered dangerous ground again came that rustle percy saw more than one cardinal lean forward with hand crooked at ear to hear the better it was evident that something important was coming there are many points went on the high voice of which it is not our intention to speak at this time for of their own nature they are secret and must be treated of on another occasion but what we say here we say to the world since the assaults of our enemies are both open and secret so too must be our defences this then is our intention the pope paused again lifted one hand as if mechanically to his breast and grasped the cross that hung there while the army of christ is one it consists of many divisions each of which has its proper function and object in times past god has raised up companies of his servants to do this or that particular work the sons of saint francis to preach poverty those of saint bernard to labor in prayer with all holy women dedicating themselves to this purpose the society of jesus for the education of youth and the conversion of the heathen together with all the other religious orders whose names are known throughout the world each such company was raised up at a particular season of need, and each has corresponded nobly with the divine vocation. It has also been the especial glory of each, for the furtherance of its intention, while pursuing its end, to cut off from itself all such activities, good in themselves, which would hinder that work for which God had called it into being. Following in this matter the words of our Redeemer, Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit at this present season then it appears to our humility that all such orders which once more we commend and bless are not perfectly suited by the very conditions of their respective rules to perform the great work which the time requires 
our warfare lies not with ignorance in particular whether of the heathens to whom the gospel has not yet come or of those whose fathers have rejected it nor with the deceitful riches of this world nor with science falsely so called nor indeed with any one of those strongholds of infidelity against whom we have labored in the past rather it appears as if at last the time was come of which the apostle spoke when he said that that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called god it is not with this or that force that we are concerned but rather with the unveiled immensity of that power whose time was foretold and whose destruction is prepared the voice paused again and percy gripped the rail before him to stay the trembling of his hands there was no rustle now nothing but a silence that tingled and shook the pope drew a long breath turned his head slowly to right and left and went on more deliberately than ever it seems good then to our humility that the vicar of christ should himself invite god's children to this new warfare and it is our intention to enroll under the title of the order of christ crucified the names of all who offer themselves to this supreme service in doing this we are aware of the novelty of our action and the disregard of all such precautions as have been necessary in the past we take counsel in this matter with none save him who we believe has inspired it first then let us say that although obedient service will be required from all who shall be admitted to this order our primary intention in instituting it lies in god's regard rather than in man's in appealing to him who asks our generosity rather than to those who deny it and dedicating once more by a formal and deliberate act our souls and bodies to the heavenly will and service of him who alone can rightly claim such offering and will accept our poverty briefly we dictate only the following conditions none shall be capable of entering the order except such as shall be above the age of seventeen years no badge habit nor insignia shall be attached to it the three evangelical councils shall be the foundation of the rule to which we add a fourth intention namely that of a desire to receive the crown of martyrdom and a purpose of embracing it the bishop of every diocese if he himself shall enter the order shall be the superior within the limits of his own jurisdiction and alone shall be exempt from the literal observance of the vow of poverty so long as he retains his see such bishops as do not feel the vocation to the order shall retain their sees under the usual conditions but shall have no religious claim on the members of the order further we announce our intention of ourself entering the order as its supreme prelate and of making our profession within the course of a few days further we declare that in our own pontificate none shall be elevated to the sacred college save those who have made their profession in the order and we shall dedicate shortly the basilica of st peter and st paul as the central church of the order in which church we shall raise to the altars without any delay those happy souls who shall lay down their lives in the pursuance of their vocation of that vocation it is unnecessary to speak beyond indicating that it may be pursued under any conditions laid down by the superiors as regards the novitiate its conditions and requirements we shall shortly issue the necessary directions each diocesan superior for it is our hope that none will hold back shall have all such rights as usually appertain to religious superiors and shall be empowered to employ his subjects in any work that in his opinion shall subserve the glory of god and the salvation of souls it is our own intention to employ in our service none except those who shall make their profession he raised his eyes once more seemingly without emotion then he continued so far then we have determined on other matters we shall take counsel immediately but it is our wish that these words shall be communicated to all the world that there may be no delay in making known what it is that christ through his vicar asks of all who profess the divine name we offer no rewards except those which god himself has promised to those that love him and lay down their life for him no promise of peace save of that which passeth understanding no home save that which befits pilgrims and sojourners who seek a city to come no honor save the world's contempt no life save that which is hid with christ in god end of book two chapter three part three book two chapter four part one of lord of the world this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson Book 2, Chapter 4, Part 1 Oliver Brand, seated in his little private room at Whitehall, was expecting a visitor. It was already close upon ten o'clock, and at half-past he must be in the house. He had hoped that Mr. Francis, whoever he might be, would not detain him long. Even now every moment was a respite, for the work had become simply prodigious during the last weeks. But he was not reprieved for more than a minute, for the last boom from the Victoria Tower had scarcely ceased to throb when the door opened and a clerkly voice uttered the name he was expecting. Oliver shot one quick look at the stranger, at his drooping lids and downturned mouth, summed him up fairly and accurately in the moments during which they seated themselves, and went briskly to business. "'At twenty-five minutes past, sir, I must leave this room,' he said. "'Until then,' he made a little gesture. Mr. Francis reassured him. "'Thank you, Mr. Brent. That is ample time. Then, if you will excuse me.' He groped in his breast pocket and drew out a long envelope. "'I will leave this with you,' he said, "'when I go. It sets out our desires at length and our names. And this is what I have to say, sir.' He sat back, crossed his legs, and went on with a touch of eagerness in his voice. "'I am a kind of deputation, as you know,' he said. "'We have something both to ask and to offer. I am chosen because it was my own idea. First, may I ask a question?' Oliver bowed. "'I wish to ask nothing that I ought not, but I believe it is practically certain, is it not, that divine worship is to be restored throughout the kingdom?' Oliver smiled. "'I suppose so,' he said. "'The bill has been read for the third time.' And as you know, the President is to speak upon it this evening. He will not veto it? We suppose not. He has assented to it in Germany. Just so, said Mr. Francis. And if he assents here, I suppose it will become law immediately. Oliver leaned over this table and drew out the green paper that contained the bill. You have this, of course, he said. Well, it becomes law at once, and the first feast will be observed on the first of October. Paternity, is it not? Yes, paternity. "'There will be something of a rush, then,' said the other eagerly. "'Why, that is only a week hence.' "'I have not charge of this department,' said Oliver, laying back the bill. "'But I understand that the ritual will be that already in use in Germany. "'There is no reason why we should be peculiar. "'And the abbey will be used?' "'Why, yes.' "'Well, sir,' said Mr. Francis, "'of course I know the government commission has studied it all very closely, "'and no doubt has its own plans.' but it appears to me that they will want all the experience they can get. No doubt. Well, Mr. Brand, the society which I represent consists entirely of men who were once Catholic priests. We number about two hundred in London. I will leave a pamphlet with you, if I may, stating our objects, our constitution, and so on. It seemed to us that here was a matter in which our past experience might be of service to the government. Catholic ceremonies, as you know, are very intricate, and some of us studied them very deeply in old days. We used to say that masters of ceremonies were born, not made, and we have a fair number of those amongst us. But indeed every priest is something of a ceremonialist. He paused. Yes, Mr. Francis? I am sure the government realizes the immense importance of all going smoothly. If divine service was at all grotesque or disorderly, it would largely defeat its own object. So I have been deputed to see you, Mr. Brandt, and to suggest to you that here is a body of men, reckon it as at least twenty-five, who have had special experience in this kind of thing, and are perfectly ready to put themselves at the disposal of the government. Oliver could not resist a faint flicker of a smile at the corner of his mouth. It was a very grim bit of irony, he thought, but it seemed sensible enough. I quite understand, Mr. Francis. It seems a very reasonable suggestion, but I do not think I am the proper person. Mr. Snowford... Yes, yes, sir, I know, but your speech the other day inspired us all. You said exactly what was in all our hearts, that the world could not live without worship, and that now that God was found at last... Oliver waved his hand. He hated even a touch of flattery. It is very good of you, Mr. Francis. I will certainly speak to Mr. Snowford. I understand that you offer yourselves as... as masters of ceremonies. Yes, sir, and sacristans. I have studied the German ritual very carefully. It is more elaborate than I had thought it. It will need a good deal of adroitness. I imagine that you will want at least a dozen ceremoniarii in the abbey, and a dozen more in the vestries will scarcely be too much. Oliver nodded abruptly, 
looking curiously at the eager, pathetic face of the man opposite him. Yet it had something, too, of that mask-like, priestly look that he had seen before in others like him. This was evidently a devotee. "'You are all masons, of course,' he said. "'Why, of course, Mr. Brand.' "'Very good. I will speak to Mr. Snow for today, if I can catch him.' He glanced at the clock. There were yet three or four minutes. "'You have seen the new appointment in Rome, sir,' went on Mr. Francis. Oliver shook his head. He was not particularly interested in Rome just now. "'Cardinal Martin is dead. He died on Tuesday, and his place is already filled.' "'Indeed, sir?' "'Yes. The new man was once a friend of mine. Franklin, his name is. Percy Franklin.' "'Eh? Huh? What is the matter, Mr. Brent? Did you know him?' Oliver was eyeing him darkly, a little pale. "'Yes, I knew him,' he said quietly. "'At least, I think so.' "'He was at Westminster until a month or two ago.' "'Yes, yes,' said Oliver, still looking at him. "'And you knew him, Mr. Francis?' "'I knew him, yes.' "'Ah, well, I should like to have a talk some day about him.' He broke off. It yet wanted a minute to his time. "'And that is all?' he asked. "'That is all my actual business, sir,' answered the other. "'But I hope you will allow me to say how much we all appreciate what you have done, Mr. Brandt. I do not think it is possible for any, except ourselves, to understand what the loss of worship means to us. It was very strange at first. His voice trembled a little, and he stopped. Oliver felt interested, and checked himself in his movement to rise. Yes, Mr. Francis? The melancholy brown eyes turned on him full. It was an illusion, of course, sir. We know that. But I, at any rate, dare to hope that it was not all wasted all our aspirations and penitence and praise. We mistook our God, but none the less it reached him. It found its way to the spirit of the world. It taught us that the individual was nothing, and that he was all. And now... Yes, sir, said the other softly. He was really touched. The sad brown eyes opened full. And now Mr. Felsenberg has come. He swallowed in his throat. Julian Felsenberg! There was a world of sudden passion in his gentle voice, and Oliver's own heart responded. "'I know, sir,' he said. "'I know all that you mean.' "'Oh, to have a savior at last!' cried Francis. "'One that can be seen and handled and praised to his face. "'It is like a dream, too good to be true.' Oliver glanced at the clock and rose abruptly, holding out his hand. "'Forgive me, sir. I must not stay. "'You have touched me very deeply. "'I will speak to Snowford.' Your address is here, I understand? He pointed to the papers. Yes, Mr. Brent. There is one more question. I must not stay, sir, said Oliver, shaking his head. One instant. Is it true that this worship will be compulsory? Oliver bowed as he gathered up his papers. End of Book Two, Chapter Four, Part One